his own territory on the crease. And you know, this fellow who who likes to live down the pitch, doesn't he? And he forced him back on the, on this same pitch. Now it had a little bit more pace in it then, but. Uh, um, the Harmers will remember that. The whole England team get very good vibes from this ground. They like playing here. They feel they feel very comfortable on this ground. They feel that they, they, they feel the waves of support um, that wash over them here. Um, they'll be inspired by the performance yesterday. I hope. Um, although I think that on reflection overnight they'll they'll say oh, did we did we perhaps get carried away a little too much in the, uh, on, the on the on the adrenaline of it all and perhaps underachieved. Well, Harmison last night when they came out to start the innings before the, the rain came and, and prevented any play at the beginning of uh, Australia's effort, uh, the batsmen were quite uh, deliberate in getting to the middle of the ground, took their time, and then the rain came. Well, Harmison was going to bowl here at the pavilion end, and uh, he's decided now that perhaps the city end's a better option. So maybe this indicates a, a switch in the breeze. Does yep. he have a preferred end here? I'm, I'm not aware of one, no. I mean, I, I, I suspect his preferred end is the one where he's having to walk back into the wind. Mm. <laughs> well, Justin Lang is uh, having a prod at the pitch and a chat to his soulmate at the other end, Matthew Hayden. These two uh, prolific opening batsmen. The umpires, I think, just waiting for the clock to tick around to half past ten to start this second day. It's hard to imagine that it could be anywhere near as exhilarating, as frenetic as the batting we saw yesterday. But this is a very fast scoring ground. And the other issue that I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, once more today, and as the series continues to move on, is the influence of these bats. The bats that are no longer pressed. And a bit like tennis players, the batsmen go through as many bats as Roger Federer goes through tennis rackets in a season. First ball of the innings, Harmison goes in and Langer comes forward, he's taken on the body. That was a nasty delivery that bounced and hit him amidships as he shuffled across his stumps. So there was some bounce with the new ball, but uh, too high for an LBW shout. Just a little clearing of the throat there as uh, he found an awkward ball coming back off the pitch and bouncing over the line of the leg stump as it struck him. Actually went off the straight though, didn't it? Which uh, we didn't see very much of, uh, of that yesterday. If he gets that at the off stump, he'll be nicking it. Harmison goes in and Langer is back and he jabs the ball down behind square. Took one hand off the bat. He was apprehensive there as Harmison slammed it into the pitch. They got a short leg and a backward square and uh, he was a little uncomfortable, you would have to say, as he goes down looking at the pitch. Remember, it was the second ball of the test match at Lords that smashed into his arm just above the point of the right elbow. Harmison goes in again to Langer. Langer gets a bouncer. And where's that come from? It's gone up in the air off the helmet. Out to Bell in its short leg. He tried to duck. He didn't get out of the way. He's stunned by that blow. Bell running back took what the crowd thought was a catch. And Lang is just collecting his thoughts there. That was a very well-placed bouncer. He tried to duck, and he was late. And it went smashing into his helmet and lobbed up in the air towards Bell, who took um, the interception. But uh, it didn't bounce quite as high as he thought, and he's ended up walking straight into it. Well, there's several things here. That, that's, that's almost a, um, a repeat of Lords. Lords has got a hit on the elbow there. He's ducking out of the way. I and mean, that's a quick, nasty delivery. Um, it's rattled him. I think, I think Justin Langer said at uh, Lords that he'd never experienced a, a working over like that since the, um, he first played against the West Indies. Um, now, the, the other thing, actually, <laughs> I don't know whether you, you know it's there, Jim, that uh, as soon as they've been hit, a little group of England players came over to say, Are you all right, Justin? <laughs> you OK? You remember the ruckus at uh, Lords over uh, um, Ricky Ponton getting here, so nobody inquiring uh, as to his health. So very obvious, uh, very obvious that was by the England team. It's shaken Langer up. We know what a tough customer he is, but his brain must be rattled after getting that ball on the helmet. This is a similar start to Lords from Harmison. Here's the fourth ball. He goes in and bowls, and Langer is back, and he keeps the ball out, just dancing around the crease there, a little prod, and he's just trying to get his composure out here. 
even wearing a helmet, the protection of a helmet, he's still got to be stunned, and, and he might have some delayed shock here. He's wandering out to square leg, he's removed his helmet, and he's got to be a little dazed by all this, oh, surely. Thumper there, won't he? He'll have the... You, you can see him almost as a cartoon character there, can't you, with the, the planets and the birds twittering over his head there and the stars. And... Well, can he survive this attack? He bowls again and it's on the stumps and a, once more. He's doing a little dance out there. He wants to keep moving. He's uh, like a fellow on a, a bit of a tightrope at the moment but against this uh, intimidatory bowling from uh, Harmison who's pitched the last two a little bit further up he hasn't slammed another one in and uh, he knows he's shaking the batsman up with his pace and with his ability to get that ball tightening him up near the leg stump he goes in again Langer leaves outside the off stump and shows pretty good judgment and once more the battle is joined in this Ashes contest with Harmison going at the batsman and Langer copping one on the helmet, a maiden over to start the Australian innings and another lively start to the day's play. Well, that's almost a collector's item in itself in this game, isn't it? It's a maiden over. It, 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 uh, that was pure hostility. That was, uh, that was brilliant bowling by, by Harmison. Um, Justin Langer will be very pleased to still be there. He'll. Uh, I can't believe he's not going to get some sort of headache pills out there in a minute because uh, he was he was rattled by that and in fact did well to get in and play the rest of the over as he as he did um, first impressions are that uh, that went through a little bit better than the new ball did yesterday although the last ball which was a length ball and went through to the keeper actually he took it down near his ankle so um, perhaps when the hardness of the ball goes off we'll see the same kind of, of slow track so some interesting deployment of the field here from Michael Vaughan. He's only got two slips. Gully's fairly square. There's a short cover and a short mid-off. And then behind them, Flintoff's at a, a deepish mid-off, a Jones rather. There's a mid-on, a mid-wicket and a long leg. Now Hoggard's bowling and he's driving the ball and he's caught! Caught at cover, first ball, straight to Vaughan. What a wicket! Well, that deployment of the field has paid off. He's hit the ball straight to short cover. And Matthew Hayden is out for a primary. It's one for none. A huge wicket for England. Hoggard is celebrating. It was just a length delivery. And he went to drive it. And he's hit it straight to the Andrew England Strauss, captain. Uh, Strauss, Strauss. Sorry, yeah. straight to Strauss yeah. out there in close. My goodness. What a start to the innings. The wicket. England dearly wanted. Well, uh, the best laid plans frequently go awry, don't they? But not that one. They've, uh, they've thought about that. They've, they've used this very straight mid, um, short mid-off to uh, to Matthew Hayden before. I've not seen them use the, the extra cover. But, you know, it, we've said all along it's a pitch on which you're going to need to pitch the ball up and which you're going to err on the side of over-pitching rather than under-pitching. And therefore, it's not a bad idea to, to, uh, to have that protection there, to have your, your, your attacking fielders in front, of, in front of the pitch so that, you know, for the mistimed drive on a slow pitch. I mean, there's one thing that amazed me yesterday, absolutely astounded me, was how readily the batsman got the timing, you know? And that can happen on here. We've just seen Matthew Hayden. He seemed to time it, but it didn't quite come on to him as he would have liked, and that's why he's in the air. And, and straight to the fielder. I'm pleased to hit it to Andrew Strauss rather than Michael Vaughan as well, I have to say. Well, I mean, it, it, that is a, a, a captain's dream, isn't, it? isn't well. it? You set the field up in the hope that something like that will occur. Nine times out of ten it doesn't. And first ball, bowled by Hoggard, produces a wicket. A remarkable start. And just the tonic for the England bowlers here. Ricky Ponting is coming out to face the new ball. And for him, there's two slips, two gullies, a short cover. Mid-off, mid-on, mid-wicket and a long leg. Now here's Hoggard's second ball. And it's to Ponting. And Ponting is beaten outside the off stump. Now that appeared to just hold its line. It was... Uh, was I mis misreading that one? No, I didn't I see it really think, move away. I think, I think that went away a little bit. Yeah, but it was in a, a certainly in the drift. right area. And they're just showing a, a slow-mo replay of uh, Hayden's uh, demise. Just going at the ball. 
turning his bat as he played it. I think the, the, one of the things that these absolute super slow mos have shown is the, the number of times the bat does twist when, uh, when batsmen hit their shots. So Hoggard, with his tail up, goes in and bowls, and Ponting is running the ball away, square of the wicket on the offside to Giles, who's there to field. So uh, another full house on the edge of their seats here with a, an amazing start to this second day. We've seen Langer hit in the helmet by a short lifting ball from Harmison and then Hayden looking to drive first up and slamming the catch or well, miscuing in fact more than belting it straight to Strauss at the short cover so uh, Australia under a little bit of heat here with Hoggard bowling again and Ponting leaving a ball just outside the off stump that's the area to bowl and England certainly invigorated after their effort yesterday in making 407 in the day. And if their new ball attack can break through a couple of times here, then with a, a tremendous chance of putting themselves into a position to perhaps level the series. No sign, incidentally, of that sh sort of short gully position that they had for Ricky Ponting at Lords, where, where Kevin Peterson uh, um, missed Ponting, didn't he? Right early on. Hoggard bowls and Ponting is back, forcing and getting a quick single as it goes out quite into the offside. A throw at the stumps would have run him out, but it's missed and it's gone for overthrows. And uh, Peterson's not happy. He knew when he unleashed that throw that uh, a direct hit would have had Ponting short of his ground. He was scrambling to get there, and as he scrambled, the ball went past the stumps. And for four overthrows, looking at the replay, he was out by a yard. He was out by a yard, and that was within a whisk or two, wasn't it? It's good fielding by Peterson. Um, quite the, absolutely the right thing to do to have a, to have a punt at that. There's absolutely no time, really, for anybody to come round and, uh, and back it up properly. That would have been a dramatic start. Oh. <laughs> two for none. Well, it's one for five. That's it's dramatic enough for uh, those... Australian fans who are wondering what's going to be uh, happening in this game. It's uh, taken a few twists and turns. The first twist and turn was on the ankle of McGrath yesterday. And from there on, uh, we've seen England attack a belligerent batting performance yesterday. And now they're attacking with the ball. Langer's still sorting himself out after being whacked in the helmet. Two slips, two gullies. Hoggard goes in towards him and he's forward. He's taken on the pad and says no to Ponting as he was looking to hustle through. And that's the end of a very good over from Matthew Hoggard. Up they go. Plenty of applause. There's lots of encouragement here for England. And they're enjoying it with Australia. Five runs. A cheeky single and almost a run out and four overthrows to Ponting. Langer hasn't scored. Hayden out. Court Strauss. Bolt Hog Hoggard. Nought. Well, Matthew Hoggard further encouraged by a little bit of movement there. The last ball swung into Justin Langer. He's going leg side. He's hit him on the on the pad. No chance in LBW. But the encouragement there, that of that movement, we didn't see any swing yesterday. We didn't see any seam movement or discernible seam movement uh, yesterday. So far, we've seen swing from Hoggard and we've seen some extremely nasty lift and pace from Harmison. So here's another test for Ricky Ponting. Harmison bowled a, a very well-directed opening over. And now he's got three slips of gully, a short leg and a backward square as he moves in and bowls to Ponting, who leaves a full-length ball that's wide of the off stump. And it goes through about waist height to Jones, who's alongside just Gothic, Flintoff, Strauss and Giles. Peterson's out at point, Vaughan's at mid-off, Bell at short leg with uh, Jones at backward square. And Hoggard down and away to our left at this pavilion end where we're describing the action from. The sun's trying to break through some greyish cloud as Harmison bowls and Ponting's forward and he takes the ball away around the corner. He looked to hurry through on him as he turned it from the line of middle and leg and Hoggard dashed in to get an accurate return back. Ponting six and a Langer back on strike to Harmison. And this battle between the, the counter-punches is going to resume here as uh, Langer looks to have made some recovery from being whacked in the helmet by a nasty delivery. 
Let's see where Harmison can line them up. Around that off stump, if you're looking for the outside edge of the bat. He goes in and bowls now, and Langer is pushing, playing well. Short back lift, the ball tight near his leg stump, and he knocked it straight into the turf in front of Bell at short leg. Langer just wanders down the pitch and prods away at a spot or two there just to settle himself in. So, again, they've broken through the remarkable duo of uh, Langer and Hayden. An early wicket, Hayden missing out. Harmison bowls, Langer is driving, forcing it hard down towards mid-off and the horn, but he can't score down the ground. And, of course, Hayden's first ball duck means another contribution from the primary club members in Australia, probably in Britain if they're feeling generous, because an English bowler has got an Australian primary. Just pop down and catch him while he's, while he's hot with that one. <laughs> Red hot. Langer waits. In goes Harmison again, and he's leaving the ball. That's uh, spilt oh, by Jones. <laughs> That's not an encouraging sign behind the stumps. It was straightforward, but it just seems to be one of those things with Jones, doesn't it? Well, I think you know there was there was much was made of the of the two catches uh, that, that he missed at Lords, but it, it, it went beyond the two catches. It was it was the general dropping of the ball when it didn't when it didn't matter, and uh, that's an indication again, isn't it? Langer waiting for Harmison away from the city and he goes in to bowl to him and he's leaving another ball just pushed across outside the line of the off stump that completes uh, another searching over from Steve Harmison and it's England in the ascendancy here the early wicket of Hayden a first ball duck Harmison two overs for one run Mike Selby to comment on the tense battle that's going on and then Jonathan Agnew is going to come in and join you. He's a, a fast bowler of the very highest calibre now, Steve Harmison. He's got excellent control, great aggression, controlled aggression, quiet aggression. He's not a he's not a lippy bowler, but he's got a he's got a rather nasty menacing look about him now, Steve Harmison. Just gives a little glance of the eye down the pitch. It's a ferocious uh, opening opening overs and it's uh, it's every bit as exhilarating as yesterday, wasn't it? It is. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Six for one. Ponting's on strike. And away goes Hoggard, his shock of fair hair. He bowls outside the off stump, a full length. And just a, a faint indication there of some movement away from the right-handed Ponting. And uh, Jones collects it cleanly this time. A cloudy morning, lots of rain overnight around the Midlands. I think we're very lucky to get away on time today. Well done, the ground staff, as always. And... Uh, People still bustling into the ground. Those who are just arriving now will have missed that early excitement. Hayden driving his first ball straight to Strauss, a short extra cover. And uh, success there for the primary club. He's out first ball. In goes Hoggard, running away from us, and that's on the leg stump. Picked off easily by Ponting. Not a good ball. Dispatched clinically. And the first authentic boundary of the day. We've had four overthrows. But uh, that was not a good ball at all. Hoggard will be cross about that. Simply can't bowl there, well, to anybody, really. Full leg stump. Thanks very much. Ten for one. He doesn't miss those, Ricky Ponting, does he? Moves that way, doesn't he? He always gets his, tends to get his head outside the line of the ball anyway. He's always looking for that leg side. That was just uh, just whipped away. Easy four runs for him. Don't know whether Matthew Hoggard's struggling a little bit on the front line there. Seemed to be kicking away at the, uh, the traces on the on the crease, a little bit of dampness, maybe his foot slips a little bit. Could have been. If, if the outfield is damp, you take it with you with yeah. leather-soled boots, don't you? And he goes, and that's a good one, which bounces more than Ponting expected, and that was jabbed away into the offside from a good length, and that hit right up at the very top of the bat, and that's the area that Hoggard has got to try and hit here. Mr Giles comes running in from the offside and wraps a, a loving arm around Hoggard as he brings the ball back. But, uh, that's it was an excellent delivery. Well, that squared him up, and it also bounced a little bit. You know, we was much talk before the game about the, uh, the possibility of this pitch pitting and, mm. uh, and and getting some uneven bounce. In goes Hoggard. Ponting waits for him. He bowls on the off stump. Ponting trying to get forward to a no ball, which uh, takes Australia up to 11 for one. But, uh, again, a defensive stroke, and the ball hitting the top of the bat rather than the middle of it. All encouraging 
for Hoggard, who hasn't got the breeze quite as he would like it, I don't think. Looking at the Australian flag there by the scoreboard at the far end of the ground, it's it's actually assisting an in-swing bowler from this end rather than an out-swing bowler. He'd probably prefer to bowl at the other end, given the choice. And he comes away from us and bowls to Ponting. That's a good length again on the off stump. Pushed away up to Peterson, who's very busy there at extra cover with his cap on. Sunglasses perched on the peak of it. And uh, there's no run. And England do look full of enthusiasm this morning. They were denied what might have been 25 fascinating minutes last night. Just to round off that superb day by possibly taking a wicket or two. Who knows what might have happened in those circumstances. But it's certainly a, an awkward time in which to bat that was uh, washed out by the rain. In goes Hoggard outside the off stump. No stroke to stump, but it is another no ball. That's two in this over. 12 for one. It's a little bit blustery out there. I don't know how, how, how much the stands are protecting that today, but certainly coming away from the car park this morning, it felt really blustery. And, and, and you and I both know that when it's blustery, it's quite difficult to get your rhythm, to get your run up right. You can be pushing against the wind one second, and the wind suddenly dies, and, you, and then you're ahead of yourself, and that's when you overstep. Hoggard pauses for a moment. And with two slips, two gullies, down they all go, he's on his way again. Fast umpire Kurtz and he bowls to Ponting outside the off stump and cracked away for four. It was short and Ponting was on that very quickly. Been a funny old over this, there have been three very good balls, a couple of bad ones and two no balls as well. It's gone to 16 for one after Australia in Hoggard's previous over were naught for one, so it's... Well, it's like yesterday, really. Yeah. Runs, <laughs> wickets. We're here for another 2020 match, by the look of it. That's a that's a, a, a slippy front foot, wide long hop, though. Um, I rather empathise with that one. Done a few of those in my time, and, it, and it's uh, um, you drag the ball down. Your foot slips a little bit. Your knee gives way a fraction. You drag the ball down, drag it wide, and it uh, just sits up and asks to be hit. Hasn't asked for any sawdust he's, though. He's, which no, is he's fretting on that front crease, though. Yeah. Away he goes and bowls to Ponting, who's forward playing slightly across the pad. That's where, that's where Ponting can get a little tied up early in his innings. But uh, he played that up to mid-on, rather hurried fashion, but uh, there's no run. 16 for one, with Ponting on 14. Langer, who was hit on the head by Harmson in the first over, has yet to score. So 16 for one, we've had four overs on a cloudy, rather chilly morning in Birmingham. The forecast is for an improvement, though. This cloud is scheduled to break up, the sun to come out. England, of course, won't want that. They're quite happy with these conditions. So Australia, I'm sure, will be looking up towards the skies, looking for any breaks, and willing the blue sky to appear and make the conditions a little easier in which to bat. Now, can Langer get off the mark? He's uh, had two overs of Harmison so far, and in fact he pulls away now. He wasn't ready for that. Harmison was on his way. It's an interesting change from the English fielders too, Mike, if you spotted it, whereas at Lord's, when Ponting was hit, nasty blow. Yeah. Nobody went to say, see him and ask him if he was all right, whereas when Langer was hit just then, three or four very, wandered very, over. Very deliberate and very obvious. Yeah. A bit of PR there, I think. Yeah, well, they were, they were, they were wrong at Lord's. Here's Harmison, and uh, Langer <coughs> goes back to a ball on the off stump, which is uh, pushed into the offside. It, it, it is a physical game, it's a hard game. Uh, physically and psychologically, but when someone's hit and there's blood around, you don't just stand there and, and not go and see if no, you're right. with you on that. I think Ricky Punting had every right to be angry about that. It's not it's not war, he said, and he's, he's right, it's not. You play it you play it hard, you play it you play it within the within the rules of the game and uh, and and you and you act in a responsible and human way. Here's Harmison and oh Lango very nearly plays that into his stumps. An inside edge there, the ball dribbled into his pad. And Bell was interested too. He's there at forward short leg, precisely for that, the edge into the pad, which then bounces up for that fielder to catch. He's also there, of course, to try and stop the batsman from simply planting a front foot down the pitch. Which uh, it's not always easy to do to Harmison, but that's just another effect of that short leg field when it makes the batsman less inclined to get forward, in comes Harmison, and that's short and cut away by Langer, a bit of a misfield there by Giles, and Langer is off the mark with a couple of runs. Peterson pursues the ball to within a yard of the third man boundary, throws it back, and Australia move 
to 18 for one in the fifth over of the morning and I think just looking at various bits and pieces here stats and so on I think that was Hayden's first golden duck in test cricket Bill you can check on how many ducks but not how many golden not golden <laughs> oh well 18 for one here's Harmison again it's short Langer tries to pull who's hit on the arm this time it wasn't a particularly threatening ball but rather than duck it he tried to play it and for the second time Langer sinks to his knees and Ponting comes down to make sure that he's OK. Mm. It was actually, if you wanted to see a sort of a replay of how Michael Vaughan was hitting the nets against uh, Chris Tremont, it was similar. I think Langer was probably through the shot there a little bit too early. That it hit him, and now both bats were crouching. Ponting just to try and reassure Langer, who's smiling, he's all right, but uh, obviously uh, a nasty blow. I wonder if it's winded him, actually. He just looks a bit puffing a little bit. Uh, it was uh, short again, dug in, Langer went for that pull shot, and I think it did win to him, it hit him straight in the solar plexus. Reminded of that uh, story about John Edrich and the, uh, the Lily Tomo tour of Australia where he'd been hit in the ribs and he was asked to be all right, said one tour too many. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Harmison again, urged on by the crowd, and that's uh, fended away by Langer, another short ball, which uh, runs away to fine leg, Hoggard fields. And with a sigh of relief, I think Langer gets to the other end for the first time. 19 for one, he goes to three. He's been hit on the head, winded, he's grimacing, still rubbing his tummy there. And if anyone wants to have any idea, if anyone's been hit by a new ball on the body before, well, get a friend to hit you with a hammer. <laughs> that gives you some idea. It's incredibly painful. 19 for one. Ponting waits for Harmison, who's roaring in. He's there, he bowls, that's clipped away, and he'll get four here, I think, down towards a, a square long leg, let's call it that, a sort of a, a deep backward square, if you like. Again, a leg stump half folly. Ponting's had two of those today. It's perhaps the effect of having a left-hander at the other end. The bowler not quite getting their line right when they bowl to him, but he's profited, clipping that away a little uppishly, not too far away from the fielder who's been placed there. But uh, to the boundary it went, 23 for one. And, uh, well, Australia are cruising along at four and a half and over. We were building up today. I think it couldn't possibly uh, match the entertainment of yesterday. But, uh, well, we've had an early wicket. We've had, uh, how many boundaries so far, Bill? Three? Three boundaries. And does that include the overthrows? No. So that, that as well. And we've seen some hostile fast bowling from Steve Harmison. I think just as the opening yesterday, though, the... The boundaries we saw early on, anyway, from Mark Scothic weren't uh, uh, boundaries of somebody who was deliberately going after the bowling. They were about balls that were there to be hit, and he hit them. Um, and thus, with Ricky Ponting, he's, he's, he's clipped away what's been, what's been given to him. Now, Hoggard runs away to bowl to the left-handed Langer. He's there, and sliced away. Oh, he got away with that. In the air, through the slips, and down to third man for four. Well, that wasn't a good shot. He reached for that. He went through with a rather flamboyant-looking drive. The ball found the edge, and, well, that could have gone anywhere, frankly. Well, had that gone to hand, of course, we would have all said, well, that's, you know, that's an example of, uh, of a bowler at the other end getting you a wicket. It's like a breath of fresh air, wasn't it, for Justin Langer at the moment, getting, getting Matthew Hogger coming at him. Yes, what's a poor shot. Aiming, I think, for extra cover. There's a bit of a gap there. There are two slips, two gullies. Cover. And mid-off, also a short leg, Bell, who's crouching because Hoggard is on his way again and bowls to Langer, who's forward here, pushing out away firmly off the front foot. Giles collects in the square of the two gullies. And yeah, there's no run, 27 for one. And uh, I was chatting with Rodney Hoggin here yesterday, my guest on uh, the close of play on Five Live. And he's very interesting, Hoggy. He, was, um, he picked out Hoggard as someone who will play at some stage a real key part in the the Ashes series, he reckon. He's one of those bowlers who just comes on and takes wickets, which, which, which is absolutely right. And Roddy won't have seen too much of Hoggard. But uh, that is rather how he operates. In he goes and bowls to Langer. Forward this time, a more composed-looking defensive stroke. Which is picked up by Peterson in the covers, and there's no run. 27 for one. Well, he's, a, he's a mercurial bowler, isn't he? The, he's, he's, he's what um, some circles they call a daisy bowler, isn't he? Some days he does, some days he doesn't. And, <laughs> and he... 
on his day, he's devastating. We've seen, he's, you know, he gets his hat tricks, he gets on a roll, he gets wickets in in, in clutches. Mm. Um, on the bad days, he, he, he's, he's fodder, isn't he? But I think you're right. He, he'll summer on the line. He'll, he'll come in and chip in with a with a, one of those devastating spells. Off he goes, past umpire Kurtz and Langer waits for him and then he comes forward again, stretching outside the off stump. Giles is the fielder there, wearing his sun hat. Rather optimistically wearing a sun hat at the moment at backward point. And uh, there's no run. 27 for one. Hayden is out, if you're just joining us. Caught off the first ball that he faced by Strauss at short extra cover as he drove Hoggard. And the sun's trying to come out, so maybe Giles wasn't particularly over-optimistic there with his sun hat. He knows the local form and conditions here, of course. And in goes Hoggard and bowls to Langer, who clips that away. Down to long leg it goes. It's a no ball, the first one in this over. More cursing from Hoggard. And the score moves on to 29 for one He's got some sawdust down there now on that front foot. So no. it's still slipping a little bit, I think. I don't think it's odd here, right? With the... We're now, we're now into people bowling no balls by millimetres and the side-on cameras picking this out. And they're doing that on a line that's scraped with the sole of the vampire's boot in the bit of sawdust. Yes. And long may it remain like that too. It's well, I don't think you can criticise umpires when that's the, the, the tolerance levels they're operating under. Absolutely. In goes Hoggard. And Ponting comes forward here, playing us back to the bowler. Coming forward, that on the off stump. Cries of well bowled Hoggy from England's fielders. Triscothic there at first slip, deep in conversation with Flintoff at second. Strauss looking rather thoughtful <coughs> in the gully. Giles is at backward point, saving the single rather than catching. Peterson at extra cover. Vaughan is at mid off. Jones loosening up as always. He's my, he's my court. boy for today. Is he? Simon Jones, and he's yeah. at mid-on, waiting for that moment. In goes Hoggard, the sun's still shining. That finds a thick outside edge as Ponting comes stretching forward. The ball runs away to Giles there at backward point. And that was a better over from Hoggard. He uh, conceded that boundary through the slips, but that was a poor stroke from Langer. Certainly a moral victory for the bowler. And it's 29 for one. England, of course, making 407 yesterday in a frenetic... Highly entertaining day. And so far today we've had a Langer hit on the head, hit in the solar plexus, and very aggressive fast bowling from Harmison. And Hayden out to his first ball for the first time in Test cricket, his first golden duck, which is a, a pretty good effort, bearing in mind all the matches he's played. He was caught by Strauss off Hoggard in the second over. So this battle resumes between Harmison and Langer. There are three slips, a gully. Bell crouches there at forward short leg. He might be in business. And Harmison comes racing in. He's there, he bowls. It's short and fended off by Langer. Somehow the gutsy little left-hander gets inside the line of it, nudges it away down the fine leg. Batsman will convince you that they enjoy this. <laughs> but there are times where you really wonder if they do. You wonder whether, whether for show, sure, whether you just want to be honest and say, come on, no, you don't. You, you, you might be a gutsy little player and you hang in there, but don't please tell me that it's a lot of fun, because it's not. David Steele was one, wasn't he? He'd get one to nip back, send his inside thigh, you'd hear the thwack of hard ball on, on flesh, it would hurt, and he would say, oh, thanks, you, if I needed that. <laughs> you think, come on, Steele. 30 for one. Harmerson comes in and bowls to Ponting. It's a bouncer, a quick one too, that goes flying through over his head. As Australian captain ducks, he played it pretty well. And uh, more thuds into Jones's gloves. Yeah, Steve would always try and convince you that he... A little bit of pain just keeps you keeps you focused. That was his argument, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, so Robin Smith used to occasionally say he'd, he'd, he'd let somebody hit him, let the ball hit him just to wake him up. <laughs> Hmm. So I'd rather prefer to stay asleep, personally. <laughs> 30 for one. Up comes Harmerson, and he bowls to Ponting. Back he goes, jumping into position there, playing the ball away defensively for Peterson to field at uh, cover point. And there's no run. The crowd loving this contest. Runs on the board for England. Now the Aussies on the back foot. That's how the majority of supporters here would like it. There are a very healthy number of Australians here. Marked out in the... Uh, the gold t-shirts and gold caps down there at the far end in the Wyatt stand. 
another group. Keith Stackpole's group is down by the scoreboard. Up comes Harmison. Andy Bowles to Ponting. It's short and it's pulled away and it's gone for four. Past Jones, who's at backward square leg. It's also a no ball, so two signals there for Billy Bowden to produce, which is uh, always a bit of a bonus as far as he's concerned. And uh, the score moves on to 35 for one. I met somebody from, who's come over from Perth to watch seven England-Australia tests this summer because the ladies are playing Indeed. next week. And they, they start at Hove on Tuesday, and then they go to Worcester. Two nice places to play cricket. 35 for one. Ponting is on 22. He's got there very quickly, too. He's at four fours. And up comes Harmison again. He bowls to him outside the off stump. And uh, Ponting has nothing to do with that. Oh, flies too at a good pace. It's the, I think, the most hostile bowling we've seen in the match so far. Well, that's interesting. You see, this is coming up on the on the speedo there, as as 86, 87, 88 miles an hour. Now, when Stephen Harmson was batting against Brett Lee and stood up and spanked him through mid wicket off the back foot, that registered up there was 95 miles an hour. Yeah, well, it, it can't. I'm been. sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a different league. Up he comes again. Andy Bowles to Ponting. Oh, that was uh, short and quick. And Ponting actually changed his mind there. He's shoveled it for four. But it was a very jerky reflex stroke. I think he, was, he may have been doing a flint off there and changing his mind. Well, I think he had to wait for it. That came off so sluggishly. And that was a funny shot. Bell took cover there at short leg as he's got it away for four. And we're off to a a flying start here again it's nearly well it's up to about seven and over at the moment 39 for one with Ponting on 26 the sun is out and Harmison comes rushing in again past umpire Bowden outside the off stump Ponting raises the bat and the ball flies through to Jones the over ends and I think all wise former fast bowlers have made the point that this is not a pitch for bowling short on. It's uh, it, it's different in a way from Lords, where, where England rather bullied Australia out with lots of short pitch bowling. But, uh, I think the feeling was that if they do bowl that way here, they might well be expensive, and I think the scoreboard reflects that. That last delivery you see was a what you say was a, a, a good length for Harmison, probably even slightly fuller than he would normally bowl, and that went through well, chest high pretty nearly, didn't it? To as it passed Ricky Ponting, so. You can say, well, there's nothing wrong in bowling that length, is there? It's not pullable. It's too full to, to, to do that. A little closer to him, that would have been a, a really top delivery. He can plug away. Stephen Harmison can, can plug away on, uh, on, on his own length and line as much as anybody else can or should, should be able to do. He hasn't got to run up and bowl bounces and things. He can, he can bowl 90, 92, 93, 94 mile an hour length and line. Nothing wrong with that. Mm. There goes Hoggard, and Langer drives his first ball of the eighth over up to mid-off. A good save there by Simon Jones. Prevents a run. 39 for one. England's fielding today has been good, but there was an opportunity for a, a direct hit run out against Ponting. It was one of those where Peterson on the run only had one stump to aim at, but it was a pretty good throw, and had he hit Ponting, it would have been run out. That would have completed an extraordinary second over of the day because uh, it was the same over in which uh, Hoggard dismissed Hayden 39 for one now England having made 407 and Langer settles down once again Hoggard dips his head there he is now bowling a lively medium pace that's turned away by Langer down to fine leg Hoggard fields and again the runs coming uh, at quite a pace it's been uh, aggressive batting that we've seen throughout this match. Field changes over for the right-handed Ponting. And with a left and a right-hander in, of course, with these runs being scored so fast, this makes it very difficult for the bowler to, to settle down. They're all a consistent line. He has to change his direction, of course, every time that the other batsman gets down to that end. In goes Hoggard, and he bowls. Oh, my word, that's a leading edge from Ponting again. It's that area we we're talking about in the last over, where round about middle and off, and a foolish length early in his innings, he, he, he does get across and hit the ball towards mid-on. And, uh, well, that brings LBW into play. It also brings that leading edge into play that he found then, and that ended up in Giles' hands this time at backward point. 
Well, it could really have gone anywhere. It's just a, a, an early innings weakness that Ponting has. It's 26, 40 for one. In goes Hoggard, and he bowls to him. That's two leg side. It's a, le it's a no ball as well. And down towards the boundary it goes. A long chase down there. It's a diving save by Harmison. who has got tangled up there in the boundary edging. They'll come back for three. And it was a no ball. And Australia race along. 44 for one. And we're in the eighth over. How many no balls have we had this morning, Matt, Bill? Five. Five no balls. That was a big one too. That wasn't just a little way over the line. That was a good two, three inches over the line. That's uh, that's unacceptable. And apart from anything else, it means that, that he's he's now thinking, oh god, my front foot's not really the right place. He's thinking about that when he's running up. He's thinking about his foot slipping in the sawdust, and and every percentage that you're thinking about that, you're not thinking about what's going on at the other end. Langer waits for Hoggard. He's there. He bowls, and Langer comes shuffling forward this time. Playing securely, up to extra cover. And there's no run. And while Vaughan will have been delighted with that early wicket, yeah, let's look at that scoreboard and think, oh, hang on a minute. Look at that, they've got nearly 50 already. But maybe just to be, it'll be one of those games that just sort of blows itself out after, after three and a half, four days as a, as a winner. It's been a frenetic match, and it's just for some reason been played at this pace. Then goes Hoggard, Langer, drives, again, that quite timing this up to mid-off. Jones is the fielder, he looks rather longingly at the ball, he wants to get his hands on it and to bowl with it. He's got to wait a little while yet. Right, I think one. people who went out the ground yesterday must have just gone totally bemused at what they'd seen. It, it, it was extraordinary. It took me a couple of hours and a couple of pints to get to come down from, uh, from, the, from the, the cloud we were on. There's a big screen up uh, around about uh, here. If you can't get into the ground and want to watch some cricket, in goes Hoggard and uh, Langer runs that down into the gully. No run, 44 for one. Just seen a shot of where it is. Uh, safe to say, I think there's plenty of room there if you want to come down and bring a blanket. That sort of day at the moment, a bit chilly. Good conditions in which to bowl. But uh, runs are flowing off that early wicket. 44 for one with 29 to Ponting, 10 to Langer, more for Mike Selvey. And then for the first time, it'll be Henry Blofeld. Well, Matthew Hoggard really not quite finding his rhythm there. Bowled some, some good balls, got that wicket. The first ball, which was a, a triumph of planning and uh, I suppose you could say execution. It was Matthew Hoggard's loosener, really, and perhaps that's why he hit it in the air. It didn't come onto the bat quite as readily as, uh, as Matthew Hayden might have liked. Um, a terrific field placing. It's wonderful when a when a, a plan like that works works straight up. But no real threat thereafter. And uh, I think we'll see a change of bowling at the pavilion end with Simon Jones coming on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Selby. How's how are you? Over? I'm fine. I'm. Uh, I'm and here more. comes Harmison up to the wicket now. Bowls and oh my goodness me, that went right through Ponting. He came forward with a little bit of lift there, wasn't there? Well, that's uh, you know the last ball of the previous over was a similar a similar length and just a little bit wider. That and that's absolutely perfect. And that's the, that's that's where he should plug away. He hasn't got to bowl to bowl bouncers and uh, not on this pitch. It's it's slow. Ponting's put a couple. Of those away already but, but that's uh, that's perfect well this is really a, a boiling cockpit of cricket the excitement again intense here's harmison in the ponting belt oh no big appeal there but i think he may have got a bit of bat on it um it, he was in discomfort he was coming forward trying to work it away to leg well that just came back a fraction on him it was uh it was not a comfortable stroke but, but i think he got an edge to that, didn't he? I'm not sure if he, if he did, but he's, it, it had him in a little bit of trouble. Again, it's that length, wasn't it? It it's went the right, the right, The right length Absolute. to bowl. I thought it was just a double, a double click that I heard, but maybe I was wrong. Anyway, here comes uh, two, three steps in the gully. They go down, and Harmison's in, bowls, and Ponting goes across. No ball called. They go for a quick single, and Peterson swoops. Uh, Realises there's no one behind backing up. He had one stump to aim at, so he kept his powder dry. Um, and, and another no ball. So 30 now to Ponting. It's 46 for one. Runs coming at a prodigious rate, which has been the scene all yesterday. 407, England all out. Runs coming at five and a half and over. 
and uh, this morning after that early wicket, uh, the process just goes on. It's extraordinary cricket, terrific fun to watch, and great value for this uh, full house crowd. Harmison in now, bowls to Langer. Langer just uh, from the crease, stops this one, it trickles away, backward of square, and Jones from backward square leg comes in and fields. But as far as entertainment value is concerned, no one can complain that they've been um, short of full value, even by so much as a farthing. It really has been fantastic cricket. And uh, it is amazing how in recent years Test cricket has quickened up. The one-day game has had an influence of characters like Gilchrist, I think, Flintoff, Peterson. And it's um, very seldom do we get those uh, boring old draws these days. In comes Harmes and Bowles, and that's pulled away by Langer. And that was a, a short-arm jab, and the ball going down to the towards the mid-on boundary and it gets there. He didn't hit it quite out of the middle of the bat. It was, I think, a little bit high on the bat. But Vaughan had a very long chase from mid-off. Couldn't quite get there. It trickled over the boundary and the 50's up. 50 for one. Langer has now got 14. It was shortish uh, without much back lift. He clubbed it away through mid-on and... Um, Vaughan just couldn't get that. So Lang is now 14, 50 for one, and we're in just the ninth over. And in sunshine now, Harmison comes steaming in, up to the wicket now, bows to Lang. Lang goes back, oh, he's beaten there. And the way he looked behind, immediately that had gone, I just wondered if he hadn't got an edge, but obviously he hadn't, because there was no appeal. <laughs> but... Um, Langer having a, a, an, an in and out morning. He's been hit on the helmet, he's been hit amidships. And uh, Aggers was saying a few moments ago, if you get hit amidships by, or don't know what it's like, by a new ball, you want to get someone to take a hammer to you. I wonder how he knew. I, I don't know. He said, get one of your friends to hit you with a hammer. He did, didn't he? It's but I, mean, I, I suppose he might have been hit by a second new ball. Here comes Harmison in bowls, and uh, Langer goes back, plays it down the onside of the pitch. Harmison stops with his feet, <laughs> and <laughs> that is the end of of the over. The 50s come in 44 minutes of 8.4 overs and um, in 58 balls. So 50 for one the score, uh, 30 to Ponting and 14 now uh, to Langer and we're going to see Simon Jones. Wayne Daniel once tried to hit him with a second ball. Oh, he had to go an awful long way down the leg side to find him, so I can tell you. <laughs> well, yes, he was quite brisk, wasn't he, uh, Wayne Daniel? Yes. Well, now Simon Jones. No, I, I think I think he can bowl well in these conditions. He, he's the sort of bowler who'll pitch it up. He's got good pace, and he does bowl this uh, away swinger now. Um, he's got 44 Test wickets, an average of 31.95, and his best bowling figures are five for 57. And uh, he's going to bowl to start with to Ricky Ponting, the Australian captain, who could have so easily been run out for naught, but since then has played uh, a tremendous array of strokes, taking everything on. We got two steps of Gale, backward point cover mid off on the offside. And here's Jones's first ball in now. Bowls Ponting, who goes back and forces that with great power, but straight to Giles at backward point, who fields the ball on the bounce. And uh, Ponting, mildly frustrated by that, rehearses something similar and then scratches around in the crease. Jones, a great big, strong Welshman, walking back. Son, of course, of Jeff Jones, who bowled splendidly for England in Australia and in the West Indies in the 1960s. And uh, he's uh, Simon Jones is a bit bigger than his father, quite a lot bigger, in fact. Um, his father, of course, bowled left arm over the wicket. Here comes Jones now, up to the wicket, bowls to Ponting. Ponting goes back, plays that down to uh, mid-on, and Hoggard Fields returns to uh, Jones, the keeper, and uh, there is no run there. The leg side field, we've got a mid-on, a square leg just by the umpire, that's Bell, and a fine leg, Harmison. Still, uh, as far as the uh, airborne contingent is concerned, we got the light blue dirigible with its white tail fins, uh, with the television camera hanging down beneath it, and the cherry picker, also blue, away to our left. 
And it's Jones now racing in. He's up to the wicket now. He bowls to Ponting. Ponting comes forward and goes. Oh, he wanted to go for a quick single. Peterson was swooping in, and um, Langer had the sense to yell no to countermand the call. I think had they gone for a run, then it could have ended in disaster. Although, of course, there's always the chance that no one can get up to the wicket, and Peterson would have had to have thrown the wicket down. Although at that action, it was an occasion when he might have picked the ball up and just kept on running and uh, taken the bails off with the ball in his hand if they had gone through for the single, because Langer would have been a slow starter. 50 for one, Australia. In the 10th over, and Jones it is, running away from us at the pavilion end, in bowls, Ponting goes back, it's a good ball, and um, he was looking to me to be playing that away, trying to wait, get runs on the leg side, ended up by playing it out on the offside, and it was uh, Peterson coming in from covers who picked up. Jones already introducing an air of combat into this. He's a strong man, he's a very competitive cricketer, and yet, no, isn't all that bad with a bat. Well, he came in last. He played some splendid strokes last night. Turns down below us. He's got a long run. And starts in walks through four strides to get his balance. Now, here he is, charging in to bowl to Ponting. He's up there now. He bowls. Ponting comes forward. And what? Oh, announce another single into the covers. Uh, and again, I think Langer had to countermand that. Peterson swooping in once more. And I think this is certainly a way that England might get a wicket. The run out is uh, looking very much a possibility with um, Ponting very much on, on his toes to run that quick single. And it's a very good morning to um, Henry Lawson, who's taken the place of Mike Selby. Yeah, good morning, uh, Henry Blofeld. We've got to keep these Henry Henrys. I know. Look, I've had a couple of complaints already. Oh, I'll, no. I'll talk you through it in a moment. Here comes Simon Jones, then, into Ponting. He's up to the wheel. both Ponting's forward. Uh, plays that out to Giles, running a square from backward point. The end of a very good maiden over. 50 for one. That was a splendid over. And Ponting is still on 30, and Langer has 14. The Battle of the Henrys. Uh, yeah, so there's been a few of the local listeners, not the, necessarily the Australian listeners, because they can tell us apart. I mean, obviously, the local listeners have a problem. We sound the same. And that, that, the two Henrys, and I've been asked 47 times this morning, why am I called Henry? And I've explained that, and I think we did it on air yesterday. Too. We did it after Henry Lawson, the Australian poet, indeed. Correct. So look, I don't think we need to change our designations, particularly me, as you are the senior player. i tell you what, you can call me Blofeld and I'll call you <laughs> Lawson. No, no I, I think it's quite clear who each of us are when we speak. Well, I think that, you know, let's hope it is. Keep so I'm dismissing those complaints out of hand for the locals. <laughs> oh, well, it's going to be Harmison to continue from the uh, city end. He's bowled five overs, none for 24 so far. And here he comes into Langer. He bowled Langer forward, beaten outside the off stump. And uh, groping forward, didn't get a touch, and through it went to Jones, the keeper. He has bowled some very good deliveries this morning. Fast, he's hit the seam and, and got it to move, and he's been unlucky not to get the edge a couple of times. And Mike Selby was saying that uh, so he harms and hits that length, he gets it to carry through on this very slow wicket. And, and then again, Jones took it well above waist type, but still going up. Harmison again then striding in, he's up to the wicket now, he bowls out Langer, Langer comes onto the front foot and just trickles this away to uh, Peterson cover. Peterson throws rather menacingly back to Jones behind the stumps and uh, there is no run. And, and often if you get a wicket that it's been a bit soft on the, on the first day, it will harden up and, and get quicker on the second. Maybe it's done at a fraction here, but... Uh, I think it's just the quality of Harmison's bowling. Well, he's coming in now, really racing up to the wicket. He's there, he bowls to Langer. Langer goes back, plays it out the square on the, on the offside. They go for a single, and <laughs> Peterson comes, Reb's a good single. Peter Peterson came racing in from cover, picked up almost on the pitch, and, and made as if to shy at the stumps at the far end, at the bowler's end, but realised there was, uh, and as he hit them, it was giving four runs away. And in fact, Langer, I think, had that one under control because the ball only went out about three yards on the offside, and it was a good call by Langer. He's 15, it's 51 for one. And Ponting's in strike, has a bit of gardening, prodding at the pitch. But that was a good cricket, that single. There, there was one in that. We've seen a, a couple of perhaps there wasn't a single in if the throw had a hit, and Peterson only just missed it. You mentioned Ponting on zero, almost run out. That, that throw from Peterson. 
missed by the, the smallest of margins. There has been some risky running. That wasn't one of them. Here's Harmison in again now. Both Ponting. Ponting uh, goes back, plays it down the offside, and uh, with the help of uh, footwork, uh, Harmison stops it, and then Bell comes across from short leg and picks up. And, and interestingly enough, it, it's Peterson who, who seems to be under the gun there because they, they put him in cover. I mean, that's... So Ponting's position for Australia, a smaller man, very quick on his feet. And, and Peterson's a big man, but he's also very quick on his feet. He does move in rather quickly. He's quite deceptive, Kevin Peterson, just how agile he is. Gets done very quickly. Harmison in, bows to Ponting. Ponting forward, running this. Um, he was again, it opened him up a bit. He was looking, I think, on the onside. It went off the outer half of the bat, away that Giles in the gully. Ponting at the moment is looking a bit of a candidate for a leading edge, isn't he? Well, well it, it's terrific bowling because Harrison's stopping Ponting from getting right on the front foot by, by bowling quick, by bowling a good length, and then occasionally just going for one slightly fuller, and that's when you do get the LBW and the bowl come into play. So it, it's just good bowling that's stopping Ponting from dominating the crease at the moment. Harmison is in. He's up the wicket. He bowls out of Ponting. Ponting goes back, tickles this one round the corner. It goes uh, straight out there to Hoggard, a deep backward square leg, and they saunter through for a single. But that was a very good over by Harmison. 52 for one, 31 to Ponting, uh, 15 to Langer, and Harmison now six overs, one maiden, none for 26. And must be due for rest shortly, I would think. Be bowling the first 55 minutes here this morning. That's a good morning for bowling. Once again, it's coolish here, and uh, the breeze is certainly ensuring most players have, have got their, their jumpers on, mostly the sleeveless kind. But it's not bad weather for, for bowling, and you, you don't get overly tired, you don't lose a lot of fluid, and you can keep going a little bit longer. But uh, I'm just not sure if you want your strike bowler bowling too many long spells. Well, yes, and of course, Flintoff is a useful chap to have waiting in the wings. Jones starting a new over. In now, bowls to Ponting. Ponting goes back, forces into the covers, and didn't time that. And he went straight to Peterson at, um, well, he's standing, yes, just about cover. A little bit straight for cover, ideally. Uh, and we got Giles next to him at backward point, and Vaughan at a fairly wide mid-off. Peterson doing a lot of polishing there. Maybe he's taken over the role of chief polisher from Marcus Truscothic, who's the man who usually the ball is thrown to when the, po the polish needs to be preserved. Now Ponting's down the wicket, picking well, up a bit of loose stuff. So just speaking of polishes, I mean, most bowlers like to get the ball back in a hurry. They do their own polishing. And it's Jones in. Now bows to Ponting. Oh, and Ponting's beaten there outside the off stump. It was rather a strange stroke. He ended up by taking his band away to the leg side, but in fact, when the ball went past him, I think he was certainly playing at that. Oh, I think so, yeah. And that was outside, far enough outside off stunt to be letting go, but Ponting was drawn into the shot, and uh, well, I think definitely found a genuine stroke at that. He looks marginally annoyed. I think the withdrawal had some irritation to it. Well, Jones is bowling pretty well so far. We haven't had a run off him yet. He's in his second over. And here he is again, right, very straight run, up to the wicket, pass down by Kirsten, he's there, he bows to Ponting, Ponting drives, and there's no run there, straight down to Vaughan at mid-off. Vaughan whips the ball back to Jones behind the stumps, and uh, there is no run. And, and I've got to believe Harmson might bowl another over, maybe the last one before they take a drink, because you would expect Flintoff... He logically is the next man to bowl to be doing some stretches, but he's not. Not unless he's doing it with his mouth. He's having a good chat <laughs> to first slip. But you, you normally expect the next bowler up is uh, just limbering up fractionally, but Freddie doesn't look interested at all there at second slip. Jones it is again, up to the wicket. He's there, he bowls to Ponting. Ponting comes a stretching forward, but plays no stroke at that run, which was well wide of the off stump, and through it goes to Jones. Peterson comes across, uh, pats Jones, uh, the bowler, on the back. Has a quick word with him and um, then returns to his position into the covers. Ponting comes down the wicket, flicks away another bit of uh, loose stuff. The ground absolutely packed. People sitting in the, the balconies of the hospitality suites all the way around the ground, not an empty chair to be seen or an empty seat to be seen. As Jones is in, he's up to the wicket now. There he bowls to Ponting, Ponting stretches forward and Peterson waits for that at cover and there's no run. And. Uh, Jones at the moment is asking questions of Australia's captain, who is responding. He's keeping the ball out of his wicket, but he's not making runs.
Uh, he's bowling a really good length at the moment. It's sparing the line. I'll stop it outside. He, interestingly enough, Henry, they've got a man out of deep square leg on the fence. So is that the double bluff or will we see a short ball coming? Yes, Bell is there waiting for it at deep square. Jones is in now, up to the wicket. He bowls to Ponting. Ponting leaves out of there and outside the off stump. And uh, Jones, the keeper, goes diving across. That must have gone away a bit. And it's another maiden over, so Jones's figures, two overs, two maidens, a naught for naught. And he's done a very good job. 52 for one, the Australian score. The, sl the scoring rate has really been s uh, slowed down since Jones arrived. 15 to Langer and 31 to Ponting. And Harmison it is who's going to have one more over. Yeah, I think. And then he can have a drink. There's a drinks break coming up. Rather than give Flint off one and then get warm and have to cool down. Because you, you get very cool, cool very quickly on a day like today with this breeze coming across. I know a lot of the England players seem to have under shirts on the short sleeve shirts, but something long underneath them. Yes, they've got some long sleeve vests, haven't they? I don't know. That's a, it looks like a thermal underwear. It's quite that yes. cold. Uh, well, Harmison starting in now from the city end. Up to the wicket now, bowls to Langer. Langer goes back, turns that round the corner. Um, straight there to um, Bell, who's at backward short leg. Known in some parts of the world as leg gully. Yes, I'd, I'd have to call that uh, a genuine leg gully if I was... When I was on. young, would, we, we never talked, there was never such a position as leg gully. But we would have had leg slip though, wouldn't they? Leg slip would be fine now. Yeah. That's backward short leg in in the old lingo. Yeah, well, back, I would call that another four steps in. Yes. Very short, but same line. Here's Harmison again in both Lang, Langer goes back, and they go for another very quick single and get it. Uh, Peterson comes in, kicks the ball at the stumps. But uh, Ponting, I think, was responsible for calling that run. A good run, a sensible run. As long as both batsmen started straight away, they were in no danger. So 53 for one now, Australia. 16 to Justin Langer. And Ponting, as always, goes down the pitch, gives it a prod. You were out there this morning. Are there some indentations? There were, I was surprised just how, how... Well, I looked at the footmarks first, and I was surprised how deep they were. And I sort of got down and looked for some ball indentations. I couldn't see too many. Uh, maybe the, the rollers knocked a few of those out. They're, you can see the, the seam marks on the wicket. Harmison in now to Ponting. Ponting goes back, pulls that round the corner. It's going down to uh, fine leg there. There are two men out there, but he found the gap, and it's four runs. we got Jones at fine leg, Hoggart at deep backward square, but Ponting picked the gap absolutely perfectly. So he goes to 35. It's 57 for one. And if you were anything short at Ponting, well, you tend to pay the price. But that, that was a part of the plan. They've got two men back, and, and I think Harmison wanted the ball to get up more shoulder high, and it really didn't bounce that much. And we, we saw a lot of that yesterday, that uh, a lot of short balls weren't really getting up, and it made it easy to pull. Harmison in again, both Ponting. Ponting it short. He's, from his first movement, I thought he was going to pull that again. Uh, but he straightened up and played it down in front of him on the leg side, and it was Bell from short leg going uh, a little bit straighter who picked up animated conversation going on between Triscothic at first slip and Flintoff at second. They've been chatting a good deal this morning. I wonder what about, maybe what they were ha had for dinner last night, who knows. And here comes Harmison again, galloping in in what will surely be his last over boast to Ponting, and Ponting plays that away off his pads. It's going to, to midwick, the midwicket boundary for four runs. That was a lovely shot. The ball asked for it. It was on his legs, and it was up to him, and he just played it away with beautiful timing. And um, so he goes now up to 39, and the total 61 for one. And we've been playing for only just over the hour. So runs continuing to come in this match at a, a really tremendous rate. And 407 by England yesterday. And Australia, of course, lost Hayden to the seventh ball of the morning, caught by Strauss off Hoggard for naught. Hoggard's first ball. But uh, since then, Ponting primarily and Langer have really kept the scoreboard moving. And here comes Harmison in now to Ponting, outside the off stump, short, lifting. And um, uh, through it goes to Jones. It's the end of the over. The drinks are upon us, and it's time for me to get out of this chair. 61 for one, the Australian score. 39 to Ponting, 16 to Langer. And after another word from Henry Lawson, he'll be joined by his fellow Australian, James Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. There, that's my button. There, you've just turned my mic off. <laughs> These things happen. There's dials all over the place here. Uh, 
But that was a tight over from Steve Harmison that he uh, won too many this morning. He bowled some, some very fast deliveries, hit the seam, got some good bounce and, and caused some feathers to be ruffled, particularly those of Justin Langer, but couldn't quite get the wicket to, to back up Matthew Hoggard's opening delivery. And that last over, just a little bit too tight and potting. Got eight plus the, the single. Make it nine off that 13th over. And, and once again, the scoring rate hums along. 61 off 13 overs. And, and that, uh, if you extrapolate that out, James, that makes it about a 380-run day if the Aussies continue down that particular path. And who would discount that at the moment? Well, will it be a, a 400 plus day? Uh, that's that's another question. That's probably a, a little early in the day to be asking, but uh, well, Austra Australia are getting themselves in. There's, there's yeah. plenty of gaps in the field, of course, at the moment. That is attacking with a yeah. new ball. When you got 400, you're entitled to do that. And the bowling's been been pretty good this morning, but still not a lot of movement off the pitch. Still playing well. The one we could to, to, to fall, you've, you've got to say, was a major batting error. No, no, it's a good pitch of bowling to bowl it. You know, warm-up ball, and it wasn't a poor delivery, but a, a major batting area, a good field placement. How many times have you seen Hayden get out like that in the last 12 months? Well, I've seen him play lots of shots like that, have dismissed a few times and also got lucky a few times. Mm. And, and sides have worked him out. They had this straight man on, on the drive, very straight offside drive. They put someone three-quarters way down the pitch and have a short cover. And we've talked about how slow this wicket is, and it's, it's hard to drive. And to try and play that stroke, first ball you face... It's, it's really one that's going to get you into trouble more times than not. And what's the reward? Maybe you hit it for four. Um, it's, it's a big penalty to pay for, for playing a shot that really isn't on. And, and maybe, well, I was just about to say, if Australia try to chase 400 a day, they don't want to get caught in, in a battle of who's got the biggest scoring rate. A battle of egos? Yes. Yeah. They want to get caught in the battle of who, makes, who gets the first innings lead, not how many they make today. And maybe Hayden, who, you know, plays a bit with his ego, he, he likes to get on with, he's a, he's, a, he's a big guy to start off with and he likes to dominate bowling which he hasn't been doing for a while and perhaps that dismissal was a display of ego more than anything else So they've had uh, a pause for refreshments, Rudy Kurtzen and Billy Bowden have been a momentarily sated at any rate it's looking a bit cool out there I'm watching some of those in the committee area in front of us here sipping away on their various cordials and other refreshments and uh, their hairs are getting buffeted around in a breeze we've got some sort of brown coloured cordial yes a <laughs> large glass with a bit of froth on top 30 water on top it's encouraging isn't it get a thirst just sitting here watching them the old the dirigibles holding firm at its, its mast in goes Jones and it's tucked away by Langer off his hip around the corner for a single he's a gritty fellow this Justin Langer he's been clouted in the helmet he's been hit in the solar plexus and uh, he's out there doing what he normally does ever since we saw Ian Bishop hit him in the scone and his test taboo batting at number three in Adelaide uh, he has been a remarkably determined and gritty survivor out there. 17 to his name and the score 62. And he's playing second fiddle to, to Ponting at the moment and, and fair enough. It, it's, it's a good role to play. Now it's Jones running in at Ponting and Ponting gets a full toss which he drives off the bottom of the bat down towards mid on and to Hoggard and he can't score. So the field just moving around a little more now. Two in a gully, a point cover mid off mid on man in front of square and, and a long leg it's uh, not an easy ground to protect a total on if batsmen get in it's so fast as we saw yesterday with 54 boundaries Ponting has made 39 he's played and missed it a couple outside the off stump and has looked a, a little uncertain against a few shorter balls that haven't quite come onto him Jones bowls Ponting drives him straight down the ground for four beautiful stroke straight through the line as Jones just pitched up a tad further than he had in the last few overs and Ponting was into excellent position and with another unpressed bat he depressed the ball and that wasn't a half volley either it was a pretty a long half volley and that, when you see Ponting hit the ball that straight I mean that's a good sign for him the ball before I thought he fell across a long way Hit it from outside Austin, almost a full toss to mid on. I thought, oh, that's not a good sign. Overbalancing, but, but that one, that was a delightful shot.
He's 43 at one for 66. Jones bowls again and Ponting is driving him for another four. This time down the onside of straight. Oh, they are superb strokes. Shots of a man who's uh, threatening something big here. He's um, known for getting double hundreds and maybe this is the day he'll get in. Jones has bowled very well to him, but just two deliveries. They weren't over pitched. No, they, I mean, they went straight and straight off the bat. And, and as much as as followers of the game love a good cover drive, I think the on drive to me is is the most watchable shot in the game, and that was off the top shelf. Ponting's 47, one for 70. Jones goes up and bowls a full toss. That's hit for four. Just as Hoggard moves straighter at mid on, he over pitched. And this is a bit like Jones at Lords, who bowled some good overs and then was inconsistent. A 50 for Ricky Ponting, his first half century of the series. He raises his bat to acknowledge the applause from a lot of the fans here. A big posse of golden shirted Australians at the far end of the ground. Up there in a group. Is that your tour group? Tour well, group? there's a couple of groups up there. and uh, yeah. Merv's mob. Uh, they've got a fair bit of that stand covered, haven't they? The, the gold caps or the gold shirts. I think they were a bit disappointed last night, the fans, the Aussie fans. There's a short the mid on now as Jones bowls and Ponting comes forward and pushes towards mid off. Disappointment for the Australian fans. He didn't score another boundary. And that 50, Bill? It came off 51 balls, 10 fours, 62 minutes. So we're back where we were yesterday. Five runs and over. That was the 14th over of the innings. It's one for 74. Layer 17 and Ponting 51. And uh, there's going to be a change down at the city end. It looks like Andrew Flintoff is coming into the attack. Mm -hmm. Hayden out for a primary today. So primary club members, you've got a shell out. Yeah, it's flint off on, and, and it's no surprise that the last over from Harmson looked a tired one. Just one, just one too many, and that was a poor over from Simon Jones. He, he bowled a couple of, well, two maids he started off with, but that, that over was sadly a stray, particularly the full toss that got banged through mid-wicket. Not sure what Jones is trying to do that over. It was, well, a much fuller length, and we not seeing the ball swing or seam today. You can't afford to get it too far up when the pitch is playing well. Give the batsman driving practice. So Flintoff to bowl to Langer. Steve Harmison's temporarily off the field. And he's been uh, substituted by Gary Pratt from Durham as Flintoff runs in and bowls to Langer, and Langer goes back, and he turns the ball off his hip, fairly fine towards the man in front of us, that's Jones, who gets rid of the ball rapidly as they wandered through for one. Langer is 18, it's one for 75. And it's quite a tortured look on Simon Jones's face as he just walks right down in front of us after feeling that ball, and probably just wondering what went wrong in that last over after, after a good start. I mean, his job at the moment is to just pull a nice tight line and lengthy. We had two maids to start off with, then 13 off the last, and that over everything far too full. And some good shots from Ponting. But the last ball was a full toss, which was an invitation to hit it anywhere on the leg side. And Jones is saying some private thoughts to himself at fine leg at the moment, just trying to sort out that last over and get it right for the next. There's two men on the boundary behind square. Flintoff, Ponting goes back, and knocks the ball down to Pratt who feels out there at point because it's long been the policy here in, in, in England to release the 12th man to go and play for his county and uh, have A and other substituting <coughs> some of the great catches in test cricket have been taken by A and others Alan Reese, I think took one Copley years ago at, uh, at Lord's got, came out to a great catch here comes Flintoff, haunting forward, pushing away on the, the offside, and it's fielded at cover. Hildreth at Lords in the Trent first Bridge, test. I think, because uh, a couple he came from there. Uh -huh. yeah. But I'll but check it out. This is, this is very much uh, the pattern, though, but it's uh, not the way in Australia, is it? It, it? it happens rarely. It's normally the 13th man who might be you know, fished, fished out of a, a the, local side. Yeah, the geography's sort of helped in England. 
You don't fly someone in from South Australia to be 12th man at the SCG. Yes, well, it's Flintoff bowling and Ponting's 40. Squared up slightly. The ball just stopped a little bit and went down the offside. But I was reading Steve Waugh's comments saying that uh, really, you know, it's been the Australian policy. If it's Bickle or Lee, they stay with the team. You don't send them off yeah, some, that, somewhere else, do you? I mean, once again, geography's always demanded that. And I can't really think mm. of a 12th man who at a test match has gone off and done something else. How is 12th men in state games often go off and play with their clubs on Saturdays? Flintoff once more from the city end. He bowls to Ponting and Ponting leaves a ball. It's just outside the line of the off stump and uh, Biddle's digging into his archive here. Yes, it was in 1930. Sydney Copley, a 24-year-old member of the Nottinghamshire ground staff, fielding at mid on a substitute for Larwood with a stomach upset. Made a lot of ground, took the ball at full length and although rolling over, retained possession. An historic catch ended potentially a match-winning innings from uh, McCabe, who made 49. England winning the game in the end by 93 runs. Flintoff bowls, just wide of the off stump again, and Ponting's having a look. No thanks. And that's the end of the over. One for 75. 18 to Langer. 51 to Ponting, with Hayden out for a first ball duck. Good start from Flintoff, some good pace there, got a bit of good carry too through the keeper. He's just warming up, I didn't see him do too many stretches before he began that spell. He might just warm up and work into the spell as more a traditional way of the bowler coming on. Have a few looseness, a few warm-ups and then get your act together. And Freddie Flintoff strikes me as being a more traditional cricketer. Interesting move here. Ashley Giles is into the attack. It uh, took Ponting only 59 minutes yesterday to have worn on, and now we're up to about the 75th minute of the day. And uh, Ashley Giles, of course, a, a local hero, the, the king of spin, not the king of Spain, as was uh, so unfortunately put on the, the cups <laughs> that were created for his benefit. He's coming on to bowl. The king of Spain. <laughs> yeah, I got it slightly wrong. It's only an extra A. I mean. I think you've, for a vast price, uh, you, you can f find them down there, you know? <laughs> no, he's, he's had a job lot made, now he's making much of this, and his posters, I think, say King of Spain. So the, is it going to be like the Spanish dollar or something? It's <laughs> a collector's item. <laughs> well, well, he, they might have misspelled it for Lords. He was, they had the S misplaced at Lords. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, look, I've got a feeling, these footmarks, I talked about them in, in the pitch report this morning, I mm. just hit, they're, they're a little bit deeper, and he's got plenty of runs to play with. This is the time where he could do well. I'd, I'd like to see him bowl attackingly, though, with a bit more flight. But he's got a great breeze. The breeze is really coming from his left to right, almost straight across the ground from the west to the east, and it's a great breeze for him to drift it away. If he wants to get it up there in the air, he can drift it away here. But Jones has just bowled the three overs, and obviously Vaughan feels, well, that's it. You, the last over just wasn't good enough time to, to get my local man in. Get the Warwickshire man on. Obviously knows the ground well, knows the pitch well. Well, let's see what he can do. He's going to operate initially to uh, Langer with a slip and a short leg over the wicket. He bowls to him, and Langer just waits and then pats the ball quietly away to the onside in the direction of Strauss. And uh, Ashley Giles uh, didn't have success at Lords, but last year on this ground he did, Bill. Well, he got nine wickets in the previous test at Lords and then another nine here. Four yes. for 65, five for 57. He goes up, Langer waits for the ball and pushes it away on the offside. He's just he's giving it a bit of air there, just giving it a chance up near the line of the off stump, and there, there is a little bit of roughage that he might be able to land into for the benefit of a short leg fieldsman, bat pad. One for 75. Giles rolls in towards Langer. Langer's on the crease and uh, keeping the ball away. It's just in that area there. So he's, he's landing them intriguingly to start with. He's got a man out of... No, oh, cow corner, wide long on if you like. Which is interesting to start off your spell. And that's where Langer goes when he's ready for it. Is he now? He sweeps and misses. It's down the leg side, and uh, well, it was an awkward one for Jones. 
and he couldn't take it cleanly. Not that it mattered. It didn't come off anything. And yeah, when Giles got away with that one, that, that was quick end down the leg side. Anything on it from the batsman, it goes away for four because the nearest man's way out of deep backward square leg, but 80 yards away. Charles in, Langer forward, well forward, and gets a run as he pushes into a gap on the offside. Langer has to scuttle through, and there's a bit of backing up required. And luckily, Jones was there to stop the throw from Vaughan, which was wide of the stumps. And that would have been at least an overthrow or three. Although Peterson, he was down yeah, behind yeah, Jones. No, no, well, well done, Simon Jones. He, he had to work hard away to his right and dive. Otherwise, that may well have been... Well, at least a couple of overthrows, and Giles does not want that break at the moment. It, he'd love to bowl his opening over for one and be a good start for him. Now, the, for the right-hander, it'll be interesting to see what, what occurs here because we saw Clark and Martin ease him through the onside, break the field up very quickly, and, and Ponting's fairly quick on his feet. He's going to start here with a short find, deep backward square, deep mid-wicket, a mid-on, and then a slip with under the nose on the offside. Backward point cover and a mid-off. It's so hard to bowl. and You'd think he's going to aim at the footmarks outside leg stump, but there's so many ones there on the leg side. Charles goes in, and Ponting plays the sweep and plays it well. Down behind square and away to the boundary for four. Another four to Ponting, his 11th in 55 runs. And the total has moved to 79, 80 in fact. One for 80. And those runs have come from 16 overs, Bill. That was the 16th. So there you are. It's five and over, maintaining the scoring rate for the test match. And uh, after more from Jeff Lawson, Jonathan Agnew is going to come in to continue the commentary. Well, Giles doesn't get away with just a single or even two off the first over. He gets hit for five. And the last ball, he bowled over the wicket with a very interesting leg side feel with... with Men spread on the leg side and pitched it outside leg stump and it's being invited to sweep at and Ponting played the shot well and went for four and you've got to think that if he had to bowl that middle stump or go up some flight and bowl to his offside field it wouldn't have got hit for four but that's the way they play Egg as he bowled Giles over the wicket outside leg stump. Good morning. Good morning to you and to uh, everybody listening. 80 for one. Another uh, entertaining morning's cricket. And it's Flintoff running in heavily from that far end, and Langer comes forward there, pushing the ball just a, a yard or so up the pitch. Flintoff rushes through to pick it up, and there's no run. And it's been an intriguing morning, it really has. But there are test matches like this, aren't there, that are just action-packed from first ball to last. This, this has certainly been more action-packed than <laughs> most. But, but, but with no real reason for it. It's just, it's just happened. It's, uh, runs have flowed so fast. I'm still not convinced it's an absolute belter, this pitch. I think it's done a little bit. We've seen some uneven bounce today with a new ball. And it's slow, isn't it? It's yeah. not the kind of the, the kind of belter where the Absolutely. batsmen just swing it through the line right. and, and the bowlers cross their fingers after they let it go. Definitely not. It's not one of those sort of pitches. And usually on slow pitches, if you can bowl a good line, it becomes difficult to score and batsmen have to take risks. But that doesn't seem to be the case here so far. It's 80 for one. Flintoff over the wicket, bowls to Langer, short, prodded away from the hip or thereabouts, up towards mid on. Maybe on the glove, actually, is wringing his left hand, Langer. Well, he hasn't been hit for about half an hour, so he needed something to shake him up. <laughs> He's taken some bruises today, that's for sure. Opening batsmen are supposed to take bruises, aren't they? I mean, let's face it, you and I here, former fast bowlers, mm. but very fast, both of us, that one of the greatest sounds in cricket is the sound of leather on flesh. <laughs> That's a typical Australian remark. Here comes Flintoff, and that's on the off stump. Langer forward, and they're going to go for a quick single. Here's a good run taken by Ponting. A one-day style, really. With the ball trickling away, only a yard into the offside. But uh, maybe he knew that, that Langer was in some discomfort. And so uh, his captain there taking the pressure off him. 81 for one. Yeah, you used to, you know, bluster and blow and bounce people down the hill at Grace Road. and Very occasionally. Yeah, did you... Oh, sorry, you apologise every time you hit someone on I the arm. never liked the arm anybody. Anybody. It was a horrible thing to do. Hit the England captain once, didn't you? Oh, it's very well, painful to be hitting Did he have nets. a bat at the time? Or? He, he did. <laughs> Here comes Flintoff, and uh, that's pushed away by Ponting into the onside. It was 1978, Mike Greeley, and I was on one of those old Whitbread scholarships. Remember those, Bill, don't you? And a promising youngster was sent out to Australia. Sounds thirsty work. <laughs> there wasn't any Whitbreads involved, but they sponsored it. And... Uh, 
Oh, yeah, and both of them, I think, was on the year before me. He was, me. he'd be, been to Melbourne, that's right. That's why he and Ian Chappell got on famously, wasn't it? Oh. A little feud Not that's really, lasted ever yeah. since 1977. <laughs> 81 for one. And uh, Flint off from the far end, bowls on the off stump, ponting forward, plays this back to him, and there's no run. I, I turned up for the Boxing Day test at Melbourne, or at least before Christmas, this. A couple of days before the game, I suppose, and a bit of rain around, very unlike Melbourne, of course. And uh, it had got onto the covers of the nets, if there were any covers. And the England boys, I was only 18 year old, you know, keen bowling, playing for Essendon actually out there in Melbourne in, in uh, grey cricket. And I hung around to see if anyone wanted to have a net. Here's Flintoff, and that's turned away for one run by Ponting. He goes to 56, 82 for one at the end of that Flintoff over, which was his second. Tidy. Two was for three and uh, aggressive and typical flint off way. But anyway, Mike Brearley, captain, said, uh, I think I fancy a net. I said, well, you know, it's been raining, skipper. I said, they don't look terribly good. <laughs> and he said, no, you'll, out we go and you'll, and you'll bowl at me, young man. So I literally bowled off about three paces, something that I'd call nothing more than a gentle dobber that hit a patch and just exploded. I went hit him straight in the eye. Bang! There was no one on the ground bar one journalist, Rod Nicholson, who may well be listening. Uh, so, uh, greetings to you, Rod, if you are. And he had this story all to himself, England captain. Horrible blow, his eye was just... It was swollen, it was black, it was... So, so how did you describe the delivery? Uh, as, a, 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 as a gentle... 100 mile an hour. No, nope, I was honest. Gentle, medium pacer that exploded from a length and hit him straight in the face. But, of course, then people got really worried in the England camp. Because guess who was vice captain? In comes Giles <laughs> over the wicket, and uh, Ponting plays his back to him. Didn't come from Yorkshire. And there's no run. He did. And when news filtered out at the Hilton <laughs> Hotel there in uh, Melbourne, there was <laughs> the England team was in panic station. <laughs> <laughs> they thought boycott was going to take over. 82 for one. Oh, and uh, Giles goes trotting in over the wicket. Ponting drives up to mid off. Nothing for him there. Peterson fields. And uh, in fact, they managed to patch him up. I mean, they call in. Everybody, really. He, I mean, really, I think, was, uh, was was attended to by just about every type of physician in the land to get him back on the field. And were you then a minor celebrity in Melbourne? Well, do you know, I, I was briefly, because the Aussies rather liked that. They didn't like Mike Quilly very much anyway, did they? Oh, not really. He was a visiting he's, he's captain. They, they gave him some stick. Here's Ponting, forward, playing up to uh, extra cover. And there's no run. It was before his long beard phase, but they still didn't like the visiting England captain very much. But there's this big picture, I remember, on the, the Melbourne Age uh, building. Is that the one on Flinders Street, the corner there, just where you go yeah, down yep. to the MCG? There's yeah. some big billboards up, yes. big glass ones around the, uh, the wall of the building there. Here comes Ponting coming forward as he plays Giles there to extra cover. 82 for one. And there's this huge picture of, uh, of a rather woolly-haired me holding his ball up to this rather unfortunate picture of Mike Brearley uh, with this great gash across his eye. So it was a nasty moment, not least for the England team. Here's Ponting, and that's a lovely stroke. Driving through extra cover as Giles again over pitches and gives him too much width. And he put that away with just no fuss at all. He just drove it through extra cover. Beautifully timed, 86 for one. Well, I... I so we may have seen Breeze tomorrow, he might be in town running his mm. column. Well, I'll just check the veracity of those details. All of them. All absolutely true. Yeah, here's a second think. version, later. I would well, love like to say that it was a most ferocious delivery, that, uh, that it wasn't. It just simply spat off a length. Bowling for your uh, late inclusion in the uh, Boxing Day Test <laughs> I would, match. I would, I would love to admit that I was. In goes Giles, and uh, that's turned away by Ponting. He'll have another one here, working that away to backward square leg. Vaughan's the fielder. And uh, Giles completes his second over. He's been hit for two boundaries now. And so he's bowled two overs for ten. And it's 87 for one. After 18 overs of Australia's first innings, they're applying to 407. During the lunch break, we're talking to Graham Thorpe, amongst other people, looking back at, uh, at Thorpe's career, which have, has apparently come to an end now. He Don't forget to ask retired. him. I'm I'll take any deal at, at New South Wales, going to New South Wales. I just asked him, how did he come about his deal playing for New South Wales? How did it come about? Okay. Why, why are you particularly intrigued in that? Oh, I'd like to know. 
I'll make a note. Uh, where are we? Winter coverage. All a lot of people day. would like to know, in fact. Winter announcement. There we go. How come? I'll put it in there, Henry. I'll ask him. Thank you. What have you spotted? Very heavy cloud. The light's not very good, is it? Well, it's all right. There are no lights on. 87 for one. In comes Flintoff. And, oh, Ponting gets one here. That cuts back at him. Billy Bowden is being yelled at by Flintoff, at least uh, appealed towards. <laughs> it was an always optimistic one, I think. And we haven't seen the crooked finger so far today. We saw it yesterday. The crooked finger that's crooked when it gives somebody out, but then remarkably is straight when he signals a six. But uh, that's Billy for you, sort of developed this this crooked finger technique of giving a batsman out and that came off the inside edge and hit Ponting quite high up on the thigh anyway so no real question of Mr Bowden who's actually a very good umpire giving that out Flintoff runs past him and bowls to Ponting who's forward getting that left foot right out to the pitch of the ball which he plays down to Gully where it's fielded by Giles 87 for one it's unlucky for Australians this number isn't it no, we'll it's try and put the mockers on you a bit absolutely is rubbish that is it there's no factual basis in 87 being unlucky or... In fact, it's one of the least numbers that Australians are dismissed on. Right? Right. They did a statistical analysis a couple of years ago. Rob? Nought's the main one. Nought's the main one. I've already had one of those today. Yeah, I thought 87 was your unlucky, right. unlucky number. Here's Flintoff. He bowls to Ponting. He looked rather anxious there as he played that down into the gully, I thought. Well, it is. It's 13 off 100. Yes. Mm. Yeah, well, it's all. Uh, someone invented that story 50 years ago and it's... It doesn't really. It's, just, it's a nice story, but I mean, we don't we don't consider 87 unlucky in our up here in the northern hemisphere, do we, Bill? It's 111. Word Nelson, of course. Yes, well, Nelson, there's no factual basis for that one either, but it's a nice story. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, for wicked falls now, you'll be justified. Well, in I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not willing ponting out, but oh, it, would, it would complete a nice little bit of dialogue, wouldn't it? 87 <laughs> for one. It comes Flint off, and ponting lets that go outside the off stump. He's in no particular rush. To get off this number, he probably hasn't even noticed that the score is no, 87. Well, it's usually, yeah, the total's on 87 or 187 or, or the individual or it's the 87th over or there's been 87 no balls bowled or, or it's the 87th pint drunk by those in the holly stand or... 1987 was a dodgy, yeah. Oh, terrible year. Well, if I say the score often enough, then he might, <laughs> he might look up there at the scoreboard. 87 for one. And uh, Ponting's on the 61. And Flintoff pauses for a moment. Oh, now he's aborted that delivery. He's quickly turning round and he's going to give it another go. Ponting settles down. It's 87 for one, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> and uh, Flintoff comes in and bowls to oh, it. And that's uh, outside the off stump. No stroke offered. Is that at 82 miles an hour, that ball? Oh, it was too. It was 87.3 <laughs> miles an hour. I don't like the way it's stacking up against him oh, here, Jeff. Right. <laughs> How many deliveries has he faced? Must be getting close to 87. <laughs> He had 75. Isn't it? Well, that little light above his score there is shining quite brightly. You're right, Bill. It's not. It's not desperately light out there, but there's no bad light showing yet on that, that meter. That light is shining at 87 lumens per square <laughs> meter. <laughs> well, here's Flintoff, and he bowls to Ponting. Oh, he's beaten. That was a whisker away, probably uh, an 87 per millimeter away from finding the outside edge. And uh, it was a good ball, a good over, and it remains 87 for one. And now Alan Jones is coming out. He, uh, the former Middlesex, uh, Sussex, Glamorgan, Somerset. Yeah, he did. For, he got capped by four of them, and he's just sent it over the light meter. He has. Oh, we're going shipping. Radio 4 listeners, sorry about that. There's a quick cue for you. And uh, to Andy Rushton. <laughs> Ponting sweeps. Oh, he's going to be caught here. He's chipped it up. Chipped it up the back of square leg. And Ashley Giles, oh, he's pointing to somebody now. He's delighted. His first wicket of the series is being mobbed and he's getting a standing ovation from his adoring Warwickshire public. Ashley Giles strikes, he's taken the second wicket of the morning for England. And Ponting looks furious, always kicking at the ground. Welcome back, Radio 4 listeners, as Ricky Ponting comes walking off the ground here. He's been caught, he chipped up a catch off Ashley Giles as he tried to sweep. And Michael Vaughan took the catch at backwards square leg. Ponting is disgusted with himself. He's kicking at the ground as he walked off. He, was look he looked so well set. He's made 61 from 76 hey, balls. Hey, hey, and Ashley Giles was absolutely thrilled as he took that wicket. He was leaping around, cavorting about. He was pointing at somebody in the England dressing room. We're not sure who that was. Maybe Steve Bull, the psychologist. But uh, he's taken a wicket. And Ponting, having hit 12 fours in his 76 uh, in his 61, rather, having faced 76 balls, is out. 88 for two. 
Well, it's a, it's a big wicket in many ways for, uh, for England and for Ashley Giles, uh, not just because Ricky Ponting was in such uh, ominous form there, but because the Australians themselves have made great play about how Ashley Giles wasn't going to get a wicket in this series, and they were just going to milk him around, and uh, um, if he's going to get the third test, he'd have to get the second test first, and uh, just, just getting on top of him. So. No, he's, he's, he's actually a remarkably well-balanced character, Ashley Giles, in spite of what we've... Uh, um, the, the storm in the teacup, if you like, over the past couple of weeks. But uh, um, he, he, he's been an integral part of England's success over the past couple of years. With bat and ball. With bat and ball, indeed. Yep. And just generally being Ashley as well. Yep. Well, he'll be happy now. And he's bowling to Martin. In he goes, and Martin comes skipping down the pitch. My word, he flicked that away into the leg side. He had no idea where it had gone. And it just went wide of Ian Bell there at short leg. And there's a great roar for Ashley Giles. And his teammates are running up again. More slapped hands, slapped on the back, slapped on the bottoms, you name it. And uh, a bit OTT, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, it's likely so. It, it is, it's like a man who's taken his, his 500th test wicket. But anyway, uh, Ashley has been low, as we know. And uh, let's not hear any more, I think, from him about... Uh, grumbles and gripes he can bowl everyone knows he can bowl and he's picked up a wicket there and a key one for England too with Ponting out for 61 and uh, Michael Vaughan was absolutely delighted to punching the air and it's 88 for two with it came uh, out the rough a little bit you think I, think it's, it's, I mean it got a little bit big on him on the sweep it was uh, probably the right length but he, he ended up trying to play it from nearer knee high than uh, and ground level. Um, it's a good job that Ashley Giles hasn't had one of these Shane Warren, Graham Gooch <laughs> hair jobs because having seen the way that the, his teammates there were rubbing his hair in congratulations, it would have fallen out by now. Well, Shane Warren gave his a, a real going over yesterday, didn't as the ball kept disappearing over his head, so... It remained intact. Seemed to survive, yeah. yeah it's, it's a good a advert for it. Very, very... Industrial strength. glue, yes. Now, in comes Flintoff, and that's on middle and leg. Langer tucks it away for a single out to mid-wicket. 89 for two, and Langer moves to 22 with his West Australian teammate, Martin, for company. And, uh, well, Inga would love another wicket before lunch. It's been, uh, again, a, a lively morning. Plenty of boundaries, shots being played. There's been bruises for the batsman, some aggressive fast bowling from Harmison. And, uh, well, the game's in the balance at the moment. 89 for two. As the field settles down, what have we got? Harmison's coming into a second gully. So there are two slips, two gullies. A cover point in a mid-off. And then a mid-on. Forward short leg, that's Bell with the helmet on. And down to our left, the long leg. So Flintoff comes in and he bowls to Martin. Oh, my word, that came cutting back and kept rather low. And Martin just got his back down on that. And that's another indication that we talked about this pitch yesterday and the decision taken by Ponting. Well, that's certainly from here. Didn't shoot along the ground, but it kept uh, rather lower than the batsman might have expected. It is, of course, very early in his innings. He'll try and get forward to those from now on. But if the pitch does deteriorate, and there is invariable bounce, and uh, this innings of Australia's is clearly vital as far as the context of the match is concerned. In comes Flintoff at Bowles and Martin with plenty of time this time. Shuffles forward, plays up to Vaughan at mid-off. And there's no run. 89 for two. The sun trying to peek out. As England again look busy, they... It's a little bit quiet. When, uh, when Ponting was playing so well there over the last uh, 45 minutes or so. But uh, a wicket makes all the difference. 89 for two, Martin on strike, in comes Flintoff, he's there, he bowls to him, that's flicked away for Martin's first runs, out towards the deep square leg boundary it goes, Jones might just get there, he will indeed get there. Stopping the ball a yard inside that uh, triangular shaped Toblerone-like edging. And he keeps Martin down to two runs with an arrow-like return, 91 for two. Reminder again, I mentioned that uh, we're playing tribute to Graham Thorpe in the interval. Nasser Hussain is coming in to join me. I think we'll hear from Mark Butcher as well, and, uh, and of course, the man himself. So that's all coming up in uh, the lunch interval. 91 for two. 
That comes Flintoff. Now that's outside the off stump and goes through at quite a rate. Martin not playing a stroke. It says here though 85 miles an hour. I'm rather giving up on this speedster, I'm afraid. I don't know whether it's been set at a funny angle for this game or, or quite what it is, but certainly uh, Harmerson and Flintoff have bowled every bit as fast as Lee did yesterday. Maybe it's interesting that Lee, of course, bowled from this end and the other the other end to, to Flintoff and Harmerson. That's interesting thought, yeah. One end isn't so, as accurate as the other. 91 for two. Is Flintoff and Martin goes back here, punching out up to mid off. I take a quick single. Vaughan throws at the stumps at the far end, misses. <laughs> the crowd groans there, suggesting that it was a, a pretty close run thing. But uh, Martin survives, the throw didn't hit the stumps. And so Australia with 20 minutes to go before lunch and 92 for two, with 22 to Langer and three to Damien Martin. More from Mike Selby, and then it'll be Henry Blofeld. Well, I suspect that Damien Martin was home there, although one can never tell these days the number of times that uh, uh, the eye is deceived and the camera proves otherwise that he might well have been just a fraction out we shall find that out shortly, I dare say um, England not hitting the stumps again it's, uh, if England have a, a general failing in the field it's, it's their ground fielding which can be exemplary, is uh, hampered only by their inability to hit the stumps when it, when it matters um, in fact the, the, the Ashley Giles throw at, uh, at Lords, um, where, he, where he got a run out, stood out quite starkly against some of the other efforts. Well, it did, and of course, if um, Peterson hit the stumps earlier today oh, before right. Ponting had scored, it might yeah. have put a very different complexion on, th on things. But nonetheless, that wicket of Ponting's falling when it did is just what the doctor ordered for England. They needed a wicket before lunch, and now they'll think they need another. Um, three men round the bat as Giles comes in to Martin. Over the wicket, Pearls Martin's down the wicket, uh, playing that one. He's looking very confident, isn't he, where he uses his feet, down, uh, to, out to Hoggard at deep mid-wicket, and they run a single. So 93 for two, Martin goes along to four. And Giles is full of the joys of spring, and of course he's answering his critics in the best possible way. Um, he did answer them verbally last week, which perhaps wasn't the wisest way. Better to keep your mouth shut and do it on the field. And that's exactly what he's doing, and all credit to him. He's a very nice man. And um, I've, I've called him always the wheelie bin, which he doesn't actually object to uh, at all. I talked to him about this. He, uh, he's an amiable wheelie bin. It's just the way he runs in now that reminds one slightly of that. In he comes, Bowles. Langer plays no stroke to one outside the off stump that went a straight on, or it may even have been the arm ball and gone just a little bit further away, and taken there by Jones, who turns and talks to Triscothic at first slip. We got a first slip and a forward short leg, Ian Bell. Giles back, walks half a dozen strides up to the wicket now, bowls, and back there goes Langer and squirts that away just behind square. He's going out to Harmison at, at um, we're running from deep cover to a deep third man. He doesn't pick the ball up, and one short run. That was um, Langer. You didn't often see that, do you? And um, one short run signalled by Rudy Katzin by just putting it, touching at the top of his shoulder with his right arm and um, coming in from a sideways angle, so 95 for two, and here is Giles again in bowls, that's driven by Langer down to mid-off, Jones is the fielder, there's no run. Some quite menacing dark clouds are building up all the way around the ground, a tiny little aeroplane, a very slow aeroplane over in the far distance, just behind the big screen there. I don't see many of those at Edgbaston, Giles Bowles, and that uh, played away nicely by Langer with good timing. Uh, it's fielded there at, um, by uh, Flintoff at a wide mid-on, had to make ground quickly to his left, so a single to Langer, he's 23, 24, and uh, the score now 95 for two. And it's uh, Martin who is in strike, Damien Martin, who's... Uh, already showed that he's anxious to get down the pitch to Giles. That won't disturb Giles at all. We got a very short mid-wicket. New fielder. In comes Giles. Pearls that one, which seemed... Oh, and it was of ample length. Giles is furious. Kicks the ground. Martin drove it effortlessly through the covers for four. So, 99 for two now. And Martin goes to eight. That was a pity from Giles' point of view. But how often does one see a good over rather spoiled by the last ball? It does happen, doesn't it? He, he just drifted 
a little bit too far over to on, on to off stump. Um, the Australians will look to play him through the onside. They'll look to come down the pitch to him and clip him away against, um, technically against the spin, although they, they, they would take the chance that there isn't going to be um, any spin that is pretty much going to go on the straight and therefore they can just work him away a little bit like a, a left arm over seamer if you like um, that that in turn would make him have to adjust his his line and that's when they can pick him off through the offside as, as Damon Martin did there well it's going to be um, Flintoff to continue from the city end and he's going to bowl to Langer. Langer's got 24. He's had quite a testy morning. Been hit a couple of times. One's on the helmet, one's on the body. But he stuck it out. Brave little fighter that he is. Flintoff in, bowls. And Langer plays forward, just pushing that to the left of Harmison at mid-on. And they scamper an easy single. The hundred's up. 100 for two, Australia. 25 now to Langer. And um, it always, I think, does any... Australian supporter good to see Justin Langer at the crease. He's really is the, the rock of Gibraltar, uh, around which their innings has been built on so many occasions. Actually, it's, his innings thus far sticks out, doesn't it, in the context of this match? As a, it's almost like a retro innings, if you like, an old-fashioned opening batsman in a in a in a modern game. In the hell, yes, fish in the, out of water he looks. He does, doesn't he? Although one sympathises with him because of those blows on this morning. That may have slowed him down a little. But as you say, he's... Uh, people in the modern day world might call him a bit of a stick in the mud. But actually, he's doing a very good job for his side at the moment. And uh, field being changed for Martin. We've got two slips. A gully, backward point, cover mid-off, mid-on. Uh, short square leg and a fine leg. And here comes Flintoff in bows. Oh, Martin uh, ducks underneath that one. It was quite a quick bounce of that. I don't know what, 91.4 mph. It really was a sharp. And um, Flintoff doesn't uh, get above 90 all that often. But he put everything into that. And he's striving desperately for one more wicket before lunch, which would, I think, give the morning uh, comprehensively to England. And uh, Vaughan waving his arms there at, um, at, at mid-off. Flintoff is in now, bowls to Martin. Martin plays that back uh, straight to uh, mid-on. And uh, Harmison feels, throws back, actually, and hits the stumps at the uh, week he was in. Not that there was any question of Martin being out of his ground, but he got a little cheer from the crowd. And uh, Martin knocks the stumps in with the handle of his bat and the time-honoured way, just to make sure they're steady. The bales have been put on. And umpire Bowden tells his colleague, um, umpire Kurtzman, they need to be just moved over slightly so that they're straightened up. They, that's happened. Umpire Kurtzman goes scooting off to square leg. And here comes Flintoff in to Martin. He's up the wicket, he bowls, Martin drives. Oh, and that's gone away off the edge of the bat, thick edge, uh, along the ground between second slip and gully for four runs. Well, Martin li living just a little bit dangerously, but... He's come out with great confidence, especially from the way he's played Giles. He's got goes to third, no goes to twelve, and it's a hundred and four for two. Poor shot that though, Henry, wasn't it? He's mm. No movement of the feet, just flung the bat outside off stump. The ball's skewed off down to third man. It really could have gone anywhere. That could have gone to one of the close fielders. Yes, I think this, thus far England have been a little bit unlucky this morning and the ball has passed the bat a number of times without finding the edge and when it has found the edge, uh, it's gone into the gaps. Now uh, Vaughan is moving both Strauss and Triscothic at first and second step. So they're now standing at second and third step, which may be a bit like boating the, store, the, uh, the door after the horse has flown. Here comes... Um, oh, my goodness me! Uh, it was a short one. Martin went to glance it and uh, got, got it high on the bat. We even got a glove to it. Jones took off like a trapeze artist, but he simply couldn't uh, get to the ball and it went away down below us for four. So Martin really is living dangerously at the moment. He goes to 16. It's 108 for two. And Flintoff just for a moment thought he'd got him there. His hands went up, but Jones um, had too far to go. He couldn't get across. Wow, where did that one come from though? I mean, that was barely short of a length and that flew you know that's a, the uneven bounce is creeping in here it is isn't it and Flintoff again in now to Martin he's up to the wicket he bowls now Martin goes back and forces and that's very well stopped indeed there at uh, backward point by Bell who tumbles tumbles in celebration he doesn't he tumbles while uh, fielding the ball actually 108 for 2 16 to Martin and uh, 25 to Langer 
uh, 23 overs have been bowled and it's still all happening. I think that uh, two, thi two things about that delivery to Damien Martin. One is that uh, he got four runs for us and uh, is fortunate that uh, it went just wide of Geraint Jones. There's no criticism of Jones. He had a long way to go to try and get to that. But also, I think Justin Langer, the other end there, is thinking, my word, I'm glad that didn't come down to me because that would have that got rid of him, no question. Well, indeed, absolutely. It, it, that's quite right. But Flintoff really working up ahead of steam now and probably he's got... What, two more overs before lunch? Certainly one. We've got ten minutes to go. Giles is bowling this end, so I think that'll probably allow Flintoff uh, time for two more overs. And we've got three men round the bat now for Langer. Uh, a forward short leg slip and a silly point. And here comes Giles in, bows to Langer, who stretches forward and just plays that along the ground there to the England captain, who's in at silly point. Don't often see him close to the bat. Just nothing at slip and uh, Bell at forward short leg. Here comes Giles again. Up the slightly waddling approach, up the wing, gives it a bit of air. And uh, Langer plays that quite firmly away and very well stopped by Bell to his right there, who's close, close in short leg. But he obviously saw that all the way and got both hands to it. It was along the ground, unhappily for England. Langer wipes away a bit of loose stuff off the pitch. Giles turned to come into bowl, saw Langer wasn't ready, and so um, goes round in a full circle and now starts in again. Up to the wicket, past umpire Kurtz, and he's there. He bowls, and oh my God, Langer goes for a, a big drive. The ball goes down for four to the, the side screen at the far end, and it was buys. Um, well, that was one that uh, Jones, I think, should have stopped. And by signal by Ampar Kurtzin. And uh, that was um, not a happy piece of wiki keeping. Not sure where it pitched, actually. No, you're right, it wasn't. It went straight. Yes, it nutmegged him, didn't it? <laughs> and straight through I, his I legs. I don't know whether it pitched in the rough or anything like that, but it didn't. It went straight through. That's, uh, yeah. 112 for two, the score. It went absolutely straight through his legs. And Giles in again now. Up to the wicket, bowls to Langer. Langer comes forward, easing himself into the drive. A chase for Harmison, a deep a cover to deep th uh, third man. He picks up one-handed, and they come back for an easy two runs. 114 for two, and 27 now uh, to Justin Langer. The crowd watching, hardly any of them moving away for beer or for lunch. They're absolutely glued to their seats, on the, and on the edge of them as well. As Giles is in, bowls now to Langer. Langer's forward, there's a big appeal there for a catch behind, but no, says umpire Kurtzen. And um, Jones also took the bails off, so it may have been an appeal uh, for a stumping as well. I think it was primarily an appeal for a catch, wasn't it? There? I think so, yeah. I think uh, taking the uh, bails off a little bit of trying to get a bit of kudos back, I think. Yeah, well, after, yes, indeed. Look at me, I'm the stumper. <laughs> he wouldn't, didn't, didn't want to say that three balls earlier. And, uh, but a good run, piece of bowling by Giles, who's up to the weed again, now bowls to Langer. Langer's forward, hitting on the front pad. The ball bounces back down the pitch, and Giles himself uh, picks it up. And that is the end of the over, 114 for two, uh, 27 to Langer, 16 uh, to Martin at the other end. And again, Giles could easily have had another wicket in that over. He's bowling quite nicely. Just uh, the only couple of stray balls he's had which have gone for boundaries, but by and large, he's, he's bowled that very tight line he bowls from uh, from over the wicket both to right hander and left hander He's, he seems to be troubling Langer more than uh, um, the Martin got past the outside edge a couple of times so Langer presumably playing for turn that's not there but Martin when he's playing Giles is quite provided he's shown it on two occasions to use his feet now for Flintoff we've got uh, three slips Peterson has now come in to a fourth slip third slip and a second slip, no first slip really and also a gully, here comes uh, Flintoff in and that's a short run and it's hammered away by Martin just in front of square behind, for four runs and one of those ball boys in white cricket uh, clothes had a bit of a bit of a difficulty fielding that one, it was hit so hard but that was a short ball outside the off stump and Martin who has played a curious mixture of innings goes to 20 uh, he's not lagging behind in, in pace. The runs are coming at five and over still. 
It's 118 for two, but with Martin, you feel there is a chance for England. Here comes Flintoff again, in from the city end. He's there, he bursts Martin, who goes back and cuts, and or dabs rather than cuts, and a shortish one outside the off stump, and it's Bell backpedaling at backward point, who fields that on the bounce, and there is no run. Flintoff walking quickly back to his mark, like a man, man who knows he's on a mission, and... Uh, the hands of the clock now about 25 past, so maybe this is his last over before lunch. We'll have to see. Uh, here he comes, running in to bowl to Martin. He's up to the wicket now. He bowls Martin, goes back and uh, forces that away, goes straight to Peterson, who uh, doesn't pick it up cleanly, but uh, keeps it under control at backward point, and there is no run. People beginning to move now, sensing the lunch interval in the Eric Hollis stand over there to the right, where there are some rather curious dressers today. I noticed when I got here this morning, some chaps wearing the sort of clothes you and I'd never wear. <laughs> and I don't know why it's, that's, it's always fancy dress in that stand. Flintoff is in now, bowls to Martin outside the off stump. Martin plays no stroke. And through it goes to Jones, who, with a sigh of relief, takes the ball cleanly. What sort of clothes would I never wear then, Henry? I'd... Well, I doubt, I doubt I'd see you in a dress, would I? In a lady's dress? I, I... No, it's unlikely. unlikely. I think it's unlikely. I'd... Well, it's unlikely I'd... you'd see me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd lay sort of, I think, 33 to 1, probably. I don't think with we'll confidence. Down, I don't think we'll go down this path any further, do you? No. Um... <laughs> generally rather fruitless. And here comes Flintoff. Up to the wicket now, bowls to Martin. Oh, Martin plays that away to wide of Milan. They scamper for a single. And Vaughan Shad's done his direct hit. And they think they've got him out. And umpire Bowden calls for the replay. But it was a marvellous piece of fielding there by Vaughan. And they seem to think, the England players, that they've run Martin out. Well, we'll have to see. Um, yes, and I think Martin also thinks he's out. He's uh, walking or come well, he's coming down to the middle of the wicket. I thought for a moment he was walking off towards the pavilion. Well, all eyes to the replay screen. And the ball picked up, he's throwing off balance, yes, and he's out by some... Is he... Yes, he's out, not by some distance, by about three inches. That is exactly the break England wanted before lunch, goodness me. Um, we haven't got the decision from the third umpire, Jeremy Lloyds, yet, but there's no doubt to my mind that that will be given out. Very, he was only about an inch or two out, but that is a good, as good enough. A miss is as good as a mile, as they say. And, and the umpire Bowden, in fact, himself was in a perfect position to see. Yes, he's been given out, Martin, run out for 20, thrown out by Vaughan. A marvellous piece of fielding, 118 for three. And England really will be feeling jubilant at that. And they will go into lunch at the end of this over, feeling they're going into lunch now, in fact, uh, because the hands of the clock have reached half past 12. And um, that, that incident has really made this morning England. It certainly has. That, you know, that was a, 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 an instinctive piece, a brilliant piece of fielding. It was very instinctive also on the part of Michael Vaughan. He, he picked the ball up one-handed on the run, could have thrown at the, uh, at the other end, which would have been the obvious end to throw at, because that, that was the end that he was facing. But instead, actually threw it unsighted pretty much over his shoulder. Uh, and, just, and, and very much off balance oh, too. Oh, indeed off balance and uh, well you know, that's, that's instinctive brilliant cricket, inspirational cricket uh, and it's, it's just about uh, giving England the edge on what hitherto had seemed a, a pretty much an even session I thought well indeed and I mean Ponting got himself out when he looked as though he was going to take the session right away from England Ponting's a man who when he gets to 50 often goes on to get to 200 uh, he was out um, for 61 uh, sweeping at Giles being caught by Vaughan an easy catch at backward square leg and then of course that run out by Martin who'd been living dangerously um, there had been a, one, once or twice when he could very well have gone but then he did in remarkable fashion off the very last ball before lunch and um, as I say 118 for three Australia at lunch in reply to England's 407 and that will give England a tremendous boost of confidence oh you're going to lunch with that behind you, you know it's not just it's not just a wicket it's the manner of the wicket isn't it it's uh, um, it's the second or third 
close call Australia have had to run out. Ricky Ponting could have been run out before he'd scored. Um, had a direct hit, and they would think there was another another throw um, earlier on before that one. And uh, you know that drives a team on something like that. That that's uh, lifting. It's happened exactly the right moment, just before the interval. It'll take them in in high spirits. It'll deflate Australia. They've got to start again. Now they've got Justin Langer there, who's you were saying has played a, an old-fashioned sort of innings. 27 not out. He's added 24 overs for that, uh, which which in the context of this game is, is is actually quite extraordinary that somebody's actually getting their head down. Um, but I think he's he's probably doing the right thing. He, he, nobody in this game has cracked on yet, have they? And no one you know, at all. You, 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 they, they, they've all gone a pace, but nobody's cracked on to get the big 100. Somebody is going to have to score for Australia a, a big innings, a match-winning innings, if they're a, a considerable century, if they're going to stay in the game. And, of course, the frightening man from England's point of view, I always think, is Gilchrist coming in at number seven. Well, we, we think that, don't we? We do. But He uh, did it here, didn't he, he did. um, last time? Yeah, um, I think they, I think <laughs> Damien Martin did too, didn't he? And I, th- and I think Stephen Moore. So they 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 they've got heaps here. I mean, I think Gilchrist innings last time was the cherry on the cake. Rather. But uh, you know, Australia in their past four or five Test matches have have been troubled in their first innings. They've they've been barely over the 200 for five wickets, and, and Gilchrist has got them out of trouble on the uh, on all bar the last Test match actually on all occasions bar the last Test match. So uh, they could be looking for him again. You know, you've got Michael Clark coming in now, who played pretty well at Lords, but, but had a, a very early early let off, and uh, I think England know is a bit vulnerable. Simon Caddish, I think, is an excellent player, and then you are down to Gilchrist, and Andy Flintoff's really ruffled him. So far. Well, he has so far, hasn't he? Mm. I thought um, Flintoff, in fact, I, I I thought looked likely to get a wicket at the end, but mm. the way he came from a run out, and Ashley Giles bowled well. Yeah, he did. He bowled, he bowled some, some some neat stuff. He looked to be in a nice rhythm. He looked to have got the pace of the pitch. Of course, he knows how to bowl here. He, you know, you might think he doesn't bowl very often here now, but he bowled here at the start of the season and got some good wickets here. So he, he knows he knows what he's doing on this ground. And otherwise, uh, I do think Michael Vaughan handled it pretty well. Seemed to, didn't he? he you know, you can't. It's pretty, when, when, you, when you set a, a, an odd field and somebody smacks it to your field yes, at first ball, you, you think, oh, wait, this is going to be my day. And, uh, well, it has been thus far, hasn't it? He's, he's taken one catch, he's run out and, uh, and set the field for the other one. So, uh, yeah, good morning for Michael Vaughan. Well, let's have a look at the figures. Uh, Langer is not out 27. Hayden caught Strasbourg, Hoggard, Nort. Ponting caught Vaughan, Bo Giles, 61. Uh, Martin run out by that splendid throw of Vaughan's 420. Well, splendid if you're English, not so splendid if you're Australian. The score is 118 for three in reply to England's 407. Uh, the bowling, Harmison, seven overs, one maiden, none for 33. Hoggard, four overs, no maidens, one for 26. Simon Jones, three overs, two maidens, none for 13. Flintoff, five overs and five balls, one maiden, none for 20. And Giles, five overs, no maidens, uh, one for 20. It's been a very tense morning of test cricket here with Australia losing a wicket when Matthew Hayden faced his very first ball, second over the day and drove a delivery from Hoggard straight to Strauss who was positioned strategically close in on the offside at, at cover, short cover and obviously done some homework on Hayden and uh, he fell straight into the stroke and a catch was gleefully accepted by Strauss Hayden out for a primary and then uh, the Australian innings was looking to be well structured around Ponting and Langer until Ponting aimed a sweep at uh, one from Giles that pitched in the rough and bounced and he top edged it straight to Vaughan out for 61 and Langer had copped one on the helmet, one on the solar plexus a few on the fingers He's a, a great competitor. And uh, he was getting through to lunch when, from the penultimate ball, Martin played towards mid-on, went for a single. May have thought Vaughan was going to try and pounce on Langer, and he underarmed his throw at the bowler's end, and Martin was uh, just a, a little sluggish in making his ground and didn't as the throw hit and the third umpire, Jeremy Lloyds, made the adjudication that Martin was short of his ground. So it, it seemed a, a wasted wicket from Australia's viewpoint. A very 
joyful result for England prior to the lunch break. Vaughan's direct hit running Martin out for 20. So Langer's still there on 27. He's been joined by Michael Clark. Three for 118, Mike Selvey, and uh, England have got every uh, reason to be cheerful about the situation of the game here. Well, that last wicket before lunch just tipped it, didn't it? Uh, I thought that was an even session up until then. Two wickets. You, you just said two wickets before lunch was a, was a good performance. Um, 118 runs was, uh, was more than they might have expected to give away. Now, Flintoff bowls, a bouncer at Langer. That was the last ball of that over at Martin before lunch. And uh, that is a fiery welcome for Langer after lunch, rather like the welcome he received from Steve Harmison at the start of the day. Flintoff's <laughs> bowled some useful deliveries in this spell. Six overs with a maiden, none for 20 behind Harmison, none for 35 from seven. Hoggard, four overs, one for 26. Jones, three overs for 13. And Giles, five overs, one for 20. has done a, a good job with Simon Jones coming up for the uh, second over after lunch. Yeah, he's got to get his pace men on him um, again straight down. There was a good performance from Ashley Giles. Though. I thought he, I thought he, you know, he does know this green, knows how to bowl. He's comfortable here, um, and that sort of thing does make a difference to a bowler. It, it, it helps him relax. He, uh, and that wicket was a big wicket for him, not just a big wicket for England, but a big wicket for Ashley Giles because uh, you, you know you, you've been only too aware of the of the of, of the talk about what they were going to do to Ashley Giles, and uh, you know he wasn't going to get a wicket, and he was they were going to milk him, and they were going to do this that, and he's got actually the, he's now the Australian captain, so you know good good for Ashley Giles. So Australia with quite a bit of work to do. They've been playing from behind in many ways since McGrath pulled out. Jones bowls and it defended by Clark. Across and forward, <laughs> pushing firmly towards Vaughan down there at mid-off. Of course, uh, Ponting sending England in. And that extraordinary day of exhilarating batting. 54 fours and 10 sixes. England going at five and over to wallop 407 with Warren taking four and Kasperovic three wickets. And now um, some goodish spells from all of the England bowlers. Jones started well, but then considered three boundaries to Ponting's strong play. He bowls a short ball now at Clark, who clips it away. Down behind point, it's very fast out there. Peterson chases it towards the line at backward point. And Clark is off the mark with a couple. And the score is 120. So Australia is ever looking for a lengthy partnership somewhere down the order and uh, the effort with Ponting looked very promising 88 added and then another 30 with Martin and now Clark out there two slips gully point cover mid off mid on a man in front of square and a long leg Jones here at the pavilion end a bit of cloud around the place and goes up and bowls at Clark. Clark comes forward well forward watching the ball intently near the line of the off stump and uh, that dismissal leg before in the first innings at Worcester may have a, a little bit to do with the way he is moving towards the ball. He was caught a little tentative on the crease trapped leg before there and he's making a very definite movement at the ball here. That was a big one. I was thinking that he's, he's gone well into that one hasn't he? Um, I, I didn't see the game at the Worcester, but he was caught in the crease, was he? Mm. Yes, leg before in the, in the first innings, then opened in the second and hit the ball beautifully. Jones bowls, and he's forward. He's beaten outside the off stump, and appeal for a catch behind, not out. Well, uh, Jones wasn't as enthusiastic as those behind the stumps. They must have heard something. Maybe his bat shaved his pad as he pushed down the line. It was a very useful delivery. And uh, looking at the replay, maybe just missed the edge of the bat, but uh, behind the stumps, they heard something, and up they went. Well, it was, it was very close to the edge of bat. He, he certainly didn't hit anything else. Um, great seam position that was. We see on the replay that that held up all the way through to the keeper. Actually, that's probably an indication that he didn't feather it. Actually, if the seam was still upright when it got to the keeper, and the keeper Usually, didn't go up. <laughs> that's unusual in itself too, isn't it? <laughs> Jones goes in and bowls to Clark. Clark is forward, looking to drive, and he hits it down the ground for four. Just past the outstretched left hand of Jones. He hit that hard into the pitch, and it galloped away down the ground. That was a convincing stroke as Jones got a little fuller at the off stump. And Clark hit it straight into the turf, 
and once it bounced a second time, it sped off to the boundary. Clark six, three for 124. Give that the full face, and uh, that's a that's a good way to play, especially early on. Got all the width of the bat, might as well use it. Reminiscent of Ponting's glorious straight drives from Jones. Uh, an hour or so ago, but it's Jones again and Clark forward, takes it off his pads that's another good stroke, and it's flying across the square and out to the boundary at deep mid-wicket, give that one up it's four, one for the ball boy good timing and again Jones just got in near the line of Midland leg and he was picked off, so an over that almost produced a wicket with one that went past the outside edge has ended with a couple of boundaries plus two behind point ten from the over he's gone from two overs two maidens naught for naught to four overs two maidens none for 23 <laughs> it's it, once he goes past it i mean this outfield is so quick and yet even standing on it yesterday yesterday morning it was really it felt really soft the grass doesn't look to have been that close cut and yet he's racing over it but they cut it every day here? Um, every yes, every session guess. or something? And they must <laughs> roll it as well. <laughs> it is so quick, and uh, Australia have enjoyed the benefit of that. And how many fours? It was just under 70% of England's runs in boundaries yesterday. And uh, Australia... 20, 20 we've had today. So that, that's 80 of the 128 in boundaries. No sixes, though. No, there's plenty yes. of time for that, though, isn't there? Well, there is. I don't think you can see too many from Langer. He, he's he been uh, mm. under the codge here a bit. He's cop one, smacked him straight on the helmet. Another hit him amidships. A couple on the fingers. And it's his nemesis down there, Harmison, who's got the ball. He runs in from the city end. He bowls a ball that's trying to push away. It just stopped on him a bit. And again, I think he's been taken on the, the fingers of that left hand as he was looking to turn the ball away and it just got a little bit of height off the pitch three for 128 australia working hard to make sure that uh, their game doesn't fall away here england's 407 is looking fairly formidable just at the moment and they're playing with a lot of spirit out there trying to chip away at this Australian batting Harmison bowls, forward goes Langer steers it out behind point with an open face to Giles who's one of two gully fieldsmen two slips, two gullies, a cover point big gap to mid off, a mid on, a square leg and a long leg so Hayden made naught, Ponting 61 and Martin 20 and Justin Langer full of concentration here applying himself his scoring rate very much against the the grain of the flow in the game as he drives square of the wicket on the offside from Harmison and he finds Peterson out there and he can't score he's the anchor man though Justin Langer and uh, he's trying to get himself restarted here played a couple of good drives didn't go after Giles try to biff him over mid wicket and put a man back but a couple of times he was beaten by the, the straight ball outside the off stump. And now Harmison and Vaughan have decided that Bell should go to deep backward square. Harmison bowls and Langer's forward and he's driving again, not quite middling it. And it went to Peterson out there in the covers. So one of the things, of course, of, of, about playing the sheet anchor, hanging in as he is, it is possible, I guess, on a pitch like this, to lose your timing. There's uh, three or four goes there, balls which you think yesterday just Gothic or you think Ponting today would have would have dispatched. They would have been timed away. They would probably gone for four. Armisen moves away again past umpire Bowden. He bowls and Langer is shuffling across and getting a well-judged single. Just knocked it to the onside and trotted off as uh, Hoggard came around to collect. So Langer to 28. He's faced a lot of balls too in making those runs. How many has he been out there for? Clickety click. 66. So there, so that's that's well below par for the scoring rate uh, we've seen so far in the game. Yesterday, Flintoff made 68 from just 62 balls. Truscothic was going at a merry old clip. Well, they all were, of course. And now for Clark, there are two men on the boundary on the onside. There's a first, second and fourth slip 
a deepish gully, almost backward point, a cover and a mid-off with mid-on and two men out behind square. Clark is 10 and it's Harmison who runs towards him. Clark takes it away to the onside, off the pad more than likely, for a single down towards uh, Jones as a wild throw comes back and Billy Bowden raises his leg. And that's three for 129, because he was indicating a leg by. 28 to Langer and 10 to Clark at the end of uh, the over. Two overs and two balls since lunch, and Australia have added 12 runs. Michael Clark very deliberately counting the fielders out there before had to stop Steve Harmson in his run, make sure they're all there. As if he, was as if he suspected they'd, they'd slipped an extra one or two on the on the field there, just to make sure, make sure where they where they were. But um, batsmen do that, don't they? They have this um, awareness of where fields. They like to know where the fielders are. It's um, the top batsmen can do that, and they spatial awareness, and they instinctively are able to direct the ball away from them. Gary Pratt, the sub from Durham is out there behind point and it's Clark who waits for Jones and Jones has him driving fluently wide him it off he goes with the stroke and Vaughan has a ping again and this time he misses it was a good throw just prior to lunch that ran Martin out and there he had uh, more of a side of the stumps but he had to run around the ball to his left and in any case Clark was on the move and got there three for 131 and Clark has moved to 11. So it's um, Langer doing a, a Hayden down there at the moment, just going down on his haunches, stretching and practicing, looking at the pitch, getting his mind going for another concentrated effort here to glue this innings together. So I don't think we're going to see the uh, pyrotechnics of uh, yesterday, not for the time being anyway. It's Langer waiting. Here comes Jones to bowl to him, and Langer's driving and driving beautifully through the covers. Oh, that was a sweet stroke. He was on the front foot. He liked the width and measured the ball off very decisively on the drive to the cover boundary. So he's moved to 32 and the score to 135. Well, I think if you'd have asked a punchy little left-hander to have the, the what sort of delivery he'd like to get his score moving again, it'd be that one, wouldn't it? Just enough width on it to throw his arms through it. Just the right length. Hit it slightly on the rise. Longish half volley. And uh, four easy runs for him, he'd say. Jones again. Goes up at the Langer. Langer chases the ball and cuts it hard. And it's well stopped by Giles. Throws back. Misses the stumps. And it's backed up out there on the... Uh, the onside. That's a. Who's that? Strauss in the gully, is it? And Giles out at, at midwick at this time. I think it was Strauss picking that up. I think yeah. it's Peterson who's off, isn't it? Yes, Peterson is off the field. Strauss is down deep in the gully. He was the left hander, and Giles, who's <laughs> normally in that position, was the one who backed up out at midwicket. And now the uh, the young Pratt goes out to deep cover. Three for 135. And it's Jones going in to bowl to Langer. And Langer is uh, pushing away down the offside. Something had to happen, didn't it, with that name? I haven't fallen into the obvious one, so I'll leave it at that to others. But three for 135. Apparently, he has a brother who plays at uh, Durham. Yes, there are two Pratt's at Durham. Are there? <laughs> We've covered that then. The poor fellow gets some stick. Oh. Mm. Don't know. And has, has he con considered a change? That uh, it used to be Tom. He changed it to Gary. Right. Thank you for that. A slip and a gully in a backward point, and a Langer forward <laughs> pushing away down towards a uh, <clears throat> mid off. <laughs> Three for 135 here. Langer's made 32. I kind of heard. A, uh, I think a bit of conversation you. You may have been you having with, with Henry before lunch about um, better substitute fielders, you know. And I, mm. I cannot understand why Gary Pratt is our substitute fielder. Why is mm. Paul Collingwood not our substitute fielder? Why do you not have, as your substitute fielder, the best fielder you can possibly get? Here's Jones to bowl. 
And Langer defends the ball. It may have just taken him high on the pad as he pushed it away on the offside at three for 135. Well, it's, you know, it's long been the policy in Australia that uh, the 12th man is the 12th man. He, well, he, you know, it's Lee, it's Bickle, whoever it's, it's been, or at least it's someone who has got the status of a <coughs> test match player. Well, I don't even think it should be that. I, I, I think why, you know, you, you, pick, you, you pick your squad of players. Mm. Why do you not then select also the best possible fielder that you can have as your, as your reserve fielder? Well, allegedly you're letting the fellow go to go to play in a match. Is that the case? I'm not sure that's relevant, really. I, th mm. I think you, 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 this is your this is your ring the team. This is your yep. national team. You know, and those those little things can make... You know, we saw that, that run out of Michael Vaughan's there. The little things that can make a make a difference. And if it's a difference between having... You know, I, I, no disparagement to Gary Pratt might be a very good fielder, but he, I bet he's not as good as Paul Collingwood. Where is Collingwood at the moment? Is he playing in a match? They, he was here. I mean, he, he was, was here on Tuesday, he, wasn't he? They could have kept him here, exactly. Harmison bowls to Clark. Clark pulls a short ball away. Hits it for four. <laughs> Contemptuously, really. That was a little short, and he just went back. <laughs> and uh, out there on the line... Ashley Giles at the boundary. He, he, he moved slightly to his left and then realised, what's the point? That's going for four. That did sit up and Clark had oodles of time to rock back and pull it down in front of square for four. He moves to 15. Three for 139, Australia. 15 off nine balls. Well, this might be the tonic for the afternoon if he gets underway. Harmison bowls short and he's back and he's crossed again. Plenty of time. The ball hit the pitch and he went back and watched it arrive it didn't whack into his bat as it uh, had into Langer's helmet earlier in the day when the the ball was brand new now it's in its uh, 29th over and Clark appeared to have so much time now maybe Harmison's got something in mind here a bit of extra pace near the off stump to try and get the nick here he comes, he bowls to Clark, Clark back, and he turns the ball through the onside, past Rudy Kurtzen, who could have fielded it, but left it to Giles at deep square. 16 to Clark, 3 for 140 at the moment. And Australia just settling in after lunch here. And Harmison trying to stir things up, but not much in the pitch to assist him. No, you, you, you know, it's 28 overs. It's, it's, it's pretty battered 28 overs too. Around about five and over. So I think the ball will probably be reasonably soft already. And all, all the batsmen in the game have seemed to have had no no trouble when perched on the back foot to anything short. It really has come off. So they've all been able to whip it away leg side or pull. Harmison's bowling and Langer is leaving. Good judgment there. Just across him outside the off stump. He's just setting himself here to play a long, vigilant innings. And uh, he's taking a great deal of care so far about which deliveries to play. And uh, you often wonder how much a bat batsman's concentration is, um, how much his resolve is tightened by a couple of balls that have whacked him on the body grits his teeth and watches Harmison has him forward it's taking the pad and appeal for LBW looked to be hitting him outside the line it uh, wasn't a concerted shout and Billy Bowden quickly shook his head but uh, England know that they must try and get a break here before these batsmen get in useful delivery it was probably a little high and outside the line Yes, it's come back at him a fraction, hasn't it? It's pitched on the line, but probably missing off stump. Didn't quite do enough, I don't think. Harmison moves up strongly at Langer. Langer goes back, knocks it around the corner. Away he goes for one, and that's all he'll be taking with Bell on the rush from deep backward square to toss back. And it's three for 141 at the completion of Harmison's over. Langer, 33. Clark, 16. Harmison, nine overs with a maiden. None for 42. Hayden out for a primary. Ponting, 61. And Martin, 20. He's looking like a fellow who's actually rather enjoying what he's doing, isn't he? He's enjoying the contest, uh, Justin Langer. There's lots of, lots of smiles going on. I think he's appreciating the, the effort that's coming at him, too. It's a, it's a genuine contest. He's done well to survive that too, as uh, tribulations early on, um, and he did much the same at Lords, didn't he? Got that, that fearsome barrage at the start of, uh, of the match there. He looked like he might get away at one point, but uh, he got out on the short ball. 
and uh, he is the the classic warrior in a baggy green cap Justin Langer it's just four years ago that his career was turned around by that decision to replace Michael Slater at the Oval and uh, he's batted beautifully since then and now he's getting a short ball from Jones and he smacks it around the corner towards fine leg mm -hmm. for a single Harmison's down there just rolling his wrist over the shorter ball which had no real venom as it hit the pitch and rose gently towards Langer who's 34 and that's three for 142. I, I saw his debut actually at, um, at Adelaide against um, Bishop against, and Cumbie. against the West Indies yeah mm. in, the, in the one run um, yeah. win he batted at number three and he played very well too and, and I mean he came in in, the, in really odd circumstances my recollection is that, that uh, Damien Martin sustained an eye injury in practice got a finger in his eye no in no, no. Like that, Bobby it? Simpson who's the coach then I think deflected a ball straight into his eye mm. and there was some doubt at that stage as to whether he might not lose the sight of his eye. It was a, it was a rather very, really, really nasty injury. Straight in the eyeball. Another unusual one is Simon Jones bowls outside the off stump at Clark who's leaving it alone. Well that was David Martin's career in his infancy then of course and, and Justin Langer, my, my recollection is that had been at, uh, at home in in Perth at a, at a, at a barbie or something and got the summons and got the, the next flight over and the next day was was out there batting against the West Indies. And thrown in at number three, he, got a yeah. half century. Yes, he did, and he, he you know, was, <laughs> that was a, a, a gritty, gutsy display of batting because they, they were a, a mighty side there, and uh, of course went on to absolutely steamroll them in uh, in Perth. In comes Jones, just wide of the off stump. <laughs> it's allowed to pass. In fact, I think uh, Langer ended up opening in that game in Perth where Ambrose took seven for one. I think it dropped that, Taylor, didn't it? Yeah, that I can't quite remember, but. Uh, again, I saw. I saw. If I was thinking about that the other day, because uh, the only spell of bowling that I could recollect that reminded me of McGrath's spell, new ball spell at Lords, was that seven for one spell of Ambrose. This sort of inevitability uh, about a uh, unerring inevitability of wicket taking. Jones is bowling, and Clark's leaving <laughs> a ball, watching it carefully outside the off stump at three for 142. There was, there was there was nothing nothing fancy in it. The ball didn't loop the loop. It didn't it didn't seam around. It just it was just relentless probing on a length. It bounced. They nicked it, and people caught it. And I can I can even remember the single run. Damien Martin got got a little inside edge onto his pad, and it dribbled past Desmond Haynes at short leg. And that that was the one run in the seven for one spell. It was all over before lunch on the third day. Jones pitches up wide outside mm. the off stump and Clark's having none of that. He's trying to keep his concentration going here as a Australia settle in. Am Ambrose, where would he where would he rank in your list of uh, pace bowlers? Is he top of the tree? I couldn't put him top of the tree, but I mean he's he's my goodness me, he's, he's of his type, he, he was unmatched, wasn't he? He, he? he was different to a lot of the, the West End. I mean, he was he was he was relentless, line and length, relentless and hostility with it. A mean bowler. In goes Jones, pitching up, and it's pushed away towards cover, mid off, and Vaughan's there to field, and that's the completion of the over three for 142. There's some cloud around, but no rain at the moment. Clark 16, Langer 34. And Jones, six overs, two maidens. Ah, that was more like it. Just one from that. None for 29. I'll leave it with you. Mike Selby, the comment, and Jonathan Agnew coming in. Gave nothing away, Curtly Hamrose, did he? Just uh, probing. He was, he was length, length and line at great pace. A um, number of times we've seen England batsmen struggle so hard against him, not just because his hostility, but because he gave them nothing. They couldn't get him away. Games that England played against... West Indies where it always seemed to come down when chips were down it came down to Courtney Walsh and Curly Ambrose doing all the bowling for them So 142 for three Bill stop making me laugh here comes Harmison and that's uh, Langer pushing away to the offside Pratt comes in and uh, almost well he was tempted there to shy at the stumps and uh, decided not to. In the end, probably a sensible decision because uh, he might have given way an overthrow. And I think Clark was in his ground anyway. He's so fast. And uh, yes, he's comfortably in. So 143 for three. It's been a fascinating afternoon here on the boil, I would say.
Langer 35, Clark 16. Can England continue to nibble away through this Australian batting lineup? Will Gilchrist, for example, have a say this afternoon? We shall see. Clark's on 16. He's got there pretty quickly. And then comes Harmison, steaming in. He bowls it short, and Clark stands up, plays down again to Pratt there at backward point. And uh, there's no run. Three slips in place. Flint off with a sweater on. It's that sort of afternoon, really. I must admit, when our commentary box door opens, you get a, a rush of cold air through. But uh, I suspect you're sitting in the sun out there. It's probably rather pleasant as long as your, your back is to the breeze, which is coming from left to right across the ground. But the sun is out. And Harmison turns there in the distance. And soon into those big, long strides. Is there. He bowls, runs here for Clark, or certainly one anyway. He plays that way off his hip to Ashley Giles, who's fielding on the boundary at deep square leg. One more to Australia, 144 for three. And, Mike Selvey, you've got an apology to make to Philippa Tarbox, haven't you? Have I? Yes, you have. No, I haven't. She very kindly sent us all some... No, did she, she not? She sent me some very nice Thornton's chocolates. Philippa, thank you so much. You, you do it every year, and you're, you're, you're an absolute star. Unfortunately, I arrived this morning and found the contents of most of them had, had already been eaten. In comes Harmison, and uh, Langer lets that go outside the off stump. There's an unwritten rule in this commentary box that when people are kind enough to send in uh, you share them? tokens of their appreciation... <clears throat> We've all got a Jonathan in our name now. We've I, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. The it, was person, a, it was addressed to me and Henry. But the person they are addressed to shall at least open them up and <laughs> possibly take first sample. No, security had opened them. We knew under pressure. The envelope had been doctored to Jonathan Agnew, comma, and then added in different writing, Selv and Jeff Lawson. And these lovely fruit jellies have been eaten. In comes Harmison, and all oh, gets an inside edge there, snatches his head around to see where the ball had gone. It's uh, running down to deep backward square leg. Bell comes into field. And uh, they take one run, 145 for three. So, Philippa, thank you. Um, there's not much left of them, but I'm sure they were very nice. The quality control, you've got to, you know... Well, I arrived a bit late this morning, perhaps it was my fault. <laughs> anyway, lovely card. We've got old uh, Dunton Bassett there in uh, South Leicestershire. 145 for three. Down go the slips. Harmison comes in and bowls on the off stump. Clark goes back and across, defends, and that's fielded by Bell with his cap on, that extra cover. And there's no run. So Hayden out for naught, Ponting 61, Martin on the stroke of lunch for 20. And there's Katic due in next, and then of course Gilchrist. And we all remember that remarkable innings of Gilchrist here at last time around. A little blow of a kiss from Rachel Hayho Flint. That's always rather nice. She's sitting down in front of us here. Through the glass, I hasten to add. It wasn't an actual uh, direct contact as such. 145 for three. Langer yeah. looks around the ground. How yeah, would you describe the temperature? The cricketers always describe temperature in terms of sweaters, don't they? So one sweater day or two sweater day. Or well, do you know? I think I think it may be different in the commentary box to out there today. And I think in the commentary box it's probably a two sweater day, and out there it might only be one. Well, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Fred's Fred's probably got a he's got his, his long sleeve sweater on, hasn't he? There's a lot of sleeves of sweaters out there. Just got he's uh, not got any sweater on at all, but I suspect he's got a t-shirt on under it. Under his shirt. It's, uh, it's chilly in here. In goes Jones. Oh, a wide full toss. And it is signalled a wide too. And that just came from nowhere, really. I think it's completely lost it. And uh, Geraint Jones at least stopped it in front of Triscothic there. And another one goes to the score. 146 for three. That's rather like the Jones of old. Not the uh, the new controlled model. That one just came flying out. And, uh, well, it, it missed the cut part of the pitch altogether. Was it trying something... Different there. I mean, I, I don't just mean the the wide full toss. <laughs> Possibly, but I, I can't think what if he was. In goes Jones, and uh, Langer goes back, forces this rather a flowery stroke out to Pratt, who's on the deep point boundary, away to our right there, very dark-haired Pratt, and he sends the ball in to Jones, and uh, one run is taken. One forty-seven. For three, Pratt is on the field for Peterson. I don't think we've had a, an update on on uh, why Peterson might be off, but uh, a hair gel probably. Or you think that's yeah. highlights being redone? Yeah. 
in my experience of my wife, that is, it usually takes quite, quite a long time. Eh? And involves rather a lot of money as well. 147 for three. In goes Jones over the wicket. And that's a tempting one for Clark. Wide of the off stump. But uh, let's that go through to Jones. Well, Surrey had uh, two brothers, Pratt. In fact, they both played with Benstead, where I played. Uh, Ron and Derek Pratt. Ron was a very good player, but he only got in the Surrey side of the 50s when Peter May was on test duty. Um, There's uh, a Pratt that played for Leicestershire, too, in uh, the 60s. And uh, one that played Rod for Yorkshire was a very useful fast bowler. Partner. Well, no, that was Platt. Well, that's close. 147 for three. Uh, in goes Jones. And that's uh, sliced away by Clark. The pace taken off it by Flintoff in the gully. And so uh, no run taken in the end. But uh, it was quite an adventurous shot. And that was Strauss who uh, completed the fielding at uh, cover point. 147 for three. Clark remains on 17. <laughs> Lovely player, exciting player to watch. He's wearing his sweater out there. His, uh, Aussie sweater. Settles down again, much hilarity behind us. I'm not sure what about. In goes Jones. And Clark forward plays carefully up to extra cover. Uh, Bell fields. And uh, there's no run. It's that short extra cover actually again, isn't it? The position in which uh, Kevin Peterson dropped him quite early on in the season, about 20, hadn't he, I think, at, um, at, Lord's. at Lord's. So they obviously think that uh, he's got a tendency perhaps to just lean back a little bit in the drive and hits the ball aerial. He was on the back foot then, wasn't he, though? Yes, he was. Well, he said he goes for his shots, doesn't he? He's looking round the corner, he sees Pratt down there at deep square leg. Maybe there's going to be a bouncer on the way, it is short. And uh, Clark goes back and plays his away to Strauss, who's at point. And uh, there's no run. 147 for three. Clark 17. Langer 37. And uh, Langer, vastly experienced, of course, comes down and passes on. A, well, a fatherly word, perhaps, to young Clark. I think what the Australians need to remember is that they're under no time pressure here at all. And I'm not suggesting they're in a hole at all, but they're from a position that, that um, they need to be just slightly careful. In goes Jones. And Clark allows a wide one to go by outside the off stump to complete <coughs> Jones's seventh over. Seven overs, two maidens, no wicket for 31. Harmison has bowled very well today. Ten overs, no wicket for 45. Hoggard took the first wicket. One for 26 from four overs. Flintoff, six overs, one maiden, no wicket for 20. And uh, Giles, five overs, hmm. one for 20. And uh, I think we're losing Gary Pratt, which is a shame, because uh, Kevin Peterson is uh, coming onto the field. No, Pratt remains. And uh, so someone else is going off, which we'll have to try and look at in a minute. But uh, he's an eager young, young chap, is Pratt, and uh, he's running around there at mid-on. I saw Trevor Penny in his whites here as well, because there's been some sort of... Some sort of injury, apparently, amongst amongst all the twelfth men. In comes Harmison and bowls to Langer, who drives us a good shot up towards straight bit off. It goes, and they all have one run there as Michael Vaughan rolls over and over, preventing the four, but not the single. One forty-eight for three. Trevor Penny, of course, a, a vastly experienced old boy here now, really at Warwickshire, brilliant fielder. Yeah. Um, but he had been called on to do twelfth man duties here which is not entirely befitting a man of his stature on the county circuit, but he's a bit surprised. But there's been some sort of injury crisis amongst the 12th, the 12th men, I think. In comes Harmison, and uh, this is pushed away off the front foot. Must be by Gra Clark. Graham Swan, then, must be injured. Yes. He, he was another substitute, wasn't he? It's coming to something when the 12th man breaks down. <laughs> You, um, you you probably missed the conversation a little earlier, but I, I actually, I'll, I'll, I'll risk of repeating myself, I don't see why England do not have here their best possible available fielder, i.e. Paul Collingwood. Mm. Armisen bowls all outside the off stop, that wasn't far away. Clark let it go through, but there's lots of oohs and ahs out there. 
and he's coming up now and tapping away at the pitch. That one did come <laughs> seeming back. Well, I suppose they want him to, to bat, don't they? They get some runs and kick. Yeah, but it'd be, you know, you, you, you're talking about the very small percentage points that can make a difference between success and failure in this game. Um, and, and I just think you owe it to your side if you're if you're being totally and utterly professional about the whole thing. You know, everything else is, it seems to be uh, catered for. Very little left to chance. Mm. Harmison comes in again and uh, Clark whips that away from right about middle stump, I'd say, down to deep backward square leg. Giles on the move down there, throws the ball in quickly. Good return too from Ashley, who seems far happier now he's taken that wicket. He's uh, running round, not exactly with a spring in his step, but uh, looking much more cheerful. 149 for three. Clark goes to 18 with that single. <laughs> Langer on 38. He's been batting now for two and a half hours for that. And uh, well, he received a horrible blow on the head first thing today. So another one straight in the solar plexus that winded him. He's been battling away. And now as the sun comes out again, Harmison comes in and bowls to him. It's short. He pulls that down to fine leg. Jones is fielding here, just to our right, the shaven-headed Jones. And... One more run is taken by Australia to bring up the 150. 150 for three. In only 32 overs, so again, it's a very healthy run rate. They've taken just 64 balls to reach that third 50. And the field changes round again for the right-handed Clark. Harmison rushes up and bowls to him. He's forward, playing up to mid-off. There's no run, the over ends, 150 for three with Clark on 18, Langer 39. Did you hear that um, chat with Graham Thorpe and Natalie? Yes, yes. Uh, terrific, especially the admission from Graham that he had fainted when his wife gave birth, his partner gave birth the other day. That was, um, that was very entertaining. He sounds a happy chappy, doesn't he? He does, actually. And I'm, I'm really pleased for him. Yeah. I, I, I'm really pleased. A contented man. Yeah, I think that's right. He's every right to be contented, isn't he? Yeah. He's, he's, he's served England fantastically well. It was Hoggard who was off the field, so... Um, he's back. So has, has Pratt left us? GP is gone. Oh, dear. Well, he, uh, he may well return at some stage. Peterson's back on the field, and so too is Hoggard. So, England back at uh, their starting 11, so to speak. One or two Australians I see in their gold shirts and caps take their seats again either after lunch or possibly refuelling at the bar. So they're settling down now as Jones runs away and bowls to Langer. It's wide outside the Ostamp and Langer has nothing to do with that. He's jumping up and down there in the crease rather like a boxer preparing for the first round in his corner. Hmm. And Clark comes down and offers a word. Langer has a very unusual feature about his bat. In fact, it's so unusual, I've just noticed that Clark has exactly the same thing, <laughs> which is a white rubber, which you don't see many of, do you? A white batting not. rubber. There was a time where you were like, like uh, Henry Ford's cars, you could have any colour you liked as long as it was black. <laughs> yes. There's Jones, and that's wide outside the off stump, cut firmly by Langer. There's a man out there on the offside boundary, Peterson. And uh, he keeps them down to a single, 151 for three. It, it became rather a sort of a, a, a fashion setting or statement for yeah. a batsman, didn't they? For yeah, the yellow ones. And I think it was David right. Gower who, who um, went down the fashion route. He had blue. He had yellow. Blue and Robin Smith, I remember, had a yellow. Uh, and David batons. also, of course, went for fashionable socks. Yes. He went through a phase of yellow socks, orange socks, under your white trousers, which were, and blue socks, which were unusual. But... Um, I've, I've noticed Langer's rubber there, but I didn't see that Clark also had a white one. 151 for three. Jones goes in and bowls to Clark, who pulls that away for four. It was a pretty poor ball, a long hop outside the off stump, and he's dragged it away through wide mid on. And it looks rather ruefully at his bat, as if maybe it came off an edge or he's a little bit worried about. I don't know, having cracked it or something, but he's now tucked it under his arm. I think he's happy enough, but it, it certainly didn't come off the middle of the bat. Disappointing bowling this side. I, I expected a little bit more from Simon Jones in this, on this pitch. I thought he, he'd be a, a key bowler for England. The length that he can bowl and a little bit of movement so he can get away from the bat. 
Well, he's on his way, and he bowls, and Clark allows a better ball to go by outside the off stump. Geraint Jones rolls over and over and over to his left to take the ball. And there's no run. 155 for three. On uh, a steadily improving afternoon, I think we'll describe it. It was pretty miserable first thing. A lot of rain in the night over in the Beaver. So, not too far from here. But, uh, I thought there might even be a delayed start today, but after a rather damp and dismal start it's now uh, slowly brightening which is uh, very good news lots of blue sky around as Jones runs in and bowls on the off stump and Clark drives it's uh, made a very pleasant sound in the headphones that but he gets nothing for it as Vaughan fields quite deep there at mid-off 155 for three Clark remains on 22 Hayden was out for naught first ball the first first ball of his test career. I think that's worthy of a note, Bill. You've only put miscue drive to short extra cover there. I think um, a man of his experience finally gets a, a golden duck, or if he's a little mark, doesn't he? Ponting 61, Martin 20. He was run out on a stroke of lunch. And now it's Jones bowling outside the off stump, and Clark thrusts uh, left foot towards the ball, then takes the bat out of the way. And uh, over is called, and Clark wants something. He's waving towards the dressing rooms. Then, out of uh, courtesy, he uh, asks Michael Vaughan permission for whatever is about to be brought out to him. It's always a thing that the batsmen, batsmen should do, shouldn't they? Courtesy, so I've got something coming out, or I'm just going to hold things up for a moment. And it's nice to see that old tradition is, is maintained. Not sure what he's having done, but it's, uh, it's Tate, the fast bowler, who, if McGrath is ruled out, of much of the series we could see in action uh, sometime during the series he's done something there brought something out to Clark got some pace has Tate have you seen him Bob? I'm just, no I saw his saw his figures for Durham when he yes. went there but they weren't they weren't critter <laughs> uh, they do say he's uh, he's got a bit on him so. very unusual action in that he's got a, a sort of rocking catapult type action almost like Tomo but without the sort of the sweep back of the arm but it's a definite he almost looks at his arm as it as it goes yeah. over and that, like like a sort of a, a hurling action if you like it's um he's 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 quick he is quick well Ashley's gonna have a go from the uh, from the city end Bold. Very tidily, very neatly from the uh, pavilion and before lunch. And picked up that wicket of Ricky Ponting much to his Indeed. delight. I like the OC and Ashley quite so animated as uh, when he picked up that wicket. But of course he'd been told by the Australians that he wouldn't be getting a single wicket in the series. So I suppose he had every right to be pleased. He's taking one for 20. And uh, he's still sorting out his field here. What's he want? He wants... Uh, Jones moving a bit down there at deep square, is it? I think it is. Geraint, his namesake, is waving at him. And yes, he's bringing a little bit squarer there. Lots of stewards behind him, I noticed there in the Hollies stand. In comes Giles. And uh, Lang is hit on the pad. Catch it. Shouts Ashley. No one does. And there's no run. 155 for three. So a lot of stewards. I think they're on uh, on standby rather than anything else in there. That, uh, there's sort of two categories of steward here at Edgebaston. You've got your green day glow jacket type and then your your orange one. Here's Giles, a sweep from Langer. He's in the pad. Umpire Bowden says not out. It's England and about 18,000 supporters all appeal. It's quite intimidating for an umpire to have that sort of noise directed at you. But, uh, so if he bowls from almost over the top of the stumps he hasn't got to do anything with the ball just bowl it wicket to wicket and he can get uh, LBW so that was pitched outside the uh, off yeah. stump and he's got outside the line Giles pushes that through and it's padded away by Langer 155 for three it's one of those sort of kidology appeals wasn't it yeah. trying to make the batsman think he hasn't quite got outside the line of the off stump or you can't keep padding me away we often see Shane Warne doing that but if they are sweeping him, you see, he, he, it's perfectly easy for him as a, as a slow bowler to step right into the stumps and, to, and literally bowl it wicket to wicket. Two men around the bat, a slip and a short leg. Down they go. Giles bowls to Langer, who comes skipping down the pitch, pushes that into the offside for a single. Clark responds immediately. And Australia moved to 156 for three. And again, the field changes over for the right-handed Clark and it's the best part of the day now it's lovely sun beating down the outfield a little greener for that overnight rain the uh, meticulous 
dark and light stripes that we all strive for on our lawns. Look in pretty good order here. It's pristine, isn't it? Not a mole in sight. Huh? I've got rid of mine. Have you got rid of them? Yeah. Phone call to a suspect, a former gamekeeper from Loughborough. Not sure what he did, but I haven't got any left. <laughs> Leave them to me, he said. And that was it. I think he just scared them away. I don't think he did anything <laughs> more than that, but not a molehill to report over the last month. Deathly quiet. 156 for three. And Giles tweaks at his shirt. Up he comes, over the wicket. What's Clark going to do? Well, he's forward here, hit on the pad. And uh, rolls up for Bell, who's fielding from the offside there. It's a couple of yards away from the bat with a helmet on. Picks the ball up. And there's no run. 156 for three. Might just have touched the glove there, actually, having seen a replay. There's Giles again, wearing his sunglasses. That's pushed through flat. It's Clark on the pad. The over ends. I'm going to sample what remains of Philippa Tarbox's wares. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and after a word from you, uh, Henry Blofeld's coming in. Yes, enjoy. That's right, I guess. Good tidy over from Ashley Giles. The wind not in his favour. It was in his favour bowling from the pavilion and bowling going left to right. It made a little bit of indrift for him. Um, Blowing the ball away from the right-hander from the city end. Important that Ashley Giles can do the job that he does, or has done so well for England over the past few years. He's the uh, the governing factor. He's the he's the one who can throttle it back for England. He's the one who can hold an end up while the the pace bowlers go at the other. Well, Aggers has been making mountains out of both mole hills and chocolates, hasn't he? And I think he's digging into the chocolates even as I speak. Here's Jones. He's running into bowl to Langer. He's up there. He bowls. Langer pulls. And he hit that very well indeed, and it's gone from four. Um, to Oak Niles out there. Couldn't see. Um, he didn't pick that one up, and it went away to his right for four. So, 45 now to Langer. It's 160 for three. And we're in the 36th over. We've got a, a slip, a third man, a backward, third deep gully, backward point, cover on the boundary, short extra cover, mid off, uh, mid on, deep square leg, and that's it. So 7 2 field. And here's Jones coming in now to Langer. He's up to the wicket, he bows, and uh, he, Langer goes back, forces into the covers, and it's Bell there at short extra cover who fields on the bounce. 163. It's a nice afternoon now, a lot of blue sky. There was, um, before lunch, there was quite a bit of heavy cloud building up, and I'm glad to say that's disappeared. And that helicopter with a rather Australian sign on it is approaching from a, a northwesterly direction. I suppose it's got to come from somewhere. Um, but there we are. And uh, the crowd enjoying a day of tense, interesting, exciting cricket. All is just about even. 163 Australia in reply to Wingers 407. And Jones is in now, bowls to Langer. And Langer uh, plays that from the crease. It goes out about, what, 10 yards on the leg side. Jones goes after it, <laughs> and they run a single. He was uh, not playing it there. He was pushing out on the offside. It perhaps came back a fraction into him, took the inside edge and the pad, uh, went out towards square leg. So 46 to Langer, 161 for three. England at the moment badly needing another wicket. Uh, it was 118 for three at lunch, and these two, Clark and Langer, building up a bit of a partnership. 43 they've put on so far. And now Jones to the right-handed Clark. We've got a slip third man, deep gully, backward point, short extra cover, and a mid-off. That's the offside. Here he is. He's up to the wicket now. He bowls. Clark comes forward to a ball outside the off stump. Plays no stroke. It was wide enough for him to leave alone, and through it went to Jones, the keeper. 7-2 field again. So the, the right-hander as well as the left-hander, the two men out there. We've got uh, Peterson out there at deep square leg, and Hoggard here at mid-on. They're the only two on the leg side and uh, Mike Selby departs and a little bit reluctantly Henry Lawson takes his place he's having sat down he got up again I thought he, he took one look at me couldn't stand it and was off going to be off but not at all not at all he's come back again thank goodness for that Jones is in bows and that's a, a, a flowing drive there um, from Clark but then it was um, fielded at cover 
went very quickly across the ground and there was not a chance therefore of any run no, no Henry I, I, I had to jump up quickly I was dissipating one of the, the absolute etiquettes of the commentary box turning your phone off and oh, yeah, my having goodness. not rung for some time it, as soon as I sat down, it rang, of course. Well, I'm greatly in your debt. For a few minutes ago, it was um, Henry Lawson stopped me from sitting on a rather nasty <laughs> upturned fork. Oh, I didn't want bloodshed in the commentary No, box. no, nothing like that. Here comes Jones now. He's in. He bowls. And Clark is forward driving. And that a, a brilliant, good diving stop there by, or half stop by Bell. He probably saved three runs. Uh, but the ball went about 15 yards past him at short extra cover. And by the time Vaughan had tied it up, they had run a single. 162 for three. 23 to Clark, uh, 46 to Langer at the end of the over, and um, well, Australia fighting back and fighting back well. As a lot of people come to expect, we in Australia are number one because they can get themselves out of problems and a problem somewhat of their own making, particularly with the Martin run out right on the lunch break. Then now that was a piece of suicide or cricket, but. Uh, yeah, Michael Clark has got easily into stride. He seems to be batting with a fair bit of confidence. Played a missed one very early, almost edged it, but he seems to be carrying on where he left off at Lords. Yes, he made rather a better start than he did at Lords, didn't he? he was, I thought, a little bit uncertain to begin with. Here's Giles in the city end, over the wicket, bowls to Clark. Clark comes forward, driving into the ground, and it's a spectator catch. That was a bum ball. Uh, Peterson took the catch with short extra cover. But it wasn't a catch, <laughs> uh, to the dis dismay of a large part of the crowd. We've got a slip, a silly point, and a short extra cover. They're the three aggressive attacking fielders. Giles tosses himself a catch from one hand to the other. In he comes now. He's up to the wicket. He bows and clucks forward, working this way behind square. And it's Flintoff coming in off the uh, uh, deep backward square leg boundary who fields returns to Jones a low raking throw over the stumps and everyone general shuffle houses they change round for the left-handed Justin Langer 163 for three and that single has taken Michael Clark to 24 the men out Hayden caught Strasbourg Hoggard naught uh, Ponting caught Vaughanbo Giles 61 and Martin run out on the point of lunch as Henry was saying for 20 and here is Giles once more. In, up to the wicket, bows to Langer. Langer reaches for rather a wide one, drives it, and drives it well. It's a chase for Flintoff, um, who's going sprinting across towards the... It's actually, it's rather less than a sprint. It's, it's, it's somewhere between a waddle and a sprint. I don't quite know what that would be. Uh, but he... That would be that, a sproddle. A thought. sproddle, do you think? Good, good idea. Uh, it was never going to be uh, more or less than two runs, so there was no great urgency for him anyway. So Langer goes to 48, too short of his 50. It's 165 for three. The sun shines brightly, brightly down. And Giles comes in, bowling in his sunglasses. He bowls now to Langer. Langer drives. And uh, there's a, a sliding stop there by uh, Harmison at mid-off. Giles couldn't quite drop a hand on it. And Harmison had to go f um, straight towards the bowler stumps, threw himself at the ball and stopped it well. Giles in again, up to the wicket now, he's there, he bowls, and Langer's forward running this out a yard or two on the offside, and they scamper for a very well-judged single. This has been a feature of Australia's cricket today, although, of course, uh, it's cost them a wicket before lunch, and it could easily have cost them ponting before he had scored. So, although there's virtue in taking quick singles, there's not much virtue in taking uh, badly judged quick singles. 166 for three. Langer is now 49, but he's not in strike. Uh, Clark is going to face the next ball from Giles. And, and that's sort of bad judgment. We have seen a couple of examples today. It does come because England are a much better feeling side. And, and, and in that 30 metre close fielding circle, they're, they're fairly sharp. And Giles bowls again, and uh, Clark Clark's down the wicket and plays defensively. Giles himself fields. Oh. And I would like to, before I come to you at the end of the over, 166 of three, it gives me the greatest possible pleasure to welcome one of our oldest of friends, um, a former participant for many years at Test Match Special, Fred Truman, to the box. Fred, it's very good to see you. Welcome to TMS again. It's the first time you've been back. No, I'll be no, you back one. Oh, he's been back one or two times. I'm talking to him off mic, which is a bit unfair. So we'll wire him for sound. Then we can hear him. I've already, already had his company once today. Right? And he, I did see him. We had a glass of something in his hand. It wasn't binoculars. No, it's a glass of water because I'm driving my car. Quite right, Fred. When you came in the box. I'm glad to see that, you're, that you've maintained your uh, steel-like discipline in these things. No drink when you're driving. No. Dangerous, isn't it?
But you're keeping well? I'm fine, thank you, Henry. Yes, couldn't be better. Good. And um, what about this now? England need... need, need it's, a, it's an interesting contest, isn't it? Well, yes, it's a very interesting contest, but uh, I, th I thought this morning that they bowled a bit short. I thought there was a bit there this morning, you know, just mm. to get it up there, move it around a little bit, and especially the start we got uh, when Matthew had Aiden out first ball he bowled. Well, of course, that was, couldn't it, it was the per perfect start, wasn't oh, it? Oh, wonderful, yes. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, Lan needs one for his 50. He's taking a little bit of time uh, doing some gardening. And now it's Hoggard who's come on at the pavilion end. He's coming in now to bowl to Langer. He's up to the wicket now. Now he bowls. Langer comes forward and drives. And uh, he's going to get his 50. It's a mis misfielding there by England's captain who dived to his right. Uh, couldn't stop the ball. It, he took the pace off it. And Langer has gone through for two runs. So he's gone to 51. An invaluable knock that for Australia. Very much out of character with the majority of the innings that have been played in this match but he's held the innings together 168 for 3 the score Bill 94 balls 171 minutes just 4 fours that's been an important innings for Australia hasn't it Henry that's almost normal cricket <laughs> isn't it that, that's how Batson used to make a half century about that sort of time and balls and Hoggard it is up to the wicket now bowls and forward there comes Langer and squirts that down off the face of an angle bat down there to Harmison, third man, and they come through for a single, so 52 uh, now to Langer, 169 for three. Fred, were you here yesterday? No, I wasn't yesterday. I was uh, busy yesterday. I was signing some uh, the new prints of the Yorkshire's four tops, Brian Close railing with myself and Geoffrey Boyd. Oh, how lovely. Where were you doing that? Uh, uh, Ilkley Golf Club, actually. Oh, right. Uh, I signed 600 yesterday. So, oh, did what, you what on the 15th grade? So you've got right as, right as cramp today. Uh, the, the, the two... The index finger, the next one hurt a bit, yes. <laughs> Hoggard it is now, in. He bows to Clark. Clark drives expansively, four runs. That was a lovely stroke. It was a full half volley. He leant into it, and Michael Vaughan had no chance at mid-off of cutting that off. Another lovely four, and goodness me, this Clark is looking a good player. He's 28, and it's 173 uh, for three. But the pace of yesterday's cricket was quite astonishing, Fred. It, well, yes, it was. I, I came in just before Andrew Flintoff got out. So I watched that, and young Peterson, beautiful strike of the ball, isn't he? What do you, tell us, what do you think of him? Um, well, I'll give it a... Yeah. Let's, you know, let, let, let's not rush headlong into it, but he looks very, very promising. But how, how would you bowl to him? It, it seems to be a debate now amongst the Australians. How do we bowl to Kevin Peterson? You keep him quiet. Well, I know where I would bowl to him, yes, but uh, that's a bit different. Well, here comes Hoggard now, in to bowl to Colin, uh, to Clark. He bowls outside the off stump, and um, Clark comes forward, plays no stroke, and through it goes there to Jones. 173 for three. Will you let us into the secret, Fred? Where? Well, the thing is, what, you, what I noticed a lot today, the, the two most successful fast bowlers in the last decade or more are Glenn McGrath, who I thought bowled beautifully at Lords. Oh, fantastic. He? Uh, he, gave, he gave the England bowlers a, a free bowling lesson on the wicket that helps you. I thought he was brilliant. Uh, Glenn McGrath and Sean Pollock and they, when you watch them uh Brave off now, Hoggard's on his way in he's up to the wiki now, bowls out of Clark Clark comes forwards, hits on the front pad I think there may have been a bit of inside edge as well Hoggard goes down the wicket and picks up and nothing is done What you notice Henry about uh, Sean Pollock and Glenn McGrath is that they run up to bowl and then they go in to the side of the stumps and if you notice they bowl wicket to wicket you know, they're not bowling from wide of the crease or halfway across the crease. And they're the two most successful fast bowlers, I think, in the last decade. Uh, and they do bowl wicket to wicket. And it's much easier to bowl straight from close to the stumps than it is from wide of them. Well, absolutely. I mean, yes, that is a self-evident truth, but an awful lot of modern bowlers don't seem to appreciate it. Hoggard is in now, he bowls, and, oh, that Clark played that one, so he kept just a fraction low. He came forward and just bent at the knees slightly, pushing it down to mid-off to Vaughan, and then Clark waves vigorously towards the dressing room. He obviously wants something, new batting gloves or whatever. And it's the end of the over, it's 173 for three, 52 uh, to Langer, and uh, 28 to Clark. Well, it's interesting what, what Fred says. 
I mean, they're the simple things of the game. Aren't That's they? right. Really wicket to wicket, and and we keep talking about McGrath's success in particular, you know, 500 wickets, and how simple it is. That's right. You know, he's not a fast bowler. He, he's no, incredibly he's... accurate. He hits the seam. He just does the fundamentals so well. And he's tall, is Glenn, and he that, gets well, a little helps, bit yeah. of bounce. Yeah, he's a very, very fine bowler. Don't let anybody mistake that. Well, he's in my book, of course. And uh, then, of course, you've got Shane Warne. And let's face it, that 85% of the batsmen around the world don't know which way he's going. Yeah. That's why he's so successful. And I'm not taking away that he's a top-class, world-class bowler. Of course he is. Yes, I mean, Peterson's been the only only batsman to play him with any confidence. Well, because he's a bit strong on the onside, is, uh, is uh, Kevin. Uh, and the other thing, you see, there's nobody can bowl at uh, Kevin Peterson round about his middle and leg and swing it away from him. Because they don't get close enough to the stops. Giles yeah, starts to over, bowls to Langer, Langer sweeps, that's going down to Jones, a deep backward square leg, and they run a single. 53 uh, to Langer, 174 for three. Sorry to interrupt you, gentlemen. No, it's quite all right, but the thing is that Kevin, uh, God bless him, he, he, he strikes the ball beautifully, but uh, he does tend to play across the line a lot, and I think if you could uh, pitch the ball and move it away towards the slips, you, you've got a bit of a chance with him. Mm. That's where I'd be looking at him, but uh, he's doing very well, uh, God bless him, as far as I'm concerned. Well, he's made a great start to his, his test career. Giles in now, bowls to Clark. Clark drives uh, down there to mid-off, and uh, there is no run. Hoggard, the fielder, 174 for three. Giles, and this, something's happened. Clark's walking a long way away from the wicket. This crash on it off. I don't think it's serious. And um, after this ball, I want to ask Fred what he feels about Michael Vaughan and his um, lack of form at the moment. Uh, Giles is in, over the wicket, bowls, forward comes uh, Clark, and Bell goes across the pitch from silly point to field. Well, I think that you learn to bat Henry out in the middle, not in the nets. You know, you get you can iron faults out in the nets to do that, but to get the proper concentration is to build innings, is to be out in the middle and play properly. Well, that's absolutely right, isn't it? Basics again. Giles bowls, Clark is forward on the bounce there, straight into Bell's hands at silly point, and there is no run. You know, when I was in the nets training in uh, in April, when we, I mean, you Len Houghton, Frank Lowes, and Norman Yardley's Brian Closes, Willie Watts, and all these world-class players. Giles again up to the wicket, bowls now to Clark, can't take space down the wicket, uh, drives, doesn't time it at all, Peterson fields at short extra cover. And we would play against uh, North Yorkshire South and Durham League on a Saturday afternoon, and that included the great Leonard. Uh, we'd play against Leeds University, Sheffield University. And Giles once more over the wicket, bowls to Clark, who goes back and, and cuts, and that was in the air. He slashed it very hard. It went past Truscothic's right ear. Truscothic, it went very quickly, in, and if I mean, it would have hit Truscothic rather than he getting a hand to it. Um, anyway, four more runs, so Clark goes to 32. It's 178 for three, and uh, drinks are coming on. The drink intervals are always made memorable in this match by umpire Billy Bowden from New Zealand, who always goes running off into the pavilion. He, um, he's not that old, is he? <laughs> well, no, no, that's a very good point, Fred. <laughs> so we're going back to... Uh, you can't spend enough time in the middle. You know? And I'm also appalled when I see that the batsman being hit in the nets. You know, when you bowl in the nets, your, your, your job as a bowler, and I'm sure Jeff did the same, was to find your line get that right and everything but pitch the ball up a little bit let the batsmen drive you because they get their timing as well because you're playing as a team so you all want to be together uh, if i had a bowler bouncer in the nets at any of our players i would have got a, a right telling off yeah i think that's that's certainly my experience too of, yeah. of practicing at state level or at australian level yeah you pitch it up and give the let the batsman feel it you know and practice gets good length bowling so you can get your, your feet moving not not running a bowl bounces at people. Yeah, you get your run up right. You Unless they balance. ask for it specifically. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a bit different. You get your, your run up right, you get your balance right, you know, you get your coordination, and, and at the same time, you're getting the batsmen in because if the batsmen don't put runs on the, on the board, you've got nothing to bowl at. So, you know, you're playing as a team and you're helping each other. Uh, no way that I would have uh, attempted to bowl a bouncer at any of my teammates, either Yorkshire or England, and if I'd have done, I'd tell you, I'd have been in trouble. Oh, well, and Fred, what are you doing? Tell us what you're doing this health these days. Oh, Writing well, a book or two? Uh, no, I did a book uh, which had gone tremendous, as it was. Uh, so well done. And then, uh, at the present moment, I'm 
doing a lot of dinners. Well, you were in very good form when we spoke together at Spalding the other day. Oh, I enjoyed that, yeah. The Rotary Club. That. It was a good evening, wasn't it? Yeah, and then on September the 7th, we were looking forward to seeing you when you do the luncheon. Well, that's going to be great fun. I remember that evening, you got into terrible trouble with those awful red works at Newark, didn't you? Oh, <laughs> Desperate. I, I did soon afterwards. I'd forgotten your, your oh. message about them. And they're still there, I think. I think they are. But, uh, I, I, I think they've got, a, they've got a plaque now, a blue plaque, saying Fred Truman <laughs> waited here. <laughs> I'm going to let Jeff Lawson say one more remark uh, and then I'm and say thank you also, Fred, very much for coming along and seeing thank us. Thank you, Henry. It's great to be with you. And Jonathan Agnew will take over from me. Well, well thank you. Thank you, Blows. It's, it's great to see uh, Fred here. Well, I'm quite honoured to be next to you. Not just as a bowler, a former bowler, but as a broadcaster as well. And it's, it's, it's interesting when you get people's, other people's views who've been sitting out there watching the game about how people are going about their jobs. Mm. And, and really, the fundamentals of the game, how you bowl, where you bowl, haven't really changed, no, they have they? No, 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 they haven't, no. Uh, I think the biggest thing, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest changes I've seen from bowling, Jeff, and you've probably seen it, is uh, one of the biggest changes I've seen is uh, the lack of the ball swinging in the air late. That, 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 and that, I think, has a lot to do with people being more chest on than sideways on. Yeah, and it's interesting. In this, this yesterday, Pronick sent England in, and it was overcast. I mean, you know, this is not my normal weather. I'm used to the Australian weather, but it looked yeah. like it should have been a swinging day yesterday. I, I'm not sure whether it was seen positions, it just was for some reason, when, was no, it, it didn't enough? feel that humid, it was overcast, mm. but it was very interesting weather yesterday, the ball did very little as Ricky Ponting soon found out. As it didn't seem to do a lot when it came back from the boundary regular. <laughs> no, it had a few scuff marks on it by the It would have been a great day's cricket to watch. Now it's uh, Hoggard is bowling and uh, Lang is following the ball and uh, hitting it away on the offside out into the deep where there's plenty of protection and the score moves to 179 for three how are you fred jim maxwell nice to Hello, jim. see Lovely you to again see you. Yeah. after a number of years yes yes you're looking sharp thank you still on your long run uh, <laughs> i wish i was that's a, i can tell you enjoy it while you can because you're a long time retired <laughs> mm. yeah well this is not a bad spot to be on a lovely day at uh, edgbaston a big crowd in enjoying a a tense battle here as England strive for another wicket. Hoggard bowls and Clark drives him down towards mid-off. Three for 179. Now, Fred, I, I reckon even in your day, if some of those good players you bowled against had these bats, they'd be more formidable, surely. I, I think you're right, yeah. I mean, they miss it them for six, don't they? Do you reckon they're almost illegal weapons, though? I, 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 would, I would have thought each time we got a rule in that there'd be a certain weight, mm -hmm. I think, and a certain, uh, and a certain uh, width as well. But this boy, Clark, I think he's going to be a good player. I, I honestly do. He's looking good again today as Hoggard runs towards him and bowls, and he's leaning forward, and he's playing it quietly to the offside. Three for 179, or 179 for three, as some prefer it. 54 to Langer and 32 to Clark. Hayden was out for a primary, caught by Strauss at cover. Ponting made 61 before he top-edged a to sweep to Vaughan off Giles. And Martin, in the last over before lunch, Vaughan ran him out as he was a little slow in moving towards the non-strikers, and maybe he thought Vaughan was going to throw to the strikers' end. And anyway, he flicked it underneath and hit the stumps and Martin was adjudged a run out by a whisker. Hoggard goes into Clark. Clark comes down and pushes the ball away to the offside. I could, could get Fred on his old chestnut here just before he goes. What do you put the decline in fast bowling almost worldwide, not just in England, down to? They don't swing it anymore. Bowling, swing, you mean, swing bowling or <laughs> fast bowling? Oh no, just fast bowling. Period. I mean, it, I couldn't. They, they can't contain anymore. Well, no, they don't. Uh, McGrath can, yeah, but oh yeah, well you're talking about a different class. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, you know, they, uh, myself, they, they don't seem to concentrate on one thing. I might be wrong, but. Hoggard's bowling, he's concentrating here near the off stump and Clark leans forward and pushes it down the pitch. At least you know, with England today there's, there seems to be some sort of plan about what they're doing even if there isn't always the execution in the Yeah, end. but look at some of the field placing. What's he doing bowling? There's one deep square in deep mid wicket. Yeah, he's worth, I mean that, that is a fascinating field placement for a scene but when you're on top in the game, you've got 400 on the board and you've got two on the leg side one of them's on the deep mid wicket fence. That is a bizarre field placement. I, can't, I can't, Jeff, I couldn't agree more with it. It's a 7-2 offside bias in the field. He bowled 
Charles to Clark, who's forward again and playing away to the offside and to short cover to complete the over. There was just a mid on and a deep mid wicket. No one else out there. Anyway, he bowled it near well, the off stump and the over conceded just one run with Langer 54 and Clark 32. And I'll just make the point that's the same field scene they had when Clark played on for 91 at Lords. Yeah, there's a big gap wasn't between mid on and mid wicket. He's yeah. just a push in that corner there and he's won every ball. And first of all, they're assuming Clark hasn't learned his lessons. And the fact that he was a bit unlucky inside edge from well outside off stump, right. that he'll play the same shot. But to go back to that field, you know, you know he's yeah, just but Jeff strange. is actually Giles's field is bad. I mean, slow left down bowler. He's got two mid, deep mid wicket and deep squares. I mean, what, what sort of bowling is this? Look at it down here. A sort of in out field. He bowls and Langer drives and hits it hard to mid off. He hit that well. Harmison stopped it. He's got a slip under the nose on the off and the on side. A deep point, a mid on, a square leg, a deep mid wicket, and a deep backward square. Three men on the boundary. It's like a sweeper, this cover job, isn't it? Well, he's going to get to at least a single somewhere in a moment, you would think, as Giles bowls, and he's down and he's dragging the drive down towards mid-on, and it's fielded out there by Hoggard. So twice, Lang has launched himself at Giles, but hasn't been able to score. And Lang has been rather patient so far. He hasn't been playing the big shots. He's been pushing around. So Played a very sensible innings, yeah. Jeff. Very sensible innings. Giles goes in. Down the pitch, it's pushed off almost back onto the stumps. It comes off a little ins inside edge, but it doesn't trickle that far because he, he stops it as he adjusted his stroke at the last moment. And if you do allow a Langer to get off strike with, with reasonably easy singles about, you get a right-hander on strike. So he's probably left and right. And that's what the Australian batsman should be thinking. That makes Joel's job a little bit tougher. Charles in again at Langer. Langer goes whipping to the onside, and out there it's fielded by Strauss who rips the return back. Plenty of enthusiasm from England here. They're buoyed by a home crowd, or well, mainly home crowd. You can see a few canary colours in the distance. The golden lorikeets, three for 179 with Giles bowling from that city end. And Langer does whip him away. Not for a single, though, because once more Strauss is in the frame just in front of square. So it's... A dot ball bowling, I think they describe this as. <laughs> Trying to keep some pressure on with uh, this curious in out field. Giles, last ball to the over to Langer. Langer miscues, looking to drive. He got an inside edge. A false stroke as the ball rolled away behind square for a single. And Langer moves to 54. And the total to 180. 55. The total 180 and Giles 1 for 31 from 9 overs. Fred Truman, Jeff Lawson and Jim Maxwell with you on TMS. Well, Giles almost did his job that over. Lango came down the wicket, tried to score off the last ball and just a little inside edge. But you got to think of Lango and Clark are now having a conversation in the middle of the pitch. If they think this through, and it's not all that difficult, and just try to pick Giles off instead of hitting fours, that they, they could be consistently successful against him and take very few risks. He's yet to be seen whether I'll do that, but, but as we said about Langer, he's been patient, he's been disciplined, and it's been a, a good solid innings. Now Hoggard starts a uh, new over, he bowls a ball that's full and wide, and it's chopped away to deep cover. The man strategically placed out there. For the low wide full toss. For the toss. low wide full toss, quite obviously. <laughs> obviously. I, never, I, I didn't take that one into consideration. No, I was, it was plan Z. Yeah. But, the, you know, as you quite rightly said, Mom, you've got 400 on the board. You've got to attack somewhere. I mean, Australia's goal at the present moment is 208 to save the follow-on. And then, of course, it becomes a different uh, attitude. But that is their first and foremost... Uh, target. Here's Hoggard bowling and Clark goes forward across his pad. He plays the ball firmly with a little bit of, a bit of inward movement down towards Jones at mid-on. That was a good looking stroke too. And Hoggard knows he can't stray too far towards the middle stump really because he's going to get put away to the boundary down here. Well if he gets on middle and leg, Clark might clip him out there and there might be a one or a two but if he gets middle, a middle and off, he could get hit straight through midweek and that's a four anyway. So the the, the sweepers save him too many out of deep mid wicket. It's Hoggard to bowl and Clark driving and uh, not scoring because it's 
to Vaughan down there at mid-off. So Vaughan seems intent on just trying to stop the game at the moment and wait for the batsman to make a mistake. That's, that uh, is what his tactic looked like at the present moment. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six. The bowler's seven on the offside, isn't he? Seven on the off, yep. So he's bowling seven on the off. Has he got eight on the off? Seven on the off with the mid on and mid deep wicket. mid wicket on the on side. Slip, third man, backward point, deep cover, a cover, short cover, and a mid off. Hoggard bowls to Clark. Clark comes forward and plays quietly, very efficiently, straight back down the pitch to the bowler. So this has been the in terms of run scoring, the quiet session of the match. 63 runs in 70 odd minutes. Oh, they've almost stopped. <laughs> They're back to uh, less than five and over for the day. Shock horror. But uh, England are, are bowling, well, a bit of a dry line at Clark at the moment. Hoggard runs in towards him and he's getting a ball that's right up in the block hole. He chops it into the pitch and Hoggard was a bit late in getting his hands around it and it took him on the body and ricocheted away on the offside. So three for 181. Have you been out in this crowd somewhere, Fred? Where have you been? I'm over in a box by the old scoreboard and over there. I'm guest there for the day and some, with some very nice people. It looks and, good. And I'm sat with an Australian who's they're very quiet at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a nice man. Well, all of these most nice Australians are quiet. Well, that's, we'll, 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 we'll think about that. <laughs> Hoggard's bowling to Clark, and Clark takes it from the pads. Just a single out there to Peterson, who's in that position deep on the onside. So Clark keeps the strike. He's 33. And it's 3 4 182. So, Fred, do you still get tied up with a bit of coaching at Yorkshire? No, or no. Or no I, just... I don't go anywhere near, no. Don't go anywhere near? No. I've only been one day this year, and that was to celebrate, well, not to celebrate, to commemorate uh, one of England's greatest slow left arm bowlers, Hedley Verity, who would have been 100 years old on May the 5th, and they. They've opened a plaque in the, uh, I think it's the west stand at, uh, in the east stand, I think, at, uh, at Headingley, which is all very nice there now. Um, so it was just to commemorate uh, one of the auction England's greatest yeah. ever slow left arm bowlers. Anyway, it's been lovely talking to both of you. Thanks, lovely, Fred, for coming up. To you, Jim. Nice to see you. Yeah, lovely okay. to see you, Jim. Yeah, lovely okay. to see you, Jim. Thank you. And Bill, of course. That's Freddie Truman, who's come in here to see us. And because uh, a favourite voice on TMS is Clark plays a handsome drive wide of mid on out to the boundary for four, using his feet to Giles. And he moves along to 37 and the score to 186. Beautiful stroke. Oh, that was a lovely shot. Once again, against the spin, but it's fairly full. We saw Clark play a number of those at Lords in his innings of 91. That he doesn't seem to have too many uh, inhibitions when Giles pitches in or around foot marks. He still goes against the spin, and that was beautifully timed. Giles over the wheel again to Clark. Clark comes forward and then just changes his stroke and dabs the ball back down the pitch. Don't know whether he got much to work at there outside the leg stump at this stage of the game? Is there is a, enough rough to get any purchase from? Well, you get more purchase out of there than you will off the wicket anyway. So, I mean, there's a little. I said this morning, I was surprised how deep the foot marks were. He bowls now and Clark drives him hard towards mid-off and he goes with the shot to Hoggard for a single. And he moves to 38. I mean, having said that, I was surprised at how deep they were for day one. And as the game wears on, we'll, we'll get some, some solid footmarks there. But for day one, they were just a, a little deeper than I thought, and very dry underneath as well. And I was uh, chatting with Gladstone Small at the lunch break, and uh, he thinks that this wicket on day four, and particularly day five, might be reasonably difficult to bat on. Bit up and down the bounce, and certainly some spin. Charles at uh, Langer, Langer forward and then nurses the ball away on the offside, just pushing it out behind point, moving to 57. But you can see Langer's concerned about those men around the bat. He's trying to get down and push Giles away, maybe break the field up a bit. And he was almost undone in the last over when he got an inside edge that went to pad and passed to the leg stump. So three for 188, this partnership now worth 70 came together after Martin had been run out in the last over 
before lunch. Charles at Clark. Clark's down and he's driving again. A beautiful looking stroke, but he finds the fieldsman. Can't get past Strauss down there at mid on. We've got a slip, silly point, cover, a short cover and a mid off. Short fine leg on the sweep and a deep mid wicket with a deep backward square. And Peterson's been moved from the short cover to a short mid off in the hope that he mightn't get to the pitch of it and spear it up towards that spot as he comes forward and plays with his wrists flicking the ball from the pads down to backward square for one, Flintoff is there to field and Clark is 39 with Langer on 57 so very efficient composed batting here, Giles 10 overs no maidens, one for 38 not too many dangers being created and that's as a captain that's what you want we, we talk about the field placements and, and England 400 in for, well 400 so 189 so still 220 odd in front and, and yet England playing a fairly defensive game now you can play that sort of game if you think the batsman will run out of patience and play the shot that's not on I'm, I'm sure that's their theory against Clark it worked at Lords when they did have that 7-2 field and Clark played on when he was in the 90s at Lager today, it, it, it's been a study in concentration. He, he's got the head down. He's just trying to think of one shot that was really out of character and reckless. I just can't think of a shot. It, it's been very careful batting. And uh, Australia have built their total around him. But he, he's not taking any risks at all, Langer, really. Clark's the dasher, and... Uh, and he's looked pretty safe as well. Now, they've still got the same field with Hoggard bowling. Well, maybe Hoggard can get one just in the right spot for him to, to nick or miss as he bowls near the off stump. And Clark's very decisive in his movement as he comes forward. And he's going through a few rehearsals here. He's either playing or leaving. And Langer comes down just for a bit of eye contact and a reassuring word in between deliveries. There must be... A little cool out there. Both of them are wearing sleeveless sweaters with this packed offside field. Sunlight around Edgbaston. Beautiful afternoon, but just a bit cool breeze about the place. Clark's 39 and Hoggard runs in towards him and bowls and he's taking it off his pads. That's a beautifully timed, uh, timed and crisp stroke once more. Peterson's in business out there in an easy single. He's 40, and Lang is back on strike here to Hoggard. So the, the game just floating a little at the moment. Uh, Australia are happy to be to be playing. Uh, they've got themselves set, and the, and the bowling's thereabouts, but doesn't look particularly creative. Jim, I think you summed it up when you, you said Australia are happy, because there's not a lot of pressure being put on them. Defensive, defensive feels... Defensive doesn't mean it's totally spread out. It just means they're not really bowling at the stumps a great deal and, and getting the LBWs and bowls into play. Hoggard to Langer. Langer drives and misses. That was loose outside the off stump. He had a waft at that ball that was pitched up and going away from him. And uh, Langer goes for a prod again, just reinforcing some concentration, which may have just lapsed for a moment. Well, just as we wrapped him up. Yes. <laughs> now, I can't remember a reckless shot because that wasn't a half volley. I mean, that was wide and... Almost a good length. That's a tough ball to drive. So the the dot ball draining exercise. Dry the man up. Hoggard bowls. That's wide, and he ignores it as it goes through here. We've got, we got the same seven field. two. Yeah, they've just swapped the field over for Langer. Seven two offside for him as well. And but easier for Hoggard to bowl to that. He could pitch middle and still bowl this field because the angle will keep taking it across. And it looks like there's just been a reverse swing as well. And the breeze has been strengthening out of the west and the flags are almost horizontal at the moment. Uh, but uh, So that'll be helping push the ball across the left hand. And it might be a bit of reverse swing as well, which Hoggard does get. Hoggard once more to Langer. And Langer drives and drives through the covers for four. A luscious stroke. That ball was a little bit closer than the one he'd missed earlier on in the over. And he spanked it between mid-off and cover. Away towards that uh, corner of the ground. 
and down at deep extra cover. Three for 194, and Langer is 61. Page 112 of the batting textbook. Look up cover drive, you'll see a picture of that shot. I mean, that was gorgeous, wasn't it? Timed and placed and, and powered as well. Demoralising to bowlers, those sorts of strokes. It's Hoggard once more. He goes into Langer. Langer gets a widish delivery and it keeps moving away after pitching outside the off stump. So another over goes by and Australia almost past that uh, follow-on mark that some may have had in mind. And Australia now three for 194, chasing 407. Here's Jeff Lawson and then Jonathan Agnew is going to come in. Thank you, Jimmy. 194 for three. Just 44 overs gone. We've still got uh, 46 overs left today. There's, there's plenty of cricket to be played here. And, gee, you never know. As Agus settles in, we might have another 400. 46 overs to go at five and over, 230. That's 420. It's mate. possible. It is possible. It's a lovely afternoon, though. Look at it now. It's so different from that grey, dismal, dank start of this morning. The sun's she, shining. She's 6 a.m. on the first tee. It's miserable. Oh, you're playing golf this morning? With, with James Maxwell, my partner. You wondered? Well, yeah, I mean, the. The hosts were very hospitable. Were they? Yeah, the Edgbaston Golf Club lads. Thank you for the game. But <laughs> plenty of long gimmies. Uh, here's Giles and Clark's hit on the pad. That runs away to short point there, silly point, where Bale fields. I hear a bugler somewhere in our midst, over there in the Hollies stand, giving us a, a rendition, a rather drunken rendition of Jerusalem, I think it was, but uh, it was appreciated there by... All the supporters on that side of the ground, bathed in sunshine. In comes Giles, fired through flat. They're pretty for caught behind. He's out. Ashley Giles takes his second wicket. And he's delighted again. He's hugging everybody. Clark is out, swishing his bat in disappointment as he walks away, ripping off his gloves. And Ashley Giles has taken his second wicket of the day. And Australia are 194 for four with Michael Clark, who have been playing so well. Just nibbling outside the off stump, the faintest of edges. He was taken by Geraint Jones, and he's out for 40, 194 for four. And it must be said, good piece of bowling. That was the arm ball. It, it wasn't thrown up. It did Clark for flight. He was playing back early and, and got caught playing back when he should have been forward and tried to react to the length, and he managed to find edge. And that's a, in many ways, a classic left arm orthodox bowler's dismissal. It wasn't his turning one with the outside edge. It was the arm ball which, which did Clark in flight. And he almost did him before the drinks break, where he went to cut one and, and Triscothic ducked at first slip. And it was a similar sort of delivery, this time Clark defending and out for 40. And, and Ashley Giles, they can't afford to celebrate that one because it's a big wicket in the context of the game, but it was also a very much deserved wicket. So Ashley Giles has taken two for 38 in his 11th over here and well he's thrilled he really is he, he put pressure on himself I was going to say he came into the game under pressure I think he did most of that but uh, he's really delighted to take that second wicket 194 for four Jeff Lawson's going away to meet one of his compatriots who has a rather more pressurised job than most of us, Mark Webber. He drives drives cars rather fast, doesn't he? I think Jeff is very keen to see the Australian Formula One driver. 14 required to save the follow-on. Thank you, Bill. Delivered on a very nice bright green note. And Simon Katic is going to face his first ball from Ashley Giles. The field is uh, being set now. There will certainly be two men around the bat. There's going to be three, in fact. And Flintoff is there at short mid-wicket. And Pratt's back on the field again at mid-wicket. 194 for four. He came on a couple of overs ago. Excellent. And in comes Giles. And he bowls to Katic outside the off stump. There's no stroke from the left-hander. And it's taken there by Jones. So, Ashley Giles. He was absolutely thrilled again to take that second wicket. It was a quicker, flatter ball. And uh, it was really arrowed in and... Clark tried to run it away towards the man. Give him credit, he walked as well. We make the point, particularly of Australians, when they do that. Here's Giles, and that's uh, sliced away to backward point by Katic, looking for his first run. It's not to be had, though. Harmison's there, and there's no run. 194 for four. And, uh, well, it's intriguingly placed. It really is now, this game. If England can get another couple of wickets, they might well get the lead that they're after. Here's Katic, and that uh, bounces away into the offside. And Harmison 
is the fielder trotting in there at backward point. And Charles looks a different man. He's got his sunglasses on, he's walking busily back to his mark, he's wrapping his fingers round the ball, giving it a final polish. A final spin of the ball from left hand to right, then back to left again. He comes up and bowls and Kasich comes forward to all on the off stump. He's picked up there at the silly point by Strauss. It's a wicket maiden. And, uh, well, everyone, from King Arthur's knights who are there in the Holly stand to the nuns that are there to the members below us, applaud Ashley Giles. He's uh, a real favourite here at Edgebaston. And he's taken two wickets today, two for 38 from 11 overs, one maiden. And Australia, well, some way behind. England's 407, that's for sure. They're 194 for four. There's another ovation for Ashley as he takes up his position down on the boundary at third man with the uh, scoreboard behind him. Mike Selby's back, probably with his mouth full of uh, the remnants of my chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are unkind. You're so particularly precious about it as well. <laughs> Good to see Fred Truman, wasn't it? Yeah, he's fantastic, fantastic. isn't he? Just, didn't change much, does he, Fred? No. Did he no. know what was going off or not? I, I did, I'm not sure we did establish what was going on off there, out there or not, but it was great <laughs> I to bet hear. He, I bet he wouldn't have known what was going off yesterday. <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, a few rubbing candles, it seemed like. But, well, the wind's got up. In fact, Rudy Kurtzen has lost his hat and a bale's fallen off. A, a sudden gust has blown across Edgebaston. I don't think we're into uh, lignum vitae territory with the heavy bales, but uh, Rudy Kurtzen's got his hat back on. And Flintoff is going to bowl round the wicket to Justin Langer, who's been out there now for nearly three and a half hours. He's made 61, so a very patient, committed innings. This is taking some blues along the way. And now Flintoff is going to come on. It's his second spell since lunch. We only had one over after the, the break. In fact, just he one, had one, ball. one ball. And uh, so it's his first proper spell, if you like, since that uh, spell before lunch. In he goes, he's there, he bowls to Langer, who, oh, very nearly caught it slip. It was steered rather than edged to a wide slip. It's Strauss, who's more at third slip than second. And uh, it was as if Langer was trying to run that to third man rather than finding the edge. It, it slid off the face of the bat and bounced comfortably in front of Strauss, but it wouldn't have been a very clever way to have got out under the circumstances. I think he needs to dig in a little bit. I know he's been digging it all day, but to, to get through to two, because I think his concentration is just going a little bit, just in Langer. In goes Flintoff, and he bowls. Timmy drives, and uh, that's gone over Pratt's head there at backward point, and away to the boundary. I think it was driven hard into the ground. It was a bit hard to tell, but it was, it was a rather flowery stroke, which emphasises what Mike Selvey was saying there. He reached outside the off stump, and, well, Pratt was interested there for a moment. As he leapt up one-handed, it, uh, it was too high for him to, to pull down. And so one run taken, 195 for four, with 62 to Langer. And Katic will be facing his first ball from Flintoff shortly, but not before Michael Vaughan has finished fiddling around with the field here. Two slips and a gully. Giles coming up from the third-man boundary to take that position. There are three men inside a, a sort of a one-day circle, if you like, on the offside there, saving the single. They're walking in, Flintoff's on his way, down the leg side. Jones takes it well, tumbling over and over. And nothing is done. 195 for four. And, uh, well, the crowd know that this really is a key phase in this match now. Can England get another couple of wickets and establish a lead here? That's what they'll be desperately trying to do. Or can Australia, as they've done so often before, not merely dig themselves out of a bit of a hole, but uh, take the game by the scruff of the neck? This is outside the off stump. Katic thinks about playing at it, but then withdraws the bat at the last moment. If this is not an unfamiliar position for them in, uh, in recent test Indeed. matches. 200 to 4, 5, 190 for 6 they've been, and then... Uh, the fellow out there actually and, uh, and and the fellow who's coming in next have been the ones who've, who've actually dug them out um, it's a good move putting Andy Flint off he bowls well to left handers he'll have three left handers on the bounce now Langer Kadish and, uh, and Adam Gilchrist Flint off outside the off stump just shaping to come back at him this time but uh, Katic again lets that go through 195 for four Clark's 40 came from 68 balls 
He hit seven fours, and he and Langer put on 76 together for the fourth wicket. Now, having made that observation in my last stint that I hadn't seen anyone with a bat rubber that was white before, I see that now Kazit has come out with a white one as well. So maybe it's some sort of Australian trend to have these uh, white bat rubbers. Kazic waits. Flintoff rushes in, bells close to the stumps. Kazic comes forward. And that's played away to Peterson there, who bristles rather as he picks the ball up, aims to <coughs> throw the ball at the stumps, which he again decides not to at the last moment. And Flintoff's over comes to an end. 195 for four with 62 to Langer, who's got his helmet off. And uh, wandering down there to chat to Katic, who's yet to score. The men out today, Hayden for naught first ball and I make the point again although Bill still isn't interested this is first I haven't had a chance to check it first I golden don't just duck. accept these things well I, was I have my last, sources I was told last night that uh, Flintoff had uh, equaled the Ashes record by hitting five sixes in innings and he hadn't he was both and hit six at Old Trafford well I know you're a, you're a fastidious old so and so we admire you for it but I think on I can say with some authority because I read it on the television you screen. You asked him, did you? <laughs> no, I saw it on the television screen. That was his first golden duck. Ponting, 61. Martin, 20. And Clark for 40. The men dismissed with Hoggard taking one wicket. Giles a couple. And, of course, there was that run out of Martin on the stroke of lunch by Michael Vaughan. So Giles it is who comes in and bowls down the leg side and Jones has those bails off in a flash, a groan from the crowd, but Langer hasn't gone anywhere. He fell over in the crease, but he didn't leave it. And uh, Geraint Jones repairs the damage. Umpire Kurtzman says thank you, nodding the head there as he wandered in from square leg. But uh, just looking at the replay there, no, Langer's foot remained on the ground that's what it has to do in comes Giles and bowls to him again Langer forward this time and uh, Giles doesn't merely walk down the pitch to pick it up he actually comes trotting down I think that rather sums up Ashley's demeanor now he's a he's a happy chappy 195 for four England made 407 and Giles wheels round, he's there, and he bowls now, flatter one, he's worked away by Langer off his pads, there's Pratt, almost colliding with umpire Kurtzen, that square leg, and there's no run, so we establish, who is it, Hoggard was off the field again, Bill, he was off for a little while beforehand, wasn't he? I can't, uh, I can't see the hogster, 195 for four, Giles over the wicket, Bowls to Langer. Oh, there's a loose shot. And he's going to get runs for it. He very nearly hit the helmet, actually. He nearly got five for that. But if that's buys, it's come a very long way. But more likely off the inside edge or possibly a leg buy. And we get uh, Billy Bowden's very delicate stroke of the inner thigh there towards the scorers to indicate that that did turn. It came out of the rough. Maybe just brush Langer's pad. But uh, it wasn't too far away from coming right back and uh, and bowling him actually I think he's he's bowling exceptionally well now he's he's got actually I think he's using the breeze for nicely too that's I think that's helping him he looks a different man doesn't he yeah. as far as his demeanor is concerned 199 for four in comes Giles and uh, Langer again deceived here driving <laughs> but uh, the ball's gone nowhere so he dribbles up the pitch Giles picks it up and it's been a real battle for Langer he's he's it's been fighting away all day from when he was hit on the head in the first over by Steve Harmison. He was hit in the solar plexus, completely winded. Here's Giles bowling to him again, and he flicks that away for Australia's 200. Jones or Field coming in from deep square leg, and the crowd, in true sporting manner, applaud that milestone for Australia. They're 207 behind. At 200 for four, so you have to say England's still here in the in the better position of the two teams. Can they take advantage of it? Well, I still don't think they quite took advantage of the bat yesterday. They could have done. Um, 
<laughs> conversation with Gucci. Gucci was in, in, in quite bristly mood last night. And I think. He this, yeah, he was a little bit on the on the subject of this. I, so I, I said, well, you know, it was, it was great fun and all the rest of it, but I actually think somebody should have cracked on a bit and uh, they maybe a bit should have been looking for five. Oh, you're a hard taskmaster, he said. I'd be real happy with that. Mm. Oh, did he? But, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'd have thought Gucci might be one of those who said that they might have wasted an opportunity. No, he said, I'd have taken that at the start of play. I said, well, I'd have taken the start of play, but would you have taken it at uh, lunchtime? Yes. 160 for one. Lang is on strike, Flintoff bowls outside the off stump, and uh, there's no stroke. What I find about Gucci in the evening is that he'll, he'll, he'll bristle briefly until he's had a couple of glasses of red wine and then fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those whose head just suddenly goes bang onto the dinner table in front of him, and that's it. He does just carry him off to bed. Yeah, he doesn't bristle much when he's asleep, does he? Is no, it? no. But uh, you, you've got to get him early of an evening. Well, I still think that the England will regret not getting... Uh, you know, m making a better fist after the start they got. There's Flintoff bowling wide outside Langer's off stump. And uh, there's no stroke required, none offered. 200 for four. It's rare to hear the Barmy Army singing here in the, the UK. Very much a, an overseas tour. And uh, we're going to be treated, if that's the right word, to possibly the full rendition of Barmy Army. It, if they do, it lasts a long time. 200 for four. In goes Flintoff. Andy bowls outside the off stump. It's run away by Langer down to third man. They'll take one. Giles is down there in front of the scoreboard. And uh, despite a rather wild return, only one run is taken. 201 for four. It's a not a ditty that requires much rehearsal, is it? Well, many of their songs don't, actually. Um... The, the Michael Vaughan song has got two words in it, uh, Michael Vaughan, and uh, no, there are one or two amusing ones, but in fact I think they've been silenced there by the steward, in fact we now know what the green jacketed stewards are, they're leading away the main man of the Barmy Army who is there trying to lead the chance, in goes Flintoff, outside the off stump, no stroke from uh, Katic. And off he goes. I thought they were on mainly anti-streaking duty, those green ones, but obviously streaking, leading the Barmy Army, anything in that sort of category, and they take them away. That's quite odd, isn't it? Can't be because he's dressed Paul in fancy Coon. dress, because he... <laughs> <laughs> It'll only be because he's not dressed in fancy dress, I think, I think. Yes, I forgot his the, name. The, the, the one reason you don't see the Barmys too much is because they, you, you, you can't buy blocks of seats. No. And they're not the vast concrete stadia here, are they, where, mm, yeah. particularly overseas, they can uh, go in what is hopefully a, a quiet corner at the other end of the ground, and uh, on they go, in goes Flintoff, outside the off stump. I'm not sniffy about the Barmy Army, they've spent a lot of money, many of them, to come and support England overseas, but uh, the, the, the chanting, as I experienced in Johannesburg in particular, on the last tour at the Wanderers, and they were right underneath my position. I think you came to, you, you did come to show some solidarity for a while, didn't you? Which is kind of yourself, but um, it was after half an hour of Barmy Army at full voice. I must admit, it was a little wearing. If you can't buy blocks of seats, how have uh, Merv's millions got up there? Well, it's a, it's a very sound point. You obviously can here. That's why you got the Barmies. Mm. In goes Flintoff, Kasich raises his bat and clips that away into the onside, still looking for his first run, but it's not there. Pratt backs up the throw in the covers. It was Vaughan there, throwing at the stumps. And it was a no ball. Well spotted Bill, 202 for four. Langer 64, Kasich yet to score. And how's Matthew Hoggard, I wonder? We ought to send maybe Shilpa down to go and find out. There's very tight security around here at Edge Bass, and it's not easy to get to the dressing rooms, but if he's been on and off a bit all day... And uh, perhaps there's something wrong with him. 202 for four. Flintoff bowls outside Katic's off stump. And uh, there's no stroke off the last ball of that over. We're 20 minutes away from the tea break. So a key little passage of play coming up. Can England break through? Or can indeed Australia consolidate this position? 202 for four with 64 to Langer, who's been batting all day. Nothing yet to Katic. More from Mike Selvey, and then up to the break, it will be Henry Blofeld. Andy Flintoff is a very good bowler now. It's a left-hander from round the wicket. Um, the master of the art is Glenn McGrath. None finer than him from round the wicket. Just manages to not provide left-handers with a room that they like and can also just fade the ball away from them. Um, bit of reverse swing. 
Giles Bowles and uh, Langer comes forward, plays that down to short extra cover. Michael Vaughan p- uh, picks up and flicks back that. Oh my goodness me, look at that. Um, but Rick Cousins' hat has blown off and he's gone running after it, stamped his foot on it so hard, I think he's probably crushed the hat completely. No, it's all right, it's back on his head. But that was a good bit of fun. And uh, Giles it is again. Now he's walking in, not quite so predatorily as Warren. Bowls now, and Langer goes back, squirts that one away. Behind square on the offside, they go for one. Harmison comes in, picks up one-handed. Something that is, is rather a liability with Harmison. When he picks up one-handed, he doesn't always pick it up. And that was, I think, the worst throw of the century. It was exactly bisected to the uh, wicket. And so Langer has got one. He's 65. And it's 200 and three for four. Ashley Giles has got a couple of wickets. Uh, he first, um, Jones, uh, he got, what am I trying to say? He got Clark out this afternoon for 40, a few minutes ago caught behind. Giles is in, bowls, and that's cut away there um, by Katic, and it's gone down to third man for four, and he is off the mark. It was a little bit short, a little bit wide. Katic uh, dropped his wrists on it, hit it away well, fine of Harmison. And so he's off the mark with uh, a very nice four. It'll make him feel all the better for, for that. Lovely sunny afternoon, just a few sort of cotton woolly clouds, grey cotton wool, it is. As uh, Giles is in now, he bowls and uh, Cadditch this time just shoulders arms, lets the ball hit him on the pad and it ricochets away to Triscothic's left at slip. We've got three men round the bat, well, four men, really, a slip, silly point, forward short leg, and then a short mid-wicket. And that's uh, Peterson. And here comes Giles in his dark glasses, bowls, and forward comes Cantage, just playing it gently there uh, to silly point. And uh, there is no run. 207 for four. Giles turns. In he comes now, walking in his quite quick, brisk manner, and then bowls outside the off stump. No stroke there from Cattage. Through it goes to Jones. It is the end of the over. 207 for four, 65 to Langer, and four to Cattage. And, Mike, I've just had a very interesting question put to me by Peter Windsor, who was one of the, one of the, the big men in Formula One. He said to me, why is it that bowlers and fielders wear dark glasses, but batsmen never do? I'm not sure it's true. They never do. Cause I, I oh, think, Jack Russell did. No. did I think Gordon Greenwich did too for, yeah. a, for a while. But but you're right. You're you're, you're right. And it, it is a, a conundrum, isn't it? I often wonder that if it's uh, if it's so so much better to see the ball. If it's light enhancing and all the rest of it, then surely as a batter you'd want it. If it's not, then why do you do you wear them? Uh, uh, if it's an encumbrance, then why do you, why do you wear them? But uh, and it's not been explained to me satisfactorily. Well, it's flint off now, round the wicket to Langer. He's up to the wicket, now he bowls. Langer just plays it from the crease, pushing out square on the offside. Peterson comes racing in from cover, picks up, almost shies at the stumps at the bowler's ends, but desists in the end. And, of course, then there are the dark glasses, which are worn for ornamental, or dare I say it, ad- ad- advertising One wants to keep your hat on, yeah. On the top of their yes, hats. Yes. I mean, the, the, the fact that Jack actually wore them is, is no great recommendation, because it was almost certainly just army so <laughs> yes <laughs> and it's uh, flint off once more this rather mincing tread of his at the start of his run in now bowls and uh, that's played by langer steered away just behind square on the offside and they run for a single it was a fine piece of fielding by peterson going back from cover fine from cover and he shied at the stumps, just missed them, and I dare say if he did, it might have been a question for the third umpire. He picked up on the bounce, threw off balance, and had he hit, it would have been a very, very close one indeed. It might almost have been too close to call. Top piece of fielding again, though, wasn't it? Oh, wasn't it? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I think he might, well, nip and tuck, that would have been inches, millimetres. I know. Bassman went sliding through old um, Katic. Uh, <laughs> Hypothetical, anyway. <laughs> it is indeed, rather like 
well, not like Ponting this morning, so he would have been out by a yard. Uh, it's Flint off again into Cattage. Cattage is forward, playing this out into the covers, and uh, Bell fields quickly and returns to Jones, and there is no run. We've now not only got Pete, um, uh, Peter Windsor from Formula One in the box, we've also got a very distinguished driver, Mark Weber, who drives for Williams, and it's, it's interesting. We don't often have visitations from Formula One in the TMS box, and it's lovely, I think, that all sports do get together, don't you? Absolutely. Because, in fact, talking to them, there's so much in common. You know, top cricketers, top racing drivers, uh, mind games and all that. I think it's tremendously interesting. Flintoff, he now back over the wicket to Cattage Bowles, and he's caught behind! He's caught behind! Flintoff went back over the wicket, and Cattage came forward, got the edge, Jones rolled across in front of Truscothic, took the catch, and Australia have lost their fifth wicket, 208 for five, and my goodness me, with the T interval coming up, England really wanted that. Excellent bowling again, you know, just, just, just saying how good a bowler Andy Flinter was to left-handers from around the wicket because he, like Glenn McGrath, can just shape the ball away. He's bowled around the wicket to him, then he's gone back over the wicket, changed the angle, that's the important thing, changed the angle, slanted the ball across him, Caddish nibbled, and uh, that's a real big wicket for England. That leaves Andy Flintoff still bowling, still fresh. Adam Gilchrist coming in now. Andy Flintoff is the fellow who's who's actually bowled well at uh, at Adam Gilchrist thus far in this uh, this summer, and now is the, this this could actually be the 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 key phase, the key passage of this test match. If England can get Adam Gilchrist out now, they'll say right, we've now we're we're, we're through them. We've we job's not done, but we've we've got rid of the of the of, the, of their the talismanic batsman, the troubleshooter. Well, Gilchrist, of course, how many did he make in this? Uh, he made a big score on this ground uh, 100, four years. 150 odd, wasn't it? Oh, it was 150 yeah, odd. He absolutely yeah. murdered the England bowling. He hit five sixes. Did he? Thank you, Bill. And um, well, he's going down to the uh, striker's end, another left hander. And Australia have plenty of them. Uh, taking guard. And goodness me, he is a danger man. Coming in first in one day cricket, uh, coming in number seven in test cricket. I wonder if there's ever been a better number seven in, in test cricket, in fact. Never. <laughs> Bill wants to say something. Well, he made a, Gilchrist made 152 off 143 balls with five sixes and 24s. Well, there's a statistic. That's that here four years ago. Speaks volumes. He's got, he got his 100. Do you remember with a little nudge over the top of the keeper? He did, didn't he? A little, little yes. uppercut. Anyway, Flintoff is going to attack him. We've got now um, three slips. First, second, and a fourth slip. Gully, third man, backward point, extra cover, uh, mid on, and deep backward square leg. And here's Flintoff in, bows to Gilchrist. Oh, and Gilchrist looked as though he was going to play that, and at the very last moment, he got out of the way. But goodness me, Flintoff realizes the importance of the moment. You can see 91 MPH is it looked a quick one. And uh, goodness me, the excitement's on now. What fun it is to be here. And uh, we're just looking at uh, Jones taking that catch again. Jones misses an, an awful lot. An awful lot comes out of his gloves. But you know, normally when it hits the edge, it somehow sticks, doesn't it? And he had to go quite uh, far across to his left then. Fintoff again in. Bowls to Gilchrist. Gilchrist drives. Oh, that's gone away for four. Well, that is classic Gilchrist. Oh, my goodness me. It was not a full half volley. He hit through the, length, through the line of it. Cracked it away between extra cover and the bowler. Jones had no chance whatever and uh, so Gilchrist off the mark high wide and handsome he's got four Langer has 66 and at the end of that over 212 for five uh, and Flint off nine overs one maiden one for 28 well, Adam Gilchrist is probably the probably the best counter puncher the game's seen, isn't it? He, this this is the situation that he's found himself in quite a few occasions for Australia recently. Their their top order has failed to flourish against New Zealand last uh, last winter in uh, in New Zealand. Three times they were in trouble in the first innings, and he and and, and Cattage bailed them out. Uh, a Lord, similarly, he he didn't manage to do that. Andy Flintoff. Um, uh, managed to get him out there, but but they're finding themselves in this situation, Australia, 
uh, and they're now relying very heavily on Gilchristus. And here is Giles in bowling to Langer. Langer drives, gets an edge, and it's going away towards the third man boundary. I think it's going to go there because there's no one down there that isn't. Triscothic goes back to fetch it from slip. And so 70 to Langer. That was a lucky one. And it's 216 for five now. And England will be doing everything they can. Langer's wicket wouldn't be a bad one either. That'd be handy. Well, I'm either. Settle for either. Settle for either. Yes, I think England would certainly both. do that. Settle for both. How about that? Well, settle for both. I think they'd settle for either before <laughs> tea and both soon afterwards. Not a bit greedy. And uh, Giles bowling in his dark glasses. White dark glasses. White frames. In he bowls. And Langer comes towards it on the pad. He's suddenly begun to uh, play... Giles with just an element of doubt a little bit of anxiety creeping into it and we've got a slip and a short uh, forward short um, a square short leg just in front of square in fact not blocking the square leg umpire's view and here's Giles again in past umpire Bowden bowls Langer's forward running that a yard or two out in the offside to Scottick from slip goes after it and again there is no run 216 for five, then, is the Australian score. This in reply to England's 407, so they haven't got to worry about the follow-on. That's all been saved and done and dusted and all that. And Giles, it is, in again, over the wicket. There, bowls there to uh, Lango, comes forward, and Bell dives to his left at short leg, stops the ball. He wouldn't have been a run that he got away because uh, Flintoff's behind him at square leg, but nonetheless, it was a good quick piece of fielding. And Giles back to the end of his mark, licks his fingers, throws the ball from hand to hand, walks in briskly. Now a gentle trot, an amiable trot, bowls. Uh, Langer stretches forward, taken on the pad, and uh, Beld treads delicately across the, the pitch, picks up and returns to Giles. Really, this is gripping cricket. And this match hasn't uh, died down from the very first ball. It's kept at an enormous level of high tension. And now Michael Vaughan's putting the pressure on uh, Langer. He's realised that Langer's not playing with some of the authority he showed earlier against Giles. He's brought himself into silly points. We've got a slip silly point and a forward short leg. And... Giles is in, up to the wicket now, and he bowls, and Langer comes forward and drives, doesn't time it at all, and Giles goes across, um, galloping across, and uh, it's the end of the over, 216 for five, 70 to Langer, who just began in that over to show signs of fallibility, and four uh, to Gilchrist. I must say, I'm, I'm surprised that Michael Vaughan had taken away that silly point in the first place. He, he had been crowding Langer. And, uh, and putting the pressure on him. And Giles is bowling well enough to have the men round the bat at the moment. He's using the breeze cleverly. He's got the pace right. 14 overs, one made and 248. He's done a fine job, yeah, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, it's Gilchrist in strike. Uh, two uh, first, second and fifth slip and a gully. They go down. Flintoff's in, round the wicket, bowls that. Gilchrist, who almost plays that into his stumps. And it goes away on the leg side about five or six yards. A keeper Jones goes after it and they collect a single. That was quite an anxious single. So five now to Gilchrist. It's 217 for five. And uh, looking around the ground, you see the stewards in their, uh, their green and yellow day-glow jackets and just an occasional one in a, a sort of bright orange day-glow jacket. Do you think that they're, they're the sergeant majors, do you think, <laughs> in, the, in the orange day-glows? And um, the other ones are the ordinary troops in the trenches. I don't know how it goes, whether there's a seniority among, among uh, ground staff among... Well, it ran out of Skills. yellow jackets. Well, there, Bill, that's, you always come up with the, the right answer. I'm sure you're right there. But I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Someone, no doubt, will tell us. And Flintoff now bowling over the wicket to Langer. He's in. He bowls. Langer goes back with a bit of a hop, skip, and a jump. Plays that one round the corner down to Harmison at fine leg. And they jog through for a single. So 71 now to Langer. It's 218 for five. And Gilchrist is back in strike, and this is where the interest lies. Um, the key to this, Henry, is, is Flintoff round the wicket to Gilchrist, denies him, or trying to deny him the room that, that Gilchrist likes to swing his arms through the ball. He just throws the bat at the ball. The ball's coming in at him all the time. It, it just restricts him that little bit. 
Well, um, Flintoff having a long-range word with Simon Jones, who's fielding at mid-off. And uh, Gilchrist looked around the field. And here comes Flintoff. Fally racing in up to the wicket, round the wicket. He's in, he bowls. And Gilchrist nibbles at that. Oh, my goodness me. I thought for a moment there was going to be an appeal. Jones took it up by his left shoulder. And uh, Gilchrist looked rather guilty, which for him is slightly surprising. Flintoff looked exuberant. But in fact, Willow and Leather did not make contact. And so another dot went into the scorebook. But that was a good run. Yeah, but he's cranking it up, uh, Andy Flintoff, isn't he? Yes. He, he really is. He, he's he's Nick. A real competitor, you know. He knows that this is uh, this is key. This is this is this is the big effort from him now could bring huge rewards for England. And it's went off again now, racing in up to the wicket, in to bowl to Gilchrist. He's there. He bowls. Gilchrist comes onto the front foot and drives, uh, but uh, doesn't uh, time that one at all. And um, nothing is done. Two hundred and eighteen for five. Uh, Flintoff fielded that one, walking back quickly like a man who can't wait to get on with the job. He can't wait to get at Gilchrist. Gilchrist stands there, calm and reasonably collected, bat with a pink rubber handle, tapping it against his back toe. There's quite a breeze. Flintoff's shirt is waving in the breeze. He's up to the wicket now. He's there. He bowls and forward comes uh, Gilchrist, drives it down to Jones at mid-off, who misfields but recovers as though he's been struck by a bolt of lightning, picks the ball up, aims as if to throw at the stumps at the bowler's end, desists because there's no earthly point. Uh, Langer is safely anchored. But the, the, the tension is tremendous. You can feel it in the air now. I think everyone on the ground senses that what they're watching could, um, it could, the outcome of the match could depend upon it. And Flintoff it is, starts in again. A straight run, he's up to the wicket, he's there, he bows to Gilchrist, and Gilchrist comes on the front foot, just pushes down to mid-on, and it is Michael Vaughan who fields. And he played that with quite good timing, Gilchrist. Vaughan had to go across quite nippily. It's 218 for five at the end of the over, 71 to Langer, five to Gilchrist, and a rather beautiful lady walks down the, the bottom of the stand on our left, is reading a postcard out to all the troops. That maybe someone's won something. Don't know what that is. No idea. Lottery tickets. I don't know. She's selling something, probably. She's either selling sort of benefit vouchers or I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's good sales pitches going on. But um, Flintoff, a, a splendid over by him, and what a, a good situation this is, is, this is for spectators. Giles starting a new over now to the left-handed Langer. He's in, he bowls, Langer comes forward, and that ball just runs back to Triscothic at slip. Triscothic, whose white fingers of his left hand, as always, his little fingers are wrapped in a sort of white bandage. It always seems to be there, year in, year out. I don't know what the reason is. Mid-off now goes a bit back, a bit deeper. In fact, almost all the way to the boundary. And uh, Flintoff, that is. Giles. No, umpire Bowden's holding out his hand, but everything's all ready now. Langer's attending. Giles is in. Bowls trim. Langer's down the wicket and is going to get a single. He plays this, drives it back just to the onside of the stumps. And uh, it's fielded down there at long on by Hoggard. And they take a single. So Langer goes to 72 and it's 219 for five. And now Gilchrist takes guard and still the same attacking field. In fact, Harmison's coming in from deep um, backward point to backward point saving the one. We've got the slip, the silly point and the forward short leg. Two men on the leg side boundary, a deep backward square and a deep mid wicket. Langer looks round. He won't be nervous. He's a fairly nerveless character. He understands this sort of situation. Giles is in, bowls to him, and he comes forward to drive. Times it quite nicely, but no great power. Straight to Flintoff there at mid-off. Flintoff returns to Jones, and then uh, back the ball goes to Giles. Giles turns, and in he comes. Up to the wicket now, he bowls, and uh, uh, Gilchrist forward, pushing it back down the wicket to Giles. It bounces nicely for the bowler. Triscothic at slipped, Strauss at silly point, Bell at forward short leg. They are the three predators, the three men that Gilchrist will want to get rid of as soon as he possibly can. 
And uh, Giles it is again, just stumbling slightly at the start of his run-in. Up to the wicket now, he bowls, and Gilchrist plays this away, and he hits Bell at short leg, bounces a few yards away from him, and Jones goes uh, quickly after it with his um, gloves on, picks the ball up, and they don't have the chance for a single. That one actually hits Bell rather than Bell, I think, making a, a conscious effort to stop it. And... Uh, Gilchrist now over his bat. Giles is in again, up to the stumps. He's there now, he bowls. Gilchrist is forward, just running this very gently to Harmison at backward point. It's the end of another fascinating over. It's the end of another fascinating session because the players turn to the pavilion. Uh, it's a cup of tea time now. And, um, well, there will be special cheers for Justin Langer. He really has been the glue that's held this Australian innings together. He's 72, Gilchrist is 5, it's 219 for 5 in reply to England's 407. But I don't think it, no, no praise is too high for Langer. No, I mean, in, a, in a funny sort of way, he's, he's actually played the sort of innings that's demanded by the pitch. That may seem odd, given the, uh, um, the pyrotechnics that we've had over the, the past day and a half. But he's, he really is an old-fashioned innings, old-fashioned virtues he's got, his stickability, it is to the crease. He's, he's, he's playing balls on their merits. He's very few mistakes. He's been beaten a couple of times. He had a little, couple of little flirts with uh, outside off stump, a couple of edges, played a Mr. Ashley Judd. But by and large, it's, it's been a, a, a very fine example of old-fashioned batsmanship. Um, now, what he's got at the other end, of course, is the uh, is the extreme, hasn't he? He's got Adam Gilchrist at the other end. And, and what we're going to see after tea is whether Adam Gilchrist is going to try and take the game away from England with with his own um, a very combustible batting. Um, he, he can take the game away from, in, in a session. He can change the game in a session, can't he? Well, uh, of course he can, and it's a thrilling prospect, isn't it? Absolutely it is. And, and particularly, it'll be interesting to see whether he takes Ashley Giles, because Ashley Giles is bowling extremely well. He's right in the groove now. He's uh, He's got those two wickets. That'll boost him immensely. He's bowling very, very nicely. Um, and it'll be, say, down to Adam Gilchrist to see whether or not he decides to try and take Ashley Giles on and to, and to, and to hit him out of the attack effectively. Well, what an interesting session it's been. At lunch, Australia were 118 for three, 289 behind. Uh, two hours later at tea, they are 219 for five, 101 runs coming for the loss of two wickets. I think it's probably just a little bit in England's favour. They lead by a nose, if not half a head at this stage. But so much depends, as Mike was saying, on the wicket or, or the performance of Gilchrist after tea. And, of course, if Langer was to go, well, then it would put Gilchrist under a little more pressure. Hayden was out for naught first ball. Ponting went for 61. Martin for 20. Clark for 40. Uh, Katic for 4. The wicket takers, Hoggard won for 41. Flintoff won for 30. And Giles, Darrow Gilo, 2 for 49. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, hello wherever you may be. Listening in Australia late at night, around Great Britain, on the net, all parts of the world, all those TMS fans in the United States, remote places like Taiwan, Egypt, Stockholm, you name it, Berlin. I'm sure you're wrapped in this, particularly the way the fortunes have moved for England today on top of their belligerent batting performance yesterday. They've now got Australia in a sticky spot, 5 for 219. Langer and Gilchrist are there, and it's Langer who's facing, Flintoff's bowling, and it's short, and he's pulling it away for four, tugging it out to the boundary. It was just banged in and sat up for Langer, who greeted it with a spanking shot to the boundary. And uh, Australia, of course, they've got past the the possibility of follow on but the question remains now how close can they get to this total of 407 that they've never really been in a position today it would seem of uh, the dominance that england had at times yesterday they've been fighting to get partnerships going partnerships of 88 30 76 just 14 as flintoff bowls and langer plays off his hip through square. He's having a one, he's thinking of two, but uh, Geraint Jones is around to pick up and they satisfy themselves with one. 77 to Langer, five to Gilchrist, 
And here's the big moment. Flintoff versus Gilchrist. He almost got him before T with one that zipped past the outside edge. Mike Selby, good afternoon. It's, it's, it's that uh, that shot that Gilchrist plays, isn't it? He just goes after it, back foot waft, and uh, it climbed past the edge, just shaved it, and uh, Adam Gilchrist survived to tee. Next hour will tell us an awful lot about the progress of this this match, won't it? Yes, that's Gilchrist. He can change it quickly, but Tay too can flint off. He's in form. He bowls to him around the wicket, and back goes Gilchrist and forces the ball away down the onside. So many times, and recently too, have Australia been in a position such as this, and Gilchrist has come out and played a rapid innings that's changed the course of the match. Can he do it here against bowling that's very willing? And with a little bit of reverse at times here from Flintoff in this 54th over. He's going up around the wicket and Gilchrist is leaving the ball watchfully. A no ball, in fact, in his eagerness. Flintoff just overstepped as he hurled that down outside the off stump. So Australia losing the wickets today of Matthew Hayden. First ball, caught Strauss, bold Hoggard at short cover. Out for a duck. Ponting caught by Vaughan top edging the sweep to Giles bowling and Vaughan was just behind square there he was out for 61 and then in the last over before lunch Martin was run out by a very good piece of work from Vaughan Flintoff bowls and it's played on the run hard towards mid off a good stroke by Gilchrist and it's stopped out there by Simon Jones going to his right sliding across Yes, uh, Martin just short of his ground on the third umpire evidence to Jeremy Lloyd and he was given out for 20. Then an, another partnership, 76 added until Clark was caught by Jones off the persistent Giles for 40 and Katich taken by Jones from Flintoff for just four. Flintoff. Just talking to Michael Vaughan about the field placing. Peterson comes in a little bit at cover. They've been thinking about these strategies all day in the field. Very purposeful outfit. Flintoff bowls. And back goes Gilchrist and forces straight through Peterson. He's had another little concentration lapse out there. He'd just been moved in. And he's, in his uh, enthusiasm to pick the ball up, he overran it. They took a single. Gilchrist, six, five for 226. He's a, he's a very athletic fellow, Kevin Peterson. He's also pretty tall. There's a long way to go down to get those. Now, Justin Langer playing the sheet anchor role here. There's a slip and about a third slip. Flintoff's back over the wicket at him. He bowls now and he's leaving outside the off stump. But that went a long way after pitching near the line of the off stump. Jones took it across where first slip may have been. So... Flintoff hurling himself into the game here. 11 overs, one maiden, and one for 36. Was it seven off the over? A no ball, yes. Five for 226 with Langer uh, 77, and Gilchrist on six. It's an interesting contrast in uh, uh, against these two left-handers and Andy Flintoff's approach. Over over the wicket to, uh, to Justin Langer, he's, he's reckoning there that uh, Langer's vulnerability seems to be at the moment, if, if he has one in this innings, it's, it's driving outside the off stump at something that's going across him, so he's slanting the ball across him, whereas if you bowl round the wicket at him, he's just picking him off of his hips there, he's collecting his ones and twos, milking him a little bit if you like, so he's not giving him that chance. Gilchrist, he knows that he just doesn't want to give him the ball going across him, because that's the one that frees up his hands and he can he can just hit through the line and there's no, no more ferocious um, strike with the ball in, in world cricket than Adam Gilchrist on a roll so tuck him up from round the wicket is the uh, is the key to that there and perhaps just shape the ball away a little bit with the reverse swing aided by this stiffish cross breeze as well and maybe that breeze is going to help Giles a little bit here he's he's bowled very well today and Gilchrist having pushed a few about just before T may think there's another way to go. What will it be? He goes back and he forces off the back foot and that's just a single because there's a man out there on the uh, the slog sweep, the heave at mid-wicket. It's Peterson. Gilchrist is seven. Five for 227. Because these two first came to notice 
in test cricket in terms of a partnership when they won a game in Hobart against Pakistan with a, a triple century stand. They both made serious centuries against the likes of uh, Waka Yunus and Ozzy Makram. Now, Giles Bowles and Alangas Ford, and he gets a run too, just pushing the ball in front of Hoggard, trotting in to his left from mid on. And so Langer moves to 78. Jason. What do you make of these in out fields that he's been having? Oh, I think he's got to have that, hasn't he? He's got to have the protection on the boundary. <laughs> Although, the way this game's gone so far, you do think that uh, even the men on the boundary, if they catch hold of them, are, are pretty superfluous. But I, I think, you know, Giles needs that protection, and uh, at the same time, he wants people in there to stop him prodding and poking. Giles Bowles, and he's down and he's driving. A good looking stroke, too. It's straight way to the offside, and Vaughan down at mid off. So there's a slip under the nose on the off short leg. There's mid off and a backward point. No cover. Mid on. Deep mid wicket. Man just in front of square and a deep backward square. Giles Bowles. Back goes Gilchrist. Forces to Hoggard at mid on. And he can't score. This is very exciting action today, but for a different reason. The ball's not being plastered everywhere. No sixes have been hit. Quite a few boundaries. But Australia playing from behind and just trying to keep in the game at the moment. As Giles Bowles and Gilchrist is down and he's driving back. He just checked himself up there. Giles is just burying it a bit. He might think he's a chance of getting a court and bowled here. Gilchrist stabbing away at the pitch. Trying to get himself in. Just has a look at where his guard is. Now he taps away at the crease. Giles moves in towards him and he's forward, pushing the ball away past the man close in on the offside. It's Strauss and they take a single out through cover, which gives Kilchrist the strike. He's 8, 78 to Langer, and Australia trying to run down that total of 407, 229 for 5. Yeah, actually, Giles will think he's got a, a point to prove to, uh, in particular, to the Australians, who I, I think he probably thinks have been a bit dis disrespectful to him, actually, and uh, haven't really acknowledged that, you know, whatever you, whatever you say you're going to do to somebody, you can still acknowledge somebody's achievements, and he has been an integral part of uh, a successful England side. Um, and I think he's, he's really going out of his way now to try and, and, and gain that respect. And, and thus far, he's, he's bowled um, really well in this innings. Right, Flintoff starts and stops. Wasn't ready down there. And there's a real buzz around in the crowd. There's a, a few, a um, little bit of moving up there. The stewards are busy up at the top end of the ground as we watch uh, Flintoff bowl. And Gilchrist tries to pull, but uh, it wasn't quite the length. And he dragged it along the ground to Vaughan down there at mid on. Not sure why he's gone over the wicket to him, you know, having just given solid reasons why I think it, it uh, immediately goes over the wicket. I, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. He's been successful from round the wicket at him before. He's bowling to a 7 2 field here as well. Two slips of gully, third man, point, cover, mid off. I can only see two on the onside as Flintoff bowls now, and he's going behind it across the crease and pushing it firmly away out on the offside. Yes, deep backward square and mid on. We've seen this strategy applied a couple of times today and England working very hard on a variety of plans to pin the batsmen down and maintain some pressure, which uh, they've done a, a lot better than Australia were able to yesterday when England got amongst them and carted the ball through the field, over the field, into the crowd. It was breathtaking stuff. Around the wicket now, he bowls. And back goes Gilchrist and forces through the covers. It's running fast across the square towards the boundary. Bell will stop it inside the line. And he goes on the 1-2 with Peterson as they collect a couple. Good teamwork. Gilchrist, 10. 5 for 230. A bit of team fielding. That that's that's the way they do things these days. Do them in do them in pairs. Always say always chase it down in uh, in pairs. Flick the ball back to your to your other mates. Quicker that way than, than turning, picking up, throwing in. Often the relayed throw is another method they use. It's it's quicker to get the ball in. Flintoff moves in and Gilchrist is behind it, right across his stumps, and pushing it down the pitch. So. The crowd should get play right through until 6 o'clock tonight. And we were looking at the uh, weather forecast there long term. They had been uh, 
a hint of rain about for Sunday originally. But uh, the latest forecast shows fine weather right throughout, which uh, at this stage you'd have to say augurs very well for England. They've got the better position in the game. They've got runs on the board and Australia working very hard to try and match them. Gilchrist waits. Here comes Flintoff again. Around the wicket to him and he's back and he's getting a, a, a little miscue onto his body. A no ball, in fact. He was trying to flip it away. Maybe he just got de deceived by the bounce, but he nicked it onto his body. But a no ball. And uh, the score moved to 231. It ended up in the flap of his pad and then fell out onto the ground as he was trying to work it to the onside, which he's pretty adept at doing. Flintoff knows that anywhere near the line of the stumps he'll probably be taken there, but he's trying to get it to go away and he's being occasionally successful. Here he comes, he bowls to Gilchrist. Gilchrist takes it out of his stumps. It was right up in there, the line of middle and leg and he knocked it out on the offside. So strong, quick bowling from Freddie Flintoff here following up his extra set innings of 68. And uh, he's bowled as well as uh, anyone there today. Giles has taken two wickets for 52. Jones none for 42. Hoggard one for 41. And Harmison who hit Langer twice earlier in the day. Once in the helmet and once in the midriff. Has none for 48 from 11. Now there's some movement near the screen. Gilchrist just waiting for a, a, a couple of latecomers after tea to settle back into their positions there there's a chap standing up near the screen from the look of it he's staying still and as long as he does that it won't be a distraction Flintoff bowls now and Gilchrist chases it and drives it out through the covers that's going for four Peterson almost cut it off diving to his left but he didn't and from there it was another billiard ball flying across the field Five for 236, Gilchrist 14, and Langer 78 at the end of the Flintoff over. Well, he's on his, on his way. That was uh, just about in the slot for him there to put away. Um, it's probably, as Henry pointed out, actually, to me, um, blow for rather Lawson, that is to say. Um, he's batting well over. He's batting on off stump, Adam Gilchrist. So he's, he's trying to make Andrew Flintoff bowl the ball a little bit wider. So he then has the option, A, of letting it go and... Or B, if he tries to straighten the ball up there to, uh, to clip him away on the leg side with a 7-2 offside field. So he's given himself scoring opportunities either way. And maybe flint off a chance of getting it onto his, uh, L his pads for the LB as Langer goes forward. He's beaten here and appealed for stumping. He dropped the ball. He shuffled forward. Then I think he adjusted as the ball went past outside the line of the off stump. And in the end, Jones dropped the ball. Did he drop it after he... After it uh, attempted the stumping well, or not, I think I wonder. Langer's foot was there in the end. Just looking at that, he's got his foot back. Yeah, he oh. dropped the ball after, after oh, he'd done after the work, though, so... But his foot it was back, so it didn't matter. By, by the time he'd taken the bales off, Langer had adjusted his back foot. You don't want him to be fumbling now. He's taken two catches today. Yeah. And it's just early on, there's that one rather nervous mm. fumble of uh, Steve Harmison. No catch, but a routine... Charles Bowles, forward Langer, pokes away on the offside. But um, Charles is using the breezes skillfully here. He's just deceiving the batsman with a bit of variation in flight. And for Langer now, the field's moved a little bit. There's a man at deep point, but a cover and a mid off. Over the wicket to Langer, Langer forward. And he's, he's playing the blocker here. He really is the, the glue that makes the whole inning stick together. Hasn't given a chance. He's had a, a couple of near misses off the inside edge. And he's taken quite a few blows early in the innings. Giles bowls to him and he's down and he's driving at this and he missed it. And so too did the keeper. Now I don't know whether that could be construed a stumping chance. He does that little shuffle. And then when he missed, I think his foot was still there. But we get the side on view here. Was it a difficult stumping chance? Hmm. He missed it on the full, and Jones didn't take it. Would have been a sensational piece of work. Giles again. Langer. 
uh, is pushing out a pad and Jones misses it, that's buys. It's going down to the boundary, just missed the helmet too. Four buys. So, and happy times for Jones. That may have skidded through a little on him as Langer thrust out the pad and it went past the pad and yes, it kept very low, went through his legs for four buys. It came out the top marks that one and uh, it kept very low. Um, might argue that uh, I, I don't want to talk about the techniques of wicket keeping whether uh, these feet should have been together stay down stay down Giles bowls now to Langer Langer leans forward again and plays away on the offside but uh, some sort of points victory I think for Giles in that over he deceived Langer on a couple of occasions there were four buys but no runs from the bat 17 overs two maidens two for 52 with Australia up to five for 240. Langer 78 and Gilchrist 14. Hayden out for Nort. Ponting 61. Martin 20. Clark 40. Cattage 4. He's rising to the occasion, Ashley Giles. He's um, masterly stuff at the moment. Given him a vote of confidence, haven't they, by, by putting him as the, uh, as the cover photograph on the match programme too. And he looks like he's, the, the, the picture, he looks like he's really giving it a rip too there. So, a uh, bit of confidence for him from that. Well, he, he could be the match winner here. Australia, in the final innings, have uh, three or four hundred to chase if it comes to that. He might be the one that gets England a victory. But at the moment, the victory England want is over this man, Adam Gilchrist. And all Australian ears are pricked to this. Can Gilchrist get away again? It's Flintoff around the wicket. He thunders in and bowls to him, and he's following the ball and clipping it into the covers, and they take a run just to the right of Peterson. Had he picked up on the run and delivered, the, that uh, could have been tight. But he fumbled it, and Gilchrist moves to 15. So, Gilchrist quickly getting into the rhythm here. How many balls has he faced, Bill, so far? 28. Yeah, that's... It's a bit below his strike rate, but um, it's a condition of the game, I suppose, at, at this stage that demands that he shows some respect and settle in. Now, for Langer, they're sending a deep mid-wicket out as well as a long leg. Flintoff's bowling over the wicket to him, and this ball he takes away behind square, trying to squirt it and hit the pad, I would imagine. What's Rudy reckon? Yep, up goes the leg. Five for 242 here. Sunny afternoon, a bit uh, wind blown out there. Quite a few of the, the players, most of the players, have uh, got sweaters on. Not Gilchrist. He's loosened up and ready to roar if he can just get the right length. He's dispatched a couple through the covers, and Flintoff's trying to get that outside edge. He goes up now, and he's leaving the ball, walking across to the line of it outside the off stump and playing carefully as it went through to the keeper. He knows how important this period of the game is. They've added uh, 34 runs from an awkward position of 5 for 208. England were actually, at one point yesterday, where were they? They lost their fifth wicket at 290. So Australia's still got a, a chance, particularly with this partnership, of getting close. Flintoff bowls. Gilchrist goes back and forces to the onside. Couldn't get it wide of uh, Vaughan, who's the only man in front of the wicket on the onside with this 7-2 uh, offside bias in the field. So Gilchrist being very thoughtful and careful about how he gets himself in here. And Flintoff's just trying to come up with the right ball. Either going away or maybe straightening in for a nick into the stumps or an LB. Around the wicket, he bowls to Gilchrist. Gilchrist drives him down the ground for four. Yep. He pitched up, and Gilchrist clipped it firmly past the bowler, straight down the ground. And he moves to 19 at five for 246. It's a fine stroke from Gilchrist, that, you know. Uh, Andy Flintoff tried to change the angles there. I reckon he went in almost down the line of the stumps there to bowl that. There must have been great danger of running on the pitch. He certainly tried to change the angle and, and actually create the ball that, the, that was actually going away from the batsman from, from, from the hand. Flintoff up. No, he doesn't. Gilchrist is distracted or he wasn't ready. 
Splintoff was uh, about to hit the zone. And um, <laughs> looking on our TV monitor, there is one fellow standing up there, but that's well above the screen. I don't think that's the problem. I just don't think Gilchrist was, was ready. Now Flintoff working on the ball. This breeze is rustling everyone's clothing here. He goes in and bowls to Gilchrist, who leaves a ball that's pitched just outside the line of the off stump. And it completes another over. Five for 246. Gilchrist, 19. 78 to Langer. And after Mike Selby, it will be Jonathan Agnew. It's a pretty brisk, buffeting old breeze now, too. A uh, nice crisp afternoon out there. A lot of blue sky, a few clouds about. Not that easy to bowl when it's uh, when the wind's buffeting. Difficult to get a rhythm, knocks the bowler off his balance. Flintoff, very strong bowler. He's a, he's a very hard bowler, isn't he, Fred? He's not uh, not too much uh, acknowledgement there of, of uh, rhythm and uh, fast twitch muscle. Well, here comes Giles, pushing one through, and uh, Langer turns it into the onside to think about a single. He's still thinking about it, but Gilgris finally sends him back as Hoggard underneath that white sun hat and uh, happily restored, although he's uh, lifting that right leg a little gingerly there, as he feels. And uh, there's no run. 2.46 for five. A gentleman in front of us pulls a coat on. It's a bit chilly if you're out of the sun. And Giles over the wicket, comes in and bowls again. And Langer, a little squared up here this time, gets it away. 4-1, just behind Square in the offside. And uh, just Gothic. Field, 79 then to Langer. He's been ploughing away. He's coming up towards four and a half hours now, his occupation of the crease. I see uh, Jimmy, the leader of the Barmy Army, has been released by uh, the green-vested steward who took him away earlier on, and uh, he's starting to sing again over there. There are two... Um, classes of steward, that's the right way of putting it. There's a, the untrained variety, according to an emailer, and the trained variety, and the, the green vested ones are the trained ones, and the yellow ones are those for volunteers. What are the orange them. ones, then? Uh, I don't know, Bill, are there some orange ones? In comes Giles over the wicket, and uh, Gilchrist will have one here, flicking that away off his pads. Jones, in the sunshine, throws the ball into Jones, and one more run is taken. I thought you'd have done the research. You expect me to know everything about everything. I think they're just ushers, the orange ones. All right. Probably. There are one or two over there, aren't there? 2.48 for five. How's your screen, Bill? We need a, a, a computer boffin to help poor old Bill out. His, his laptop screen has gone virtually completely dark. There's uh, one more to Langer, stretching forward, pushing it away to backward point. So 249 for five. Our stats might be a little slower today, well, might The problem's Bob? still there. <laughs> We're putting it down to this rogue power cut yesterday, aren't we? It happened after yeah. that. Well, the best technical minds here on TMS have had a go at trying to restore it, but uh, to no avail, I'm afraid. The gentleman looks after all the computers on the grounds had a look, too. He, he went away. <laughs> oh, yeah. Time for the credit cards to come out, I think, Bill. 2.49 for five, Giles over the wicket, comes in and bowls on the off stump, Gilchrist forward, plays this back to him, and Giles has had a good day, and taken two wickets, picks up, licks his fingers, rubs the ball, and prepares to come in once again. Round he goes, spinning himself a catch, it's a very familiar routine this, and up he comes once again and bowls, and uh, Gilchrist came down the pitch there, was rather deceived I think by Giles, who pushed it through flat. And Gilchrist prods that away for one run. He keeps the strike, 250 for five. In reply to England's 407, it's nip and tuck, really. I think both sides know that. One more wicket here for England, particularly Gilchrist, you feel, because you know what he's capable of doing. It would make so much of a difference. Harmison's going off. I'd rather the... like to see him coming on, actually, well, yeah, going off. There's been a bit of this throughout the day, isn't there? Yeah, coming and going. It's, uh, it's the way of the world now, isn't it? Mm. Gary Pratt comes on again. <laughs> now, what do you think? The, how about this for an idea? The Hollies stand for their fancy dress day. They should all, all of them, come dressed in day-glow stewards' jackets. Eh? How about that? <laughs> that would be a fine idea. What, uh, any particular so, so, colour? Let's see, work that one out. 
They're well, going to have green ones. Well, they're going to have orange ones. It doesn't matter which, does it? Just write steward on them all. Nothing to stop doing that, is it? No, that would be entertaining. It's, uh, it's fancy dress day tomorrow, isn't it? Although there's a chap coming down now. He's, he's, he's the biggest Elvis I think I've ever seen coming down with an enormous wig. He's a big chap coming down the aisles there of the Hollies stand. He's either, he's either Presley, he could be one of the Jackson Five, actually. Looking at him, he's got a Hawaiian shirt on. Goodness knows what he thinks it looks like. In goes Jones, bowling round the wicket on the leg stump, yeah. and Gilchrist clips that away firmly to mid-on. Vaughan Fields there. That's what Gooch's will look like in a few years, I think. I think he's had a, a Gooch or a Vaughan hairdo, dear. It, it could have done. But, uh, I feel rather sorry for the person sitting behind that. It's like sitting behind a haystack. A black haystack, mind you, but a haystack all the same. 250 for five. Gilchrist on 21 and looking dangerous. Prepares to settle down again. There's a conversation, though, between hmm. Flintoff, who's having a smile here at mid-off, just outside our window, and Simon Jones, who is on his way again, running in on his toes. He's there, he bowls, and Gilchrist clips that away from Midland leg out to the aforementioned Pratt, who's out there fielding at deep mid-wicket. One more to Australia. 2.51 for five. They are fighting away here. That's another wicket. We'll bring in Shane Warne. And, uh, of course, he's a no mug with the bat by any means, but it does at least open an end up as far as England are concerned. The new ball due in 20 overs. So uh, we should see that this evening. There are 31 overs to be bowled, so we're looking at a a six o'clock finish, around about two hours from now, I'd imagine. Peterson loosens his arms up there at extra cover. And in goes Jones. He's there, he bowls, it's short, and hits that Langer up on the pad, I think, as that rolls away behind square on the leg side. Geraint Jones picks it up. Rudy Kurtz and Siegel's leg by. And LB goes into Bill's score sheet to my right. It's the seventh and the 25th extra of this innings, 2.52 for five. The cherry pickers at half-mast, that normally means it's a bit breezy out there. The chap hovering up there on his crane, it's a blue crane, sort of, uh, high enough for most people, I'd imagine. And uh, he's watching now as Jones runs away from us at a firm drive from Gilchrist, which Flintoff doesn't feel cleanly there at mid-off, but he prevents the run all the same. 2.52 for five. More chanting in the Hollies stand. It's become renowned for that over there, hasn't it, <laughs> Mike? It's, it, it's one of the liveliest stands on the circuit. Some taunting of the Australians, that's what that's all about. Here's Jones, that finds a leading thickish edge from Gilchrist again punching into the offside. Belfield at uh, cover point and there's no run. There are half a dozen Australians there who have identified themselves are wearing those other uh, obvious green and gold shirts and they're seriously outnumbered. I suppose this is, this is sort of England's equivalent of Bay 13, isn't it? Yes, this or yeah. the West Standard heading yeah, here. Yeah. Both pretty close. 2.52 for five. Off goes Jones, and he bowls on the leg stump. It's clipped away by Gilchrist. He'll want two here, I think, although Pratt's coming in quickly, but in fact he leaves it for the left-handed Giles, who hurls the ball in. It was a, a pretty good throw, although Vaughan is looking over his shoulder there as if he's saying, how do they get two there? But I think it was always on, probably, because it was perfectly placed to Pratt's left hand and Giles' is right, and therefore it was always going to be a bit of manoeuvre for, for one of them to get round in the position to throw the ball back in. 2.54 for five. With uh, 80 now to Langer, who's been batting all day. He's now just about his 15 seconds away from batting for four and a half hours. While well, Gilchrist is batting busily, he's on 24 not out. The man out today, Hayden for naught, and we've had it confirmed by a correspondent from Ontario, in fact, Bill, I can't remember his name, but uh, thanks for writing, sir, that that was indeed Hayden's first golden duck in Test cricket. He's analysed every duck that Hayden has recorded, so you can now definitely put a little marker in there, please. 
Not much happening in Ontario, is there? Uh, possibly not. Here comes Giles, starting a new over, and that's turned away to short leg by Langer. Bell fields, and there's no run. It's meticulous, Bill. You should always check these things yourself. Never trust anybody. Because so you can't see his screen. I know. <laughs> Slightly I know. thwarted. <laughs> I think I might have the technology to help him there. Do you? Here's mm. Giles over the wicket, and uh, Langer clips that away to square leg. Poor old Bill, he was, he was cut off yesterday by the power cut, so he couldn't broadcast, and he's been nobbled in that he can't uh, give us any statistics today. It's been a very nice, quiet no, couple of days. Your number one suspect. <laughs> oh, I, I don't go nobbling laptops, I promise. 254 for five. Also on rather a music incident after tea, though, I can tell you. Here's Giles, and that's outside the off stump and padded away. Mark Webber, the, um, the Formula One racing driver of some repute. The Australian has spent some of the afternoon here. He's very keen, I think, to see the Australian players. He's been taken away now to see them. And Henry is, is, is quite keen on motorsport, I think. He, he, he follows it to an extent. Here's Giles, and uh, this is punched up to the mid-on. He's quite deep there, so one run taken by Langer, 255 for five. Henry T was hovering around, and I said, have you seen Mark Webber, the Formula One racing driver in the box? Henry said no. I said, he's the Australian there, so... I hadn't realised that actually Mark Webber had left the box. But there was an Australian sitting here. Nice young lad. Name of James Avery. Here's Giles. Pushing out of the way to backward point. Pratt's there and there's no run. 255 for five. Who, as you and I know, is an earnest young chap who's over here on a sort of a swap thing, I think, from Cricket Australia and the ECB. So he, he bangs out the old press release about women's cricket and that sort of thing. You know, Henry sat down and engaged a good conversation of ten minutes or so with him and asked him how he's going to get on in his next, his next Grand Prix. <laughs> Here's, uh, here's Giles, and that comes off a, a thickish inside edge to short mid wicket. There was a, 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 a bit of a pause, apparently. So <laughs> James said, uh, "Well, we mate, we don't have them at the ECB." <laughs> and uh, there we are. So it's a little bit of entertainment. He's a big lad, that right? The, the, the motor racing driver. You see, I mean, he's, he wasn't yeah, quite in the Martin mean, Johnson category. No, but, but did you? you, did you I, I, I once went um, riding, not in, in, in a Formula Ford, I think it was, around, uh, around a racing circuit, and it was very difficult to get into those into those things. You can't be... Yeah. Yeah. Nigel Mantle had trouble, do you remember, in his latter years? He couldn't, couldn't fit into his... Get in. Yeah. 2.55 for five. Jones starts a new over, and that's on the off stump. Langer comes forward, wanting a single, a little bit slow there, setting off, but they do in the end. Vaughan couldn't stop it. And so one run taken, 256 for five. With uh, Langer now to 82. Vaughan rubs the ball hard on his trousers. He's uh, pretty pleased with the way things have gone. He'd love another wicket. Just try and uh, nibble away at the Australians here. One wicket often produces two, as you know, in any sort of cricket, let alone test cricket. And Jones, having set off, aborts that particular delivery. In fact, it was because someone had moved, must have been someone directly in front of us here, because Gilchrist is waving rather angrily in our direction. I don't think it was one of us. But directly in line between the, the point at which uh, Jones will release the ball and Gilchrist will try and see it. So, uh, anyone up here is guilty? I don't think so. Certainly not the brightness from Bill's screen that's causing the problems. Here's Jones, and that's down the leg side. Jones dives. Can't stop it. He gets a glove to it, however. And, uh, well, it's four byes. Rather unfortunate for the wicketkeeper. He went miles down the leg side to try and get that. He took off. It's like a, a goalkeeper trying to save a penalty. But, uh, he got a glove to it, and that was really the best he could hope for that. I think a wicketkeeper always feels rather hard done by under those circumstances. Each buy is taken as a, a rather personal thing against a wicketkeeper. And it's the third set of four, is it, Bill? 260 for five. The 50 partnership has been brought up. And Jones runs away from us and bowls on the off stump. So it's a no ball, which has worked away to mid on. And there's one run off the bat. At least I think it was a no ball. I'm looking again for a... Oh, yes, it was, I think, because he, he cut the uh, return crease there, I think. Although, Rudy Kurtzen's signal... It was very brief. That, that, that might test you, Bill, I think, because he certainly put an arm out. 
television saw it. They've got 262 for five. But uh, the board here didn't, and I'm not surprised. It was a very, very quick signal. That might be disputed later, I think. I wonder if Rudy Kurtz and really meant that. Balls in there. Let's watch Jones. Gone over the wicket. There's an appeal play before wicket, and he's going to be out here. Langer has gone. He switched to over the wicket. The ball swung in a little bit reversed, I think. It was a Yorker length delivery, full and straight. And Langer's resistance of four hours, 36 minutes. A bruise on the head, a thump in the solar plexus. And 82 runs is over. 261 for six has been a very brave effort indeed. He's played very well indeed. That one hit him on the back leg. It would have hit leg stump in the opinion of the umpire. And Justin Langer gets a standing ovation from everyone here at Edgebaston for a, a brave fighting innings. He faced 154 balls to those 82. Seven fours. Shane Warren. Now there's the pantomime boo. Well, I hope it's a pantomime boo for Shane Warne. We do sort of try and excuse this sort of reception. And I, and I, I can't believe that anyone could dislike Shane Warne. If you love cricket, you'll love Shane. But, uh, he always seems to attract this sort of reception. I do think it's uh, sort of the man you love to hate syndrome rather than anything else. But uh, out he comes. With Australia now. And 261 for six, and England do have that breakthrough. Well, there's an end open now. Shane Warne's more than capable batsman, but he's not a front-line batsman. So England will, will see the opening. I wonder how much that'll change the approach of Alan Gilchrist, too. He's scored two hundreds this year, including the fastest of the season, so he's front-runner for the Walter Lawrence Trophy. Really, by George. Ooh. First two hundreds of his crew, his highest score in Test Cricket's 99. And he's got a white bat handle as well. Although Gilchrist has a, an orangey one, so I don't think it's a team thing. But he's playing a few shots down there, is Shane, as he prepares to face his first ball. Now he settles in, the crowd will roar, I'm sure, as Jones starts off. There he goes, he's there, he bowls to Warren. Oh, that's a rather uncertain-looking prodding shot to a ball on the off stump. And uh, it trickles out there to mid-wicket. And there's no run, but Shane is in no real position to play that one. The replay shows, I think that the umpire got that right with Langer. It was, it was, it was leg stumpish. It did the right things as far as the left hand is concerned. It, it swung in. It was full. He had to decide where it pitched, didn't he? That was the key for uh, Rudy Kirsten there. He decided it just pitched on the line of the stumps. It was hitting, and that's good enough. Two sixty-one for six. Warren waits for his second ball, in goes Jones, he bowls to him. Well, that's a rather cavalier stroke. Warren driving on the up, it wasn't a half folly. And that's fielded by Vaughan at mid-off. And he's just going to set his offside back a little bit after that. Giles is retreating to point. Pratt is already standing there at extra cover. This is the seventh ball, so that was certainly no ball. And the third ball the over. So we're going with 262 for six, are we? No, that... Oh, wait a minute. Yes, we should do. Yes. Two, six, seven, yes. So the board is um, on 261. 262's right. OK. Well, here's the last ball of the over. Unless it's a no ball. In goes Jones, and he bowls. Oh, Warren groups there outside the off stump. He's defeated, <laughs> but he's still there. And that was a good over from Jones. It's 262 for six, if you're listening in the scoreboard. Please add one more. 25 to Gilchrist. Warren is yet to score. And more for Mike Selby and then Henry Blofeld. Well, the reward for industry there, Simon Jones. He's, uh, he's a very good test cricketer, than Simon Jones. He's a fellow who keeps coming. He makes things happen. Might be a, an excellent catch on the boundary. A six hit with the bat when he's a tail ender or he gets his wickets in a little roll of wickets. Um, now, who knows what... Uh, that will spur him on to do. It would be certainly in his nature to, to follow that up with a with a couple more wickets. Much now for Australia resting on Adam Gilchrist, who I was just wondering whether he hasn't just slipped the leash a little bit. Adam Gilchrist, 25 not out already. 
Well, it's going to be very interesting, this. It's Giles now in to Gilchrist. He's up to the wicket. He bowls from Gilchrist forward, hit on the front pad, and the ball just bounces out on the onside, and it's uh, Vaughan who comes in from uh, uh, mid, short mid-wicket and, and picks the ball up. We've got the battle of the screens, the uh, official scoreboard chain 261 and the television... N-Power 1, Stone 262. No, they both show the same now. Oh, and here is Giles in bowls, and that's a tremendous heave there um, by Gilchrist. It goes down, he doesn't get hold of it, it goes down to Jones at uh, deep backward square leg, quite gently to him, and it's just the single, so 26 to Gilchrist. That may be an indication that he's now with the bowlers as partner. He's going to open his shoulders, and of course, if he does that, he's going to take more of a risk so England won't be that unhappy. But Giles, in the meantime, is going to bowl to Shane Warne, and all sorts of field placings are going on. And uh, Mike Selby's left us, Henry Lawson has joined us. Uh, that was an important wicket for England. Oh, very important wicket. Henry, very important wicket. This is a crucial partnership, I think, not just in this test matches, but in the whole series. Langer and Gilchrist, if they had to put on 100, 120 or more, England's chances of winning would have decreased significantly. But breaking the partnership, particularly that of Langer, who I thought batted beautifully for that, that 80-odd. Uh, it, it was, a, it was an in, innings out of character with the match, the only innings out of character with the match, wasn't it? And I've told you a few of the punters around the ground, I thought, well, there's a bit of normal test cricket for you, and, and people were appreciating it for, for its value. Well, this is right, isn't it? I mean, in the old days, you think of people like Ken Barrington, Conrad Hunt, and people like that who played that sort of innings. Uh, Giles now, bowling over the wicket to Warren. Warren just uh, half drives this down to towards mid-off. Giles, who's uh, skipping like uh, hopping like the high hills, goes across in front of uh, mid-off and picks up. And we've got three men round the bat. We've got a forward short leg, a silly point, and a slip. And we've also got Michael Vaughan at short fine leg for the top edge sweep. Hip paddle sweep. He has it and Vaughan's down the wicket to this one. Has a tremendous heave at it. Uh, gets a bit of bat on it. But uh, Peterson has to come walking in from uh, extra cover to pick up, and um, so he didn't really get any power into that at all. But this is interesting. Oh, it's bizarre. It, it is what is Shane Ward doing playing this shot like that? Absolutely amazing. And uh, Giles in again, over the wicket from the city end, it's up bowls. And what's best better, Warner's remembered himself this time. He's played that with great, very good behaviour, just pushing it forward to uh, silly point Strauss. But an extraordinary shot, the one before. He's out in all manner of ways. That would have been an incredibly embarrassing dismissal. <laughs> it would indeed, you're absolutely right. And uh, Giles is in now, bowls, and Warne unleashes a drive that's going to bring him four runs. Uh, it was rather a risky drive to a ball of full length outside the off stump. Giles kicks the uh, crease in disgust with himself, furious. How often does one see a good over ruined by a four off the last ball? Warren is off the mark with four. It's 267 for six. And Gilchrist at the other end, on whom m much depends now, has 26. And the last man, who much more orthodox from Warren, still a little extravagant, but he hit that in the middle pass point. I'm not sure if it was quite off the middle, but and the stroke before he advanced down the pitch, and that's that's fair enough. But then trying to cross bat it over towards mid wicket somewhere, that was a shot of a a tail ender who has got no respect for for his partner. And Warren's partner here is Adam Gilchrist, who happens to be quite a good player. Had he been stumped for naught, it would have looked very oh, silly. Oh, stumped, it? bold, I mean, out in any, any manner. I mean, yes. you expect the captain to, to give you a right royal talking to you when you got back in the dressing room, and the rest of your team. Simon Jones now in, over the wicket, bowls to Gilchrist. Gilchrist works out of way off his pads, down to fine leg. Hoggard is there. No, he's not. It's Giles who's there. And unleashes a long throw, a good one too, comes into Jones. And uh, a single there to Gilchrist. He's 27. It's 268 for six. Warren and Gilchrist both come down the wicket and start prodding away. And there are actually a fair number of indentations. Um, the, there were a few after yesterday's plan. I dare say a few more today. And the side of having to bat last in this match, namely Australia, uh, will not be looking forward to having to chase a biggish total. Here is Jones now, coming in from the pavilion end. He's up there, he bowls to Warren, and Warren goes to pull this, and, oh, uh, the ball 
whether he makes contact or hits him on the pad, I honestly wouldn't uh, put money on either. It went out about five yards on the leg side. It was Jones rather than Peterson who got there, but it was neck and neck. And uh, Warren, having initially thought of a run, decided against it, or maybe it was Gilchrist that uh, said no from the other end. And quite rightly, Adam Gilchrist now, casually, almost as if in secret, wanders down the pitch and has a quiet word. Cautions him. To his very senior partner, that man who's played 25 test matches, and said, pull your head in. <laughs> very quietly. Kant Jones it is, in now, bowls to Warren. Uh, Warren comes forward, beaten outside the off stump. And uh, through it goes to Jones. And Warren may now be thinking, well, I'd better go back to <laughs> um, playing, being a bit more robust. But uh, Gilchrist down the wicket again, but Warren doesn't want to talk to him. He's walked away to square leg. And uh, I don't think there was any deliberate intent not to communicate. Now they are communicating at long range. Warren's come back to the wicket, walks down, gives the, a bit of it a prod. And it's good, interesting, tight, entertaining cricket, just as it has been from the very first ball at the start of the match yesterday. And here is Simon Jones. He's up to the wicket now. He bowls to Warren. Warren has a slashing drive outside the off stump, misses. Jones goes down on his knees behind the wicket, takes the ball, and there is no run. Well, it's a, a very much an in-and-out innings, isn't it, this one? Well, I'm not sure if we're the right game. It's a bit more like baseball because Warren's got two strikes against him, a, a couple of balls and, <laughs> and a couple of fouls shots as well and he's one strike away from having to leave that one actually left him left the, uh, the right hander off the seam and uh, to be honest the ball before we played a missed he played an orthodox defensive shot and it did move off the seam and, and jones has just got a bit of reverse swing going at the moment and, and bowling very well jones is coming in again now part time by casting he's there he bowls to warn wants forward beat again that opened him up completely pushing almost a walking forward shot outside the off stump he didn't get a touch it didn't hit the off stump but for all Warren knew, it huh. might have done either. Strike it went three. through to Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but this is very good bowling by Jones, who's just getting the ball to pitch on the seam and move a fraction away from the right-handed Warren, who's been very lucky indeed uh, not to get a nick on any of these. A couple of very good deliveries. And uh, Jones again comes in. A big man leaning forward. He's up to the wicket now. Final leap. He bowls. And Warren comes forward and plays a peerless off drive for four. Well, well, well. <laughs> We've seen everything, haven't we, in this over? He's now got eight, and it's 272 for six. Oh, and as a bowler, I mean, Jones did actually mouth a few expletives to himself. Uh, but that is the kind of over that really annoys you. You've beaten the bat with some great deliveries, and you do ruin it. It was fall. It was a half volley. And Warren's good enough to hit half volleys before. It's the good length deliveries he has trouble with, and, and Jones knows that in the end it becomes a moral victory for Warren, even though he, he bowls some great balls there. And isn't it extraordinary how many times a good over ends with a... Oh, a count, so concentration often. goes and the ball goes oh, for it, it, it is a frequent occurrence. And it just argues, I think, lack of concentration by the bowler, perhaps almost uh, trying too hard, I don't know. Anyway, it's going to be Ashley Giles to continue. Jones, 12 overs, two maidens, one for 53. And uh, Giles, 20 overs, two maidens, two for 62. Is about to start his 21st over, bowling to Adam Gilchrist. And he's up to the wicket now. Over the wicket, he bowls. Gilchrist goes back, just runs it out on the offside. And uh, Warren is thinking of a single from the other end, but I think Gilchrist... Uh, said no very firmly. I dare say Gilchrist has got to take charge of the calling out there with Warren, but it looks to me as though Warren is not uh, the most certain of callers. I wouldn't say quite in the Graham Wood class, which you'll remember well, but or the harsh. Jeffrey Boycott class. But here comes Giles, Bowles, and uh, it's pushed back there by Gilchrist. Giles misfields, but only very slightly, and uh, it's um, Vaughan who tidies up. Graham Wood wasn't the best, was he, between the two? Well, weeks? early on in his innings, a bit, a bit jittery, but here in John Dyer and had a few misunderstandings. <laughs> and uh, it is Giles again into Gilchrist. Gilchrist comes forward and drives and will get a single down there to uh, flint off at a quite deep and wide mid-off. So 28 to Gilchrist, 273 for six. Graham Wood, who of course played not open the hunting for Australia, but also for uh, Western Australia. And... Um, 
Yeah, he's probably listening to us right now on the West Coast. Well, if he is, very good, very good um, wishes to you, I think. It's only 11.15 in the evening in I uh, hope, Perth. I hope you've got something there to, 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 to charge your glass with. Since 11.15 is about the time when glasses really become very rechargeable, don't yeah, they? Yes, so, well, being the head of a brewery organisation, he probably has got something to recharge his glass with. Here comes Giles now, over the wicket, bowls to Warn, and Warns is on the pad, trying to peep Edwin across the line then. He's pushing away to lay, he hit him on the pad, and it was uh, Strauss there from um, um, Silly Point who came forward and picked up. And... Um, and we've now got a silly point coming in as I mean a, a forward short leg coming in as well as a silly point and a slip so three men round the bat and then there's Vaughan at short fine leg and Giles it is up to the wicket now he bowls and Vaughan is going down the he bowled what an extraordinary way to get out Vaughan went down had a great big slow the rule heaving high towards the jelly beggar and was handsomely bowled how quite extraordinary uh, what can you say, you reckon you say about that, Henry? When I get my breath back, I'll say something. Right ho. Until then, we'll tell you that Australia are now 273 for seven, and Warren will go off into the dressing room, and I don't suppose anyone will want to talk to him for a bit, and I doubt he'll want be too pleased to talk to anyone either. Giles has got his third wicket, but really, if ever I've seen a batsman committing suicide in a tight situation when it was imperative that he should stay there with the only recognised batsman, it was this. And yet, from a moment of sheer lunacy, I uh, took control of Warren. Well, we talked about the, the stroke two overs ago when he danced down the wicket and, and cross batted slog and was lucky because the ball hit him on the pad. This time it didn't. It got through and bowled him. And, and that is an embarrassing dismissal. But for someone, I mean, who scored two first-class hundreds this year for Hampshire, can bat a bit. And with Gilchrist at the other end, he just had to make one end steady, didn't he? All of those reasons. Yes. <laughs> exactly all of those reasons. It just play Giles defensively. Let Gilchrist do the scoring. You get a bad ball. Ward's good enough to put a bad ball away. You, you know, as you said, he's a reasonable player. But to, to try and hoik that, to, to come down the wicket and try and hoik it, his footwork actually destroyed the bat swing and he swung over the top of the ball. And that was an embarrassing dismissal. Well, Brett Lee has come in, uh, built for war with all manner of armed guards and goodness knows what. He has a conversation of an animated variety with Gilchrist and uh, Lee wearing a sleeveless sweater. And then he takes guard from umpire Bowden. And um, umpire Bowden uh, gives him guard he gives him guard uh, with, a, with a fair number of gestures. He never does anything totally straightforwardly and simply, umpire Bowden, but he's had quite a good match so far, although I don't think Shane Warne would think so. Um, one or two LBWs, yeah. I think he might have felt that he should have had in England's first innings, England's only innings to date. We've now got four men round the bat, slip, gully, silly point and a forward short leg. And here's Giles in to bowl to Lee. Lee is forward. And that one runs back down the offside to Giles. It is the end of the over. And Australia, 273 for seven in reply to England's 407. And uh, that's at 134 behind. Uh, Lee has not yet scored. 28 to Gilchrist. And Giles, 21 overs, two maidens, three for 63. Uh, we've just had a replay of the war dismissal from, from the, the camera in the stumps. And it looks worse when you look at that replay. It doesn't get any better each time you see it. It's a shot. It was a shot of a pretty poor number 11, to be honest. McGrath, well, McGrath would have been filthy with himself had he played that shot. <laughs> Particularly with his bad ankle. Well, there you are. It's, it's, a, it's a funny game, cricket, isn't it? Oh, it is. I mean, this chap has got taken more test cricket wickets than anyone in the history of the game. And a vastly experienced cricketer suddenly... Um, bats as if there's a screw loose, not that I'm meaning that there is, but I mean he, he went didn't he, he lost all sorts of sense for a moment Jones now starts into Gilchrist, Gilchrist drives, gets one off the inside edge out there to Harmison at deep backward square leg, and so 29 now to Gilchrist, 274 for 7, but this is what makes cricket such an intriguing game isn't it Henry Well it, it's a game that we, we talk about the most important six inches is between your ears you, you've got to be it able to have, have the capacity to, to sum up situations. Yeah, you have some natural physical skills, but when someone's bowling slow at you in particular, that's when you, the mental aspect of the game becomes even more important. 
Yeah, fast bowlers don't give you time to think. Slow bowlers give you time to think, and maybe that's the problem that some people shouldn't have time to think. But you're right, that was certainly a between the ears dismissal, wasn't it? Remember I saw one? Well, particularly given the, the, the previous escape. Well, there we are. We must be too harsh on poor old Warren. He's given us so much fun. Jones now in bowls out. Lee doubles at it. The curtain rail shot. Um, not play. He plays forward now, but he played that from the crease, pushing his bat across at the ball. Luckily for him, he was a bit late. He didn't get a nick. Playing it away from his body, taken by Jones. OK, we'll, we'll get off warning and we'll talk about this field placement. Simon Jones is bowling superbly. He is, isn't he? A little bit of reverse swing. Hitting the seam. Good control. He's beaten the bat numerous times and he's still just got two slips and a gully. Number nine's in. Played a miss at the first one. How about a bit of supporting the slips? Indeed. Here comes Jones. He's up to the wicket. He bowls that to Lee. It's edge. Oh, and he's dropped there, I think, at second slip. Um, Flintoff dived to his right. Got a hand under it. I think it. he's hurt his finger. I think he just got there. Um, Lee don't, knew little about it. He flirted with it outside the off stump. And indeed, uh, what Henry Lawson said is now happening. A third slip, Triscothic has come in. I think it did it just bounce in front yeah, of him. Yeah, look, I don't think it, it, I don't quite, think it quite carried. carried. No, I don't think it did. Actually, it was a good effort from Flintoff because he had to go a long way to his right because there's no third slip there. And I'll, I'm not going to put that down as a chance. I think it's just hit the, hit the ground. Yeah. And here is Jones, fell it prancing in up to the wicket. He's there now, he bowls to Lee, and Lee pushes this away on the onside. The ball was on about leg stump, and it's Peterson now who fields it wide mid on, throws back to Jones. And this match really has everyone's uh, pulses ticking over, hearts ticking over. It's tremendous stuff. Goodness me, the tension, the excitement. There's been some wonderful stroke play. There's been a, a marvellously dogged innings from uh, Langer. Brilliant stroke play from Ponting. And all this, the, 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 you might say, all this, the, the sort of the third course after the main course yesterday when we had England scoring 407 in the day. And here comes Jones again. He's up to the wicket. He bowls to Lee. Lee goes back and crashes that once away square. And it's, I think it must be going for four. That Giles is after it. And indeed, it crosses over the, the rope. And uh, it was short and wide. And Lee flung the kitchen sink at it and hit it away for four. So 278 for seven. A helicopter flies busily over proceedings without having a, a rather colourful Australian tail, if you see what I mean which the earlier helicopters have been carrying around and advertising. It, it probably dropped that so, flag when it saw Shane Warne's dismissal. Well, <laughs> that's a very good point. But uh, that, that ball from Jones, that was, that's his bad when he bowls every over. Yeah, no, that was a long hop. And we got uh, three slips to Gully, backward point, shortish extra cover, mid-off. And now Harmison at uh, m um, mid-off goes across and has a word with Jones. Two men on the leg side, a mid-on and a fine leg. And Jones has finished speaking with Harmison and starts in again in bright sunshine. He up to the wicket now, he bows to Lee, and Lee uh, tries to play this one away on the leg side. Uh, it's hit on the pad, the ball rolls back down the pitch to Jones. The crowd roars, I'm not quite certain why. And at the end of the over, it's 278 for seven. Uh, four to, uh, to Brett Lee and 29 to Adam Gilchrist. And after another word of wisdom from Henry Lawson, it will be Jim Maxwell. Oh, well, Australia is still uh, 130 behind, and that, that 130 could be hard to get the way Simon Jones is bowling. It's been some, some really good stuff from him. Some very good control. It's just been that odd ball. Where it's probably a mental lapse rather than a technical one, although after the long hop, he did a kick at the foot marks, which have been a problem all day to him, where they were fueled in overnight. And, yeah, bowlers always look for that excuse, but often it's a valid one. But Jones is bowling very well, Giles is doing his job, and there's some pressure on the Australians. James. And Giles bowls, and back goes. Gilchrist and forces the ball away through the offside. Sending it out there for a single towards cover. Seven for 279. Uh, Gilchrist is 30, and now they've got a chance. To to have a crack at Lee with Australia today losing Hayden for a first ball duck Ponting 61 Martin run out for 20 Clark made 40 Katich 4 Langer a defiant 82 from 154 balls with seven falls and Warren two swipes for four and another swipe that missed out for eight 
Lee back. Hit on the pads and appeal for LBW. Probably pitched outside leg. Oh, the crowd are going now. They're right behind England here. Well, 80% of them. And that ball uh, just hustled on to Lee, but probably pitched just outside the line of the leg stump. The replay on the screen indicates, hmm, that was close. Well, it was worth a shot. Charles bowls again. Lee comes forward and he clips him away to the onside, out towards deep mid-wicket for a single. Look less leg stumpish on the replay than earlier evidence from behind, where, uh, you know, it's a bit hard to, to tell, but just your initial reaction was, um, uh, where did it pitch? Oh, we're getting the forensic on TV here. Uh, it pitched outside leg. Yeah. Uh, 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 given the fact that Shane Warne was... Uh, not getting Timmy LBW, so we tested Billy Bowden's consistency at the moment. Oh, well, we got it right. Giles bowls now. Gilchrist drives, miscues, and drags it along the ground down towards Long On for a single. And it's 7 for 281. So uh, a, a day that uh, started brilliantly for England with the quick dismissal of Hayden. And it's been a grind for Australia to try and establish some domination over the bowling and they've never really done it a few partnerships but nothing has been sustained Charles bowls and Lee is back and he just keeps the ball out of his stumps he got a thick inside edge past the leg stump almost bowled there it's Gilo's day seven for 282 oh would he like six. to take five he's a good chance we, we, well, he's shortening in the, about in the, he's shortening in the, the man of the match <laughs> That's a good point. He is. I, the way this game is going, Australia having to bat last. Don't you think? Yeah, look, it, it's not turning here at the moment. It's <laughs> he's, he's just bowling on the spot. He bowls to Gilchrist. That stopped well, a little bit in turn. Turned, yeah. That turned, and he played it to short leg, and Bell picked it up. Seven for 282. And Gilo, 22 overs, two maidens, three for 67. And he's doing the job. In many ways, because the Australians are allowing to do it, particularly look at the dismissals, potting a lap sweep, instead of belting it, just trying to help it around the corner. Good ball that got Clark. I thought that was a really good piece of bowling. And uh, the worn dismissal, well, that wasn't a good piece of batting. But he's doing the job. Well, that's the situation of the game. And uh, for those that may want to do a few other things at this time of the day or the night, Drinks are on the field at 7 for 282. Just chatting away with Jeff Lawson here. We still have another 23 overs to come tonight with an hour of schedule play. So we'll certainly be here at 6 o'clock. Whether or not Australia is still batting by then remains to be seen. But uh, Gilchrist hasn't escaped as yet. They've pinned him down. He hasn't been able to get into the, the flow of excitement that uh, we normally see from him when he comes in at number seven. No, and they bowled quite well to him. I'm just saying that I think Simon Jones is bowling a terrific spell at the moment. Getting a bit of reverse swing and, and uh, hitting the seam, a bit of bounce, good control. It's been really good stuff from Jones. We, we saw glimpses of it at Lords, and we, we all thought he was under bowled at Lords, particularly in that second innings. Where he, I think he only rolled eight or nine overs. And perhaps uh, the, the captain should have looked his way a little more often. But it, it's been some really good attacking stuff at the moment, coupled with uh, say the, the batting philosophy of Shane Warne, which was, was bizarre to say the least. And Warne should have had his head down and, and looking to give the strike to Gilchrist and letting Gilchrist do the scoring. And Warren picking off the odd bad ball that might come along because because Warren can bat and he, he's, he can put away a half volley long hop as, as well as any batsman can. But it seemed to be hell bent on trying to hit Giles over the stand. It was it was personal, was it? Because <laughs> Giles was trying to clonk him yesterday and <laughs> fell LBW. I mean, what would have been going through his mind? Well, be, I don't think. To be honest, only Warren is one of these who plays the man. He, he, he bowls the ball. He, when he's bowling, he does a bit because he plays the mind games. But but when he's batting, I, I can't believe he'd, he'd try to somehow bruise Ashley Giles' ego. You, you've got to hit Giles for 15 sixes to do that, not one and then get out. And it was just a, a really poor shot. Made all the worse for the fact that he already tried it once and missed. And was lucky to escape. And here it was, two hours later, playing the same shot. 
Yeah, it's, oh, and I wonder what Ricky Ponting said to him when he went back in the dressing rooms. I mean, what do, does Ponting say to his 500 wicket man, well, nearly 600 wicket man, and veteran of 125 test matches, does he actually admonish him for that kind of shot? I mean, I hope something was said. Maybe it was just the, the filthy looks of his teammates that conveyed the message. But it was not good test cricket at a time when Australia just needed him to, to put together a, a respectable partnership. They're still 120 odd behind. And they don't want that last year and chase 300, I don't think. Uh, yes, I don't know. It, was, it, it, it look, looks terrible when you see replay, as I just did a moment ago, of uh, the Warren dismissal. I'll wait for Jones after drinks because he's coming in now and Lee is edging and he's caught at second slip by Flintoff. First ball after the resumption. Lee's out. Straightforward catch into the safe hands of Freddie Flintoff at second slip. And he's uh, jumped upon there by Simon Jones in celebration. It's eight for 282. And Lee's on his way for six. And well earned, Simon Jones. That's another ball that's pitched and gone away. I mean, Lee's playing a, a fairly authentic forward defence at it. They took, took the outside edge. Good, easy catching height for, for Flintoff on that occasion. You love all the your catches that simply come like that. But uh, you know, Jones really w worked hard and deserved to get that wicket. And it, it was was catching with a good delivery again. It, hitting the seam, going away, a little bit of bounce. Exactly what fast bowlers need to do. Cue Jason Gillespie. Can he stick around again as uh, he's so often done in the past? The Gilchrist's going to run out of partners the way this is going. This is an excellent spell of bowling from uh, Simon Jones. And uh, the combination of Giles and Jones looks like giving England a lead of uh, 100 or so now. Well, it does, but you did mention Gillespie coming in who is one of the best blockers I've ever seen. But, having said that, Jones is, bow but Jones is bowling wicket-taking deliveries. And even if Gillespie just shuffles in behind it as, as he does and plays little French cricket shots, Jones is bowling well enough to get the edge. Mm. Yeah, so just uh, just on Warren, you know, he's been, he has been in good form this season and it was, it was as if he was backing himself and it ended up in a horrendous swipe. He just wanted <laughs> well, to take Giles on. He, he, he was premeditated, wasn't it? It looked that way. And, but if you want to attack Giles, try to hit him back over his head. Don't use your feet, come down the wicket and try to swipe it over mid-wicket. Dizzy doesn't want to come out and bat today. Oh, here he is. He's arrived. It's taken a while, but he's um, making his way out. Fresh from a half century in... The game at Worcester, 49 not out at Leicester, and he hung about for quite some time at Lords. They did drop him, and Jones at the moment getting some bounce and a bit of movement here. It's been a hot and cold day for him. He started with two maidens, then went for 13 and then 10, found a bit of control, and then in this spell he's uh, picked up two wickets. He had Langer to a full pitch swinging delivery, leg before on the crease for 82. And now he's dismissed Lee for six. So Australia obviously had high hopes at the start of the day of getting somewhere if not past England's total on a pitch that still looks full of runs. But uh, England's bowling has been a lot better than Australia's was yesterday. And uh, well, it's just the way things get thrown, I suppose. Uh, Perhaps Australia a little thrown off their game by that injury to McGrath. And uh, England went after them and pursued them all day. They hit ten sixes yesterday. We haven't had one today. In fact, we haven't looked like having one. Now Jones runs in. He bowls to Gillespie. Gillespie pushes forward. He's almost leg before, but he got his bat down at the last moment and sent it away behind square. They're all about to leap in the air to the umpire. But at the death, with that short back lift, he managed to knock it away behind square. Well, well Jones has been bowling outswing with the ball. And Wise had decided to try Gillespie with an in-swinger. And uh, when the ball was three quarters away uh, towards the batsman, Gillespie was playing back and across. And once you see the batsman play back to a full delivery moving in, you get excited. But the bat came down and uh, he just squirted it out, as, as he does so often. 
Now Gilchrist <coughs> on 31. Jones bowls to him and he hits the ball hard behind square and takes the single that's uh, on offer down there. He's not going to knock them back at uh, this point of the innings. Australia need as many as they can scramble. Eight for 284. And uh, the roughened up ball is doing a bit here for Simon Jones. And he gets another opportunity as, at Gillespie as they all crowd into the slip cordon. And this is a great time. When your ball's going reverse swing, if you want to bowl in and out, you have a short leg. So the ball that comes into him might take bat, pad and get caught. So he can tack on both sides of the wicket. Jones runs in and Gillespie comes forward to a Yorker length delivery right up near and maybe just outside the off stump. He watched it keenly and kept it out on the off side. But this is another important little period of the game. England would really want to get Gillespie, or Gilchrist, Morsa, out quickly before any partnership can develop because Australia have had this habit of squeezing some vital runs out of the last couple. Kasparovic, of course, is at 11. 8 for 284. Jones away from the pavilion end. He runs into Gillespie. Gillespie goes forward, watching the ball very keenly once again and pushing it out on the offside. So Hayden made naught. Ponting 61, Martin 20, Clark 40, Katich 4, Langer 82, Warren 8, and Lee 6. And it's been a very good day of test cricket. Really competitive and tense. And Australia fighting for every run against this purposeful attack. Three slips, a couple of gullies. And Jones runs in and bowls, and Gillespie goes forward and plays the ball out on the offside. A little crab-like prod to finish the over. Another good over from Simon Jones. 13 overs, two maidens, two for 60. And his spell since T, five overs, no maidens, two for 20. It's eight for 284. Yeah, well bowled. Well bowled, Jones, and... The skipper's entitled to keep him on and let him pick up another couple if possible. But it, it's amazing that Gillespie comes in and watches the ball closely and mostly hits hit the middle of the bat and the others are, are struggling because they're trying to attack too much. And certainly the Australians sometimes get criticised for over-aggression. It's certainly the case for Warren that day. Giles bowls and back goes Gilchrist and he plays a cheeky stroke, bunting the ball away. Around the corner, he walked way across to the offside and he paddled the ball around the corner, top edgily, for a single. And he moves to 33. And uh, Gillespie will have the strike here to Ashley Giles. It's almost a party piece, wasn't it? I think he tried to help it really fine. That was, that was the object of it, and maybe get two or four, but it was a little fool to be doing that. So he hasn't taken to Giles at all as yet. Did he have, has he had a serious attempt so far to deposit him anywhere? No, and normally he goes over mid-wicket or, or long on, and, and Vaughan's had two men stationed out there, and that might be a, a cause mm. for, for inhibition. So he's had him subdued. Now, here's Gillespie. Two-eyed stance, a la old Jim Parks, as he watches the ball, and he goes on the sneaking push. No backlift, like a man with a shovel instead of a bat. Just knock it out. Slip gully, silly point, and a short leg in there. And Gillespie getting into his front foot motion. Kicks the ball away as it pitched outside the, the line of the leg stump. Now, this is a game he quite enjoys. And he's becoming a, a specialist number 10 in the Australian side and occasional night watchman since they reverted to that policy. Giles goes in towards him and he's pushing forward once more on the bounce to the offside and uh, Strauss lurking in close knocked it down. So Gillespie won, Gilchrist 33 and the old Barmy Army chant is reverberating around the ground as Giles goes in from the city and over the wicket Gillespie goes forward with his stalk-like approach to it all. The bat 
comes out at the last minute from somewhere behind the pad and kills the ball dead down the offside. Well, it, I know the stances Jim Parks like, but I think the trousers are as well. <laughs> and he could play. Quilted it. Charles Bowles forward goes Gillespie to a quicker ball. Quicker ball. He played it on the bounce away to the offside. So eight for 285. I think it's at the Jones end where there could be a bit more action taking place with Giles doing the, the body of work here today. 23 overs, two maidens, three for 68. Flintoff, by comparison, has 13 overs. Jones, 14. Hoggard, just eight. And Harmison, 11. Well, maybe the, the skipper has recognised the error of his ways from the Lords. His bowlers certainly have repaid him with some very good bowling. The field spreads for Gilchrist. Vaughan's sending uh, only... Oh, there's only about a slip in a couple either side of the wicket as he goes outside the off stump and misses. Uh, Gilchrist trying to hit, hit that somewhere away to the offside, but he missed out. He's got to deal with a third man fairly fine, a deep point, a long off, mid on his back. Not all, the way, not all the way out to the line. Deep mid-wicket, deep backward square. And then vice versa, as it were, Vaughan mid-wicket, Peterson at cover. Androscothic, of course, at slip. Jones, with this reverse movement, moves up and bowls, and Gilchrist drives at this, and it goes off an edge, flying down to the boundary for four. Through about second or third slip. As good as hitting it in the middle. He got the result, maybe a little luckily, and he's 37. Yeah, it went at it hard, and that's fair enough. But I mean, Jones is entitled to be a little disappointed with the field setting because he's moving it around. He's not bowling straight here. He's getting movement both ways. He's bowling very well, and even if it is Gilchrist on strike, he's probably entitled to have another slip at least. Yeah, that was going to second slip. Triscothic's actually moved to second slip now. Hmm. Well, they're trying to protect the boundaries. Let's see if they're successful. Jones bowls short. He swings. He misses. Hits him on the body. And the, the, the bounce, the slower bounce may have done him there. So he was trying to uh, hit that somewhere into the crowd. Who haven't had anything to catch all day. Very disappointing. Not one six. What is going on? Ten yesterday. Better directed Zero controlled today. bowling today. Well, in uh, Australia. I think England bowled very, very well indeed. And, and just as some Australian batsmen have started to get going, they've got out in the 40s, 30s. Langer was in defensive mode and it has been the, the core of this innings. And he was unlikely to hit any sixes. Now Jones runs in again and Gilchrist swings into this. He's hit it hard on the bounce to backward square. And it's filled out there by Giles. He got inside it. And hoisted it out to deep backward and it landed a uh, few yards in front of uh, Ashley Giles. One more to Gilchrist, who's 38. Eight for 290. England know there's still something to be done here. They don't want this partnership to develop and they're trying to work out ways of restricting them. And well, one of the best is to get Gillespie down to face Jones. There's so many times in the past that uh, the Australians have made comebacks from possible positions. Jones is bowling, Gillespie's playing defensively. Oh, he's, he's really smelling it there. Right back and across and behind the line. Uh, Gillespie looking in good form, but uh, Jones hasn't tested him with one of those deliveries that shape away. And now Rudy Kurtzen saying to Michael Vaughan, that's a warning, running on the pitch. He's been warned for running on the pitch. First warning. Getting in too tight. You don't, you don't mind your first warning at eight, for <laughs> You get away with it, couple. So there, mark that down on the, the note paper. Here comes Jones to bowl, and Gilchrist comes forward and slides a full pitch delivery, almost full toss away behind point to complete the over. So Jones, 15 overs, two maidens, two for 65. Gilchrist, 38. 
Gillespie's won and for, for different reasons this has been an absorbing day of test cricket and to tell you more, more about it after Henry, it will be Henry. Thank you no, James. It'll be Jonathan Agnew. Well, it has been an absorbing day, and it's a day that England can be, be very happy with at the moment. Just need two wickets. There's still 20 overs left in the day. So plenty of cricket left here. But even though Australia are eight down, England need to keep concentrating. We know how dangerous Gilchrist is, and we know how defensive Gillespie is. Absolutely. There's 117 runs in it at the moment, 290 for eight. Gilchrist on strike on 38. Giles Bolster on the leg stump. He picks that off easily enough. He'll get one. One of the three men out there on the leg side. Strauss throws it back in. So that brings Gillespie down on strike. He's got so much hair he can't tuck it under his helmet now. But he's taking guard meticulously. He must get shocking helmet here after long innings. It wouldn't be a regular event though, would it? Gillespie? He can prod, he can prod around. He's been known to hang about. Hmm. Well, he's got plenty of company around the bat. He's got a forward short leg and then three in the offside. Slip, gully and a silly point. 291 for eight. Gillespie with a very open stance. Waits for Giles who comes in over the wicket and bowls outside the off stump. He lets it go through Gillespie and it's taken there by Jones. So Giles has taken three, four, sixty-nine. He's in his 24th over. Gives the ball a rub again, Gillespie, almost like Peter Willey there with that open stance. Waits for him and now uh, Giles brings him forward there on the off stump. And it's picked up by Strauss at silly point. So two men under helmets, a couple of slips. There's a mid-off, extra cover, mid-on. Deep backward square leg and a short fine leg. Everyone walking in now, Giles is on his way and Gillespie drives up towards extra cover. A confident looking stroke. Jones feels. Jones having just picked up a warning for running on the pitch. And uh, there's no run. 291 for eight. And Vaughan, have you seen that? Shot comes across into the offside. He's going to backward point. So 116 behind. That's the situation with Australia. And uh, there's only Kasprovic to come. I haven't seen Bat very often. What's his, uh, his credentials? Well, I mean, I mean, not the worst. He's actually been number nine for... Queensland, I think he's made it 100 for Worcestershire. Yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry. Andy Bickle. Bickle. Yeah, Bickle, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's oh, going, yeah. Gillespie coming forward and prodding out a, a full-length ball from round the wicket. Giles having a change of plan here. That's played back to the bowler. 291 for eight. Rubber the ball on his trousers from Giles. Spins himself a catch or two. And in he comes, round the wicket, and bowls. Oh, that goes straight through everybody. Uh, certainly Gillespie, they may have brushed something of Jones. There was no shot played, so that could be a dead ball. Let's be single of by. I wonder how on earth Geraint Jones missed that. But there was no shot played, so nothing got in the way. And yet somehow the ball went straight through. 292 for eight. Does mean that Gillespie will be on strike at the start of the next over. I don't think England will mind that particularly. Deliberate ploy. Could, could have been. And the new ball is due in nine overs. That'll be something that uh, England will keep an eye on. In fact, I see Vaughan there having a chat with Harmison at mid-off, saying, possibly, well, look, how many overs do you want before we take that new ball? Do you think you can get three out of him before they take the new ball to get him on to try and have a go at well, Gillespie? you'd like to bowl him out before the new ball came along. Yes. You don't really want to get ahead of yourself with that. Yeah. Yeah, yep, Skipper's got it at the back of the mind. Yeah, just quickly go eight, nine to go. Okay. However, I want to get these two out now. 292 for eight. Just Kasparovic to come. And there's 115 runs in it at the moment. That's in England's advantage as Jones bowls a bouncer, which uh, Gillespie plays off the back foot. It came up very slowly. And uh, Gillespie was able to prod that down into the offside. Giles is the fielder. And. Uh, Gillespie wanders around. Bill has a Red Bull. One of those days, is it? Bill, you'll be doing all sorts of things tonight. They won't be able to control you. It won't help your screen, though, I'm afraid. I think we're dining together tonight, aren't we? Are we? Oh. Can of that inside. You'll all be in trouble. You'll be singing and dancing and telling appalling jokes. In goes Jones. And that's a Yorker, or at least a full-length ball, which is driven up to mid-off by Gillespie and fielded by Vaughan. 
No, we've got Merv Dews to do that. I don't think Merv's invited, is he? Haven't got Merv tonight, have we? Not sure. <laughs> you don't have to invite him well, for him to turn up. I'm not sure <laughs> Brock and Coke Hall out in the, uh, the, the wilds of... Uh, is it Worcestershire down there? Is we ready for Merv, is it? Probably not. Clear the place, I think. We'll get more provisions in. It's certainly not a place to be wearing shorts. In goes Jones, and that keeps it a little bit low. It was short of a length. Gillespie be back. Plays that away carefully enough, but a little cautiously, and he's looking up at the screen there for a replay, I think, just to see if that really did keep low, whether it was just a, a misjudgment on his part. But whatever it was, Peterson now comes into field at short extra cover, and Bell is being moved from fourth slip into the leg side. Backward short leg. Gillespie looks around. If you look at this field as a tail ender, you're thinking short. <laughs> you're thinking rib tickler. This will be an in swing Yorker. And for Jeff Lawson, you think double bluff. In goes Jones, and it, well, it's short. That's a glorious stroke. An imperious back foot drive from Gillespie, who may have surprised even himself with that shot. It was he certainly surprised us. It was a very good stroke indeed. And, uh, well, that's one of the hardest shots to play, that, a forcing stroke through the offside off the back foot. And, and a classic example, I think, of a bowler in two minds. He got halfway between Yorker yep. and Mounts and a bowl long hop. He did, rather. It was, it was as if he, he didn't quite know what he was supposed to do there. With his field set for a, a short ball. Set for a short ball, all the double bluff, and it, it came yep. in between somewhere. Right, he's five not out. Gillespie, he's faced 20 balls. And he'll be starting to feel like a batsman. 296 for eight. And Jones runs in past the umpire, he's there, he bowls, that's the bouncer, and it's fended off by Gillespie, certainly adequately enough, giving no sign there of, of giving any ground. And uh, right up on his toes is a tall man, of course, is able to fend that off, and it was picked up by Peterson. I think, you know, I said some stats during Lords, the, the average balls faced in Gillespie in his last ten innings was something like 80. Is it? So, he, yeah, so he, he does lurk. He hangs around. He's a lurker and a nicker and a nudger and occasionally plays Brad Benesk off the back foot. Well, there's a man out there now at deep point. Is it? <laughs> extraordinary field setting. In goes Jones and he bowls and that comes cutting back towards Gillespie. They were going to give him one, I think, saying, come on, take the single off the last ball, we'll have you on strike. He could have had one there, playing up to mid-off, but declined, so Gilchrist will be on strike. But Australia exactly 111 runs behind. Unlucky number again, Jeff. You were here last time with no, 87s, happened, weren't you? No, it happened, all happened on an 88, though, didn't it? It did. 296 for eight. So 111 behind. Giles is going to continue. I wonder for how long. I wonder if it is Harmerson time. He hasn't bowled since T. In fact, he and Hoggard have kept uh, the lowest of low profiles. Hoggard has been off the field a couple of times, suggesting that he might not be very well. That sort of going off the field. And you've spotted Harmerson off you, Bill, perhaps. Perhaps there's something going around the England dressing room at the moment. But they're, yeah, but they're, not, they're not letting read those who are on the field. Indeed, here's Giles bowling to Gilchrist, who might want two here if he can do. He's got it absolutely in the right place for a very cunning and perfectly placed two. That was well played. And Vaughan, I think, had to review that because he can virtually play that shot every ball. He simply dabbed it into the offside. There's no one there saving the single. And if you place it absolutely perfectly, as Gilchrist did there, it's two runs every time. I don't like that field. Yeah, it's all too easy on the offside, isn't it? Mm. I mean, the leg side's a little bit packed. Let's just have a look at that. Giles, Bowles, and Gilchrist comes down the pitch, and, uh, well, he tried to hit that through the offside. This is the plan, presumably, to try and get him driving through extra cover there, where there's an enormous gap, when most people are over on the leg. And he didn't quite get to the pitch of that. He drove through it. It's a little bit fortunate, perhaps. So this is the theory. They're going to try and get him driving across whatever spin there is there. But he's, he mows that across the line out to square leg, who's allowing a single, but not actually on the boundary. It's Strauss in that rather in-between position. And one run is taken. 2.99 for eight. Another slurp of red ball from Bill. Dear, oh, dear. Tips on your computer, Bill. My screen might come to life. <laughs> It's all that sort of reputation, hasn't it, Red Bull? It's actually of, of a good advertising idea, though. Oh, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just a little bit fearful of what might happen tonight over the dinner table. You can sit next to him. 2.99 for eight. 
And Gillespie squats over his bat. He's on five. Giles round the wicket, bowls to him. He's forward there, playing that comfortably enough. And uh, Giles picks the ball up. You still haven't put this as Hayden's first golden duck in test cricket on these records, Bill. Well, I've confirmed it. Giles bowls a ball that's well flighted on the leg stump. It's padded away by Gillespie. Not getting his bat anywhere near that because he's got Bell hovering just a couple of yards away for a, a catch there, whether it comes off the inside edge into the pad or maybe off Gillespie's glove. But he simply keeps everything out of the way and uh, kicks that one away. In comes Giles again, a quicker one, I reckon. Yes, it is. And that's pushed up towards short extra cover, flint off field. And Gillespie survives, and more than survives. He looks uh, perfectly comfortable there at the moment. 2.99 for eight is the score, so Australia are 108 runs behind. And they've got those couple of wickets left. They've got Casper down there in the dressing rooms, no doubt playing all sorts of shots in front of the, uh, the mirrors there, making himself feel good. Yeah, and Casper is, uh, as I say, used to bat number nine for Queensland. Good, uh, good number nine. Uh, that sort of sums him up. I don't know. He's, that's made too many runs in Test cricket recently, though. He keeps getting out for, for not too many, but pretty handy at number 11. Will he be as good as McGrath? We, we don't know. McGrath, 30 runs without dismissal, I think, at Lords. Yeah, so that was slightly against the run of form, wasn't it? Well, but a little bit, maybe. He, uh, he would argue that his game's improving. There is a change, and uh, again, this, this interests me. And he, I wonder how Harmison and Hoggard are. Well, Harmison in particular, because Flintoff's coming back, having already bowled since the tea break. It wasn't a long spell. He bowled us three overs, but he bowled four before it. So I wonder if Harmy is all right. Probably save them for, for the next new ball or even the second innings. Seven overs to the new ball. Indeed. I think that's more likely the planning. He's there standing at mid on. And let's look at the field that Flintoff has here. For Gilchrist, there's one slip who is wide, is at second slip. There's a third man, a backward point, a deep point, way over to our right there in front of the Hollies stand, which is rather lively at the moment. An extra cover and a mid off on the fence. In goes Flintoff, and that's clipped away by Gilchrist, only for one, and he's not the least bit bothered, it seems, about exposing Gillespie. The 300 comes up. So, uh, I suppose there's 107 behind their supporters, and there are many of them here, put their hands together. And the field changes round now for Gillespie. I think Gilka's probably doing the right thing there. It's, you you well, never we have, quite tell, can you? Well, we know Gillespie can defend. Don't take the run on. It's not a problem. Wait for a ball, it might be able to hit for four, but... It's yes. You've seen Victor out. Marks in, in Godfather mode before, and I, I, don't, I don't mean in some, <laughs> a dodgy suit. The Godfather of Somerset. Yeah, he's, he's got his godson here, which is rather nice, and it, Uncle Victor's doing the rounds, which is all rather, all rather heartwarming. Three hundred for eight. Didn't what? have him as sort of an Al Capone. I can't see Victor as that quite. In goes Flintoff, and that's outside the off stump. There's no stroke from Gillespie. I, I thought you. He turned up in a stitch in a dark suit and incarnation in a violin case. I think. <laughs> well, I hope not. Which, which would have been unusual for Victor to turn up for the cricket like that. Well, while we're talking about the Red Bull and the effects of, of Red Bull on Bill, I, I just wonder if Red Bull will do anything for Victor. I mean, that, that would be the ultimate <laughs> test, wouldn't it? Uh, it's unlikely. <laughs> if he suddenly, uh, I don't know, had a burst of energy or something, that really would be the ultimate test. 300 for eight. And uh, Gillespie's on five. In goes Flintoff and bowls a short ball, heaved into the pitch. But Gillespie again, very calmly, stands up and plays that away into the offside. Vaughan is the fielder. And there's no run. Any effect yet, Bill? Are you seeing double or writing, scoring double quick or anything? It's not a matter I wish to discuss with strangers. No. Well, it makes the stats come twice as quickly to you all. Something like that. Keep me awake listening to you. Ah, oh, well, that's well, obviously an added bonus. In goes Flintoff. And that's another short one. And actually, he didn't play that terribly well. It was a hard one to play, mind you. It was, it was homing in on his throat. And Gillespie got his hands up. And the, I think it was the bat handle or the gloves. He really needs a short leg, I think. He was going to bowl that length and that line at Gillespie. Otherwise, there's not much point in doing it. And in fact, as we say that, Bell comes trotting up with his helmet on. And he's going to go into that position, but that was a nasty one, really. Not many number 10s 
in Test cricket, who relish that chin music they call it. But he, play, yeah, he played it. Steve Harms and usually he'd said for six. Yes. So Bell at short leg, and it's Flintoff who rushes in and bowls on the off stump. A good length ball and well played by Gillespie again, getting right behind that. Harmison bends at mid off to field. There's no run. It's 300 for eight, so Australia are 107 behind. I'm sure lots of people are going to their cars round about now, escaping from their offices, looking forward to a weekend. And uh, it's been another excellent day of test cricket here. It didn't quite have the pace of yesterday, but then I think that's unlikely. But it's had plenty of excitement. Hayder was out for naught. It's his first golden duck in test cricket. That was... <laughs> they sure? was in Hoggard's first over. Bill won't have it, but I can assure you it's true. In goes Flintoff. And uh, that's worked away into the leg side by Gillespie. It came off a thickish inside edge. Jones fields. And that means that Gillespie, having taken that single, will be on strike for the start of the next over. The new ball is now six overs away. 301 for eight. So Hayden out for naught. Ponting 61. Ashley Giles got him out. There was wild celebrations here at Edgebaston when that happened. Giles is running around, pointing at people and punching the air and being hugged and kissed and goodness knows what out there. Ponting out for 61. He played very well too. It looked well set. Martin has run out on the stroke of lunch. A direct hit by Michael Vaughan. From mid on, Martin was out for 20 again. He looked pretty well set. So did Clark, but he was caught behind off Giles for 40. Just pushing at a, a quicker ball. 194 for four, that was. Meanwhile, Langer was still going strong at the other end. He'd been hit on the head, hit in the solar plexus, winded, hit on the gloves. He was having a pretty rough time, but he was playing a very gutsy role at the other end. He watched as Katic was out for four, caught behind off Flintoff. That was 208 for five. Let's break off as Giles starts a new over and uh, Gillespie comes forward here prodding us into the offside. There was then a stand of 54 between Langer and Gilchrist. For Langer's innings finally came to an end. LBW to Jones. Bit of swing into him. Didn't quite move his feet. He's hit on the back leg and it was out. LBW for 82. That was 262 for six. He batted four hours, 35 minutes. Here's Giles outside the off stump. No stroke from Gillespie. Warren came in and played an absolutely horrific stroke a wild swipe at Giles it was uh, reminiscent of Tino Best at Lord's last year and particularly with Gilchrist batting at the other end, it was a moment of madness from Warren here's uh, Giles and uh, that's played away into the offside by Gillespie, no run so Warren bowled by Giles for 8 Lee was caught by Flintoff at second slip off Jones for 6, that was 282 for 8 and now Gillespie's prodding about Gilchrist is doing what he can and the deficit for Australia is 106 with 50 minutes left of play tonight 60 Novas are due to be bowled I doubt we'll have them and the play will end at 6 Giles comes in and bowls and that's pushed away again by Gillespie who rather cheekily thinks about taking a single there but uh, he's not going to Peterson comes in from mid-off and there's no run but it's been a an excellent day's cricket. England just with their noses in front at the moment, but you know with Australia that uh, they have the capability, and particularly with the man out there at the moment, 43 not out, to, uh, to do anything, frankly. In comes Giles again over the wicket, and Gillespie goes back and uh, fiddles that away to short, fine leg. He's done it again. He's taken the strike. Or is there one ball to go? There's one to go. Let's see what England do here. Hopefully they'll... Uh, a little more attacking than they have been of Gilchrist rather than everyone dashing out into the deep and they'll try and keep him down at this end but let's have a look there doesn't are, look like it no, it doesn't at the moment does it there are three men out of the leg side boundary at the moment oh surely Vaughan has to try and bring the men in on the offside and stop the single I think he's going to yes he is he's bringing in deep mid off and uh, Harmison there at backward point and the ball boys are on the move. They, they seem to suspect something. They're <laughs> going out there to very deep mid-wicket, two of them. Well, what have they been up to? As if they've suddenly thought, hang on, Gilchrist's on strike. It may well come our way. You're on the red bull, do you reckon, Bill? It might have been. 302 for eight. Now then, Gilchrist looks around. What's he going to do? It's the last ball of the over. Really, he wants to get a single here. Giles bowls to him, he flicks it away to the leg side, he's going for a quick single, that had to be fast here, the throw from Strauss misses, and he may well go for overthrows, it is going for overthrows, it's going for lots of overthrows, as Hoggard there goes sliding into the advertising hoardings, 
So not only did he get his single, but he gets four to boot, so he gets a five. It means that Gilchrist will be on strike. And, well, I suppose Strauss had to throw at it. Let's have a look at the replay to see whether Gilchrist would have been out if the throw had hit. He probably wouldn't, actually. I think he just got his ground, but Strauss probably feels... I think he had to throw, yeah. I mean, yeah, he had to have a go at that. 3.07 for eight, and uh, Gilchrist is now on 48. The light's starting to deteriorate slightly. And uh, more thoughts from Jeff Lawson and then Henry Blofeld. Yeah, thanks, Angus. Well, it, it's been steady, very steady play at the moment with... Uh, Australia down to, to eight out. Gilchrist scoring runs virtually off the first ball he faced with short singles and Gillespie playing out the rest of the over. It's been tense though, Henry. It's 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 a different flow, a different rhythm to what we've had for 140 overs today, but it, it's back to a little bit of tense and they're, cricket, they're, they're doing a very good job these like these two and it makes you wonder what uh, Lee and uh, Warren must be thinking about because Gillespie is faring very well indeed and these runs could be extremely important when their final accounting is done Flintoff round the wicket in bowls out to Gilchrist Gilchrist is forward and that's picked up easily elegantly and fluently by Michael Vaughan at shortage extra cover 307 for 8 exactly 100 runs behind England and Gilchrist, the man that England want out most of all, is 48. He's not cut loose. They've um, prevented him doing that. But he looks in reasonable control. And he's got a very solid partner, Gillespie, at the other end, who's done all that has been asked of him and, and more. And Flintoff is in. Bowls now to Gilchrist. Gilchrist just defends, pushing back on the offside. Flintoff himself feels. Gives Gilchrist a bit of a lingering look. But in fact, not only I say Gillespie's done more than was asked of him, that shot he played off Jones off the back foot was a beauty, wasn't it? It was a shot of a batsman. He, he stood up and timed it and placed it. Didn't try to hit it too hard. It was... Uh... How many balls does he face now, Gillespie, Bill? Gillespie, 35. 35. Well, you see, he's got seven runs, but he's still there, making Gilchrist a partner. Here is Flintoff into Gilchrist, who works that way out to Strauss at deep mid-wicket. They go for one... And uh, so the score, 308 for 8, 99 behind now. And I mean, if Australia could get the deficit down to 50 or even 40, it would pack, could be very significant. But if they let England go into their second innings leading by 80 or 90, it's going to be quite a big lead on a pitch which looks as though the bounce is going to deteriorate as the game goes on. It, it's still played well for, for two days, though. It's it has. Just the odd ball, as, as in yesterday, today, just the odd balls kept a little low. It's, mm. But knowing pitches here, it, 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 it's something that, you know, happens more and more. And now Flintoff over the wicket, in to bowl to Gillespie, bowls, Gillespie goes back, plays with exemplary fashion down there to Harmison at to mid-off, who bends over, rubs the ball, preserving the polish, creating the polish and uh, on the seat of his trousers then he has a word with Flintoff as he walks back it gets irritating for fielding side when you cannot get through the last wickets these two now have, have put on uh, 26 runs I mean they've done a very important job for Australia and every uh, look as though they're going to continue Flintoff it is, he's in now he's up to the wicket, he bowed over the clip, but to or Yorker and yes he's gone, LBW Gillespie's LBW, that was an absolute beauty it was right in the block hole Gillespie had no answer to that at all it hit him on the toe I should think oh, um, and he was uh, plumb in front and uh, Rudy Kurtzin gave him the lingering death the finger going up very, very, very slowly but it did look in quick motion at any rate as so though it was very plumb now we went for the Yorker and that's a good bowl to bowl to Gillespie he's banged a few in and got him playing nicely off the back foot but got him to that mode where you're playing back playing back maybe expecting something short with a, a short leg in and then bowled the Yorker well, probably hit him on the full and, and did swing in quite a long way and that was Kurtzman's only uh, question really was it swinging too far to miss leg and it certainly hit him in front of the stumps Michael. Yes, he did. And Taylor does really mm. get that sort of benefit. Well, I, this is right, isn't it? 
But, um, I mean, with the naked eye, from where oh, we looked, are, which oh, it more or less... Absolutely, no it, questions asked, isn't it? No, exactly. It, it did look plumb. When we see it again on the slow-motion replay, then I suppose that perhaps doubts may uh, creep in. But, of course, the slow-motion replay is not something that the umpires have the benefit of at any stage. And it, the Michael Kasperovich, the last man, is striding manfully out, like a man about to walk the plank. He knows he's got to do it. 308 for 9, Australia. A large, rather floppy, magnificent seagull flies across the ground. Uh, I think an English seagull, rather enjoying the fall of the ninth wicket from that Yorker from Flintoff, flies away over our left shoulder. We've seen a few pigeons, but it's the first seagull I remember in this match. And uh, Kasperovich now is taking guard. He's had quite a long chat uh, to Gilchrist, who's coming down the wicket, giving it a prod. And Harmison and Flintoff are talking away. Kasperovich has taken guard. He's done a lot of few exercises, bending at the knees. And now he takes up his stance and heads Flintoff. Coming in now to Kasperovich. He's up to the wicket now. He bows. A York is in drum in front. And he's out. He's LBW first ball. And Australia are all out for 308. And Kasperovich, LBW, to another complete perfect replica of the ball before, which dismissed Gillespie. Kasperovich is out. LBW bowl, Flintoff, naught. And you could hardly wish to see two more perfect Yorkers in successive balls. Well, well as Flintoff began to run in, I'm thinking he's got to bowl the same ball, hasn't he? Full, swinging in. And that was probably missing middle and leg. Oh, sorry, sorry, middle and off. And hitting leg right down the bottom. That was as plump as you get, LBW, and a really good piece of bowling. Why don't we see more Yorkers bowl? Well, I know. I mean, we, we had the, the, the field set, didn't we, for the short stuff. And as you were saying at the time, maybe it's for the double bluff. Well, if it was the double bluff, it came a bit late, but it worked in the end. So those two wickets leave Flintoff on a hat-trick uh, when he comes on to bowl in the second innings. And England, meanwhile, have got a lead of 99, which uh, is, gonna, is quite a considerable lead in the circumstances. Oh, very good lead in the circumstances. And they keep talking about this pitch on days four and five, uh, getting a little more erratic and bouncing. And, and as I speak, the groundsmen are, are, are sweeping up the pitch and there's dust flying in all directions with, with this breeze coming from the west across the ground. So it's obviously a very dry pitch and they are likely to be the ones that do break up. But it's played quite well for two days. But if England can get, well, let's say 350 lead, something of that nature, I think Australia might find it very difficult to keep that out on, uh, say, the fourth and fifth days. Well, it's going to be very interesting now. We've got, um, uh, I mean, the day's play will end at 6 o'clock, but England have got, uh, what, about uh, 35 minutes batting. And it's going to be interesting to see not only how they go about it, but how the Australian bowlers go about it. And, and uh, whether it looks much the same as it did yesterday, but I'm sure England, with just 35 minutes left to play, will not go out there to play their strokes in the way they did on the first morning, but will be looking to be there uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah, it'll be another interesting little period. It's the period we were deprived of yesterday when the rain came right on the close of the England innings. That would have been an exciting 25 minutes uh, last night, but unfortunately uh, the weather intervened. and it, it might be a torrid time for England, but they will be at least walking to the crease. With the noise, they've, they've got a lead of uh, almost 100 runs. And it, it, I think it's, it's a very respectable lead given the conditions. And, it also reinforces what they did yesterday. They, they were criticised in some ways of being bowled out for 400 and not making 500 or 550. And I, I thought that was a, a little bit harsh. But when Australia's 300 is put next to it, it does put it into perspective that it was a good first inning score, no matter that they were bowled out in 80 overs. Well, this is right. And I mean, getting runs on the board like that and the way they got them, it was quite a sort of psychological blow for Australia and Australia's bowlers. Because they did, whereas England's batsmen had been so timid at Lords, they took the battle to the Australians. They didn't let Warren and Co. So even though he got four wickets in the end, he mopped up three of the tail. They didn't let him settle into the, that, that devastating rhythm which he'd done at Lords. And uh, they were prepared to take risks and they got away with it. Well, I think one has to say on the first day, the luck that was about probably went England's way. 
Uh, but and today has been not such a, a quick fire day as cricket, but it's been just as fascinating. Well, it was quick fire up to around the tea break, but Australia was still scoring about five and over. And when they lost a couple of wickets, the run rate uh, decreased, and, and it also decreased because the bowling was very good. And we're talking about Jones's spell after tea. I, I thought it was absolutely outstanding. He, he, he moved the ball around. He bowled good line and length. And to me, he's got the most out of this pitch so far. And, and you like to think that that if McGrath had a plate, he may have got the similar sort of man, but, he, but he's not out there. I mean, it's, it's a hypothetical question, but, but Jones is very good. Hoggard uh, didn't get much of a bowl today. Uh, early on, of course, wicket first ball, which is well, a bit of a bonus, let, let's face it. When the opening batsman hits the first ball or extra cover, head high, you've got to put that down as a bonus. But uh, I don't know, I think Harmison took a wicket, did he? Henry Harmison, short spell, 11 overs, didn't take a wicket. At least it'll be fresh for the second innings. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean that. I didn't mean that sort of... What about Giles now? I thought he did oh, good. Yeah, very good job today. Figures 26 overs, is it? 26 overs, two maidens, three for 78. Yeah, excellent job. Excellent job. And uh, maybe a little, little lucky with, with the pointing dismissal because probably should have tried to, to hit that hard and just helped around the corner. But very good wicket. The Clark wicket was a big one in today's context because Clark was away to a start and, and batting quite well. And I thought... But Giles out thought him and out bowled him. Got him with an arm ball that he managed to nick. Uh, and it, when he previously had slashed an arm ball past uh, just got to get slipped. So I just thought that was a really good piece of bowling. And he stuck at his job, bowled to the foot marks and, uh, and, and got his three wickets. And, and that, that's a job well done. In his job description, it, it's to keep it tight and pick up the odd wicket and support his fast bowls, and he did exactly that. And then, of course, there were those two absolutely, I mean, tremendous Yorkers from Flintoff at the end. Well, the balls were going reverse swing, I'd, I'd say, the last 20-odd uh, overs. Yes. And, and they were very well bowled. Jones had a bit of a shot at the tail and couldn't quite get it. I thought because he banged it in a little bit too short, but Flintoff set up, set up Gillespie well, short leg in, hit the, hit the wicket hard with a couple, maybe defend off the back foot, and, and he was comfortable doing that, but in settling for backward defence he wasn't ready for the Yorker and, and uh, it swung in late it did move and Casper has got another absolute rip of the next ball which, which swung in hit him on the toe and he was, he was playing back as, as you would do when you bat number 11 and you haven't faced many deliveries and he got, got caught playing back so uh, Flintoff will find himself as we must remind ourselves, he'll be on a hat-trick in the second innings. Indeed. Well, Williams already reminded me. Um, but um, it, 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 it was a, a certainly a stirring end to it all. But we're going to have a fascinating 35 minutes cricket now, which is going to begin in two or three minutes. Uh, Bill has just about finished. He has. He's finished the scorecard. So I shall now give it to you. Or rather, read it to you. Langer, LBW, bowled SP Jones, 82. Hayden caught Strauss, bowled Hoggard, naught. Ponting caught Vaughan, bowled Giles, 61. Martin, run out, direct hit by Vaughan, for 20. Uh, Clark caught Geo Jones, bowled Giles, 40. Katic caught Geo Jones, bowled Flintoff, 4. Gilchrist not out, 49. Never really cut loose as he can do. Uh, Warren bowled Giles, 8. Lee caught Flintoff, bowled SP Jones, 6. Uh, Gillespie, LBW, bowled Flintoff, 7. Kasprovich, LBW, bowled Flintoff, naught. So there were two Golden Ducks, two first ballers, um, Hayden and uh, Kasprovich. So um, the primary club uh, will be rubbing its hands. Everyone will have to, to fork out for those. Uh, there were 13 buys, 7 leg buys, 1 wide and 10 no balls, 31 extras, but we live in an age when there always seem to be a large number of extras. 76 overs and 346 minutes, Australia were all out for 308. The wickets fell at naught, 88, 118, 194, 208, 262, 273, 273, 282, uh, 308 and 308. And the bowling, Harmison, 11 overs, 1 maiden, none for 48. Hoggard, 8 overs, no maidens, 1 for 41. SP Jones, 16 overs, 2 maidens, 2 for 69. Flintoff, 15 overs, 1 maiden, 3 for 52. And Giles, 26 overs, 2 maidens, 73 uh, runs, 3 wickets. Uh, 3 for 78, Ash to Giles, who had had a bit of a moan before the match began, but he scored useful runs for England in their innings yesterday. He's bowled splendidly today, so he's, do, but rather than moaning, he's doing the 
best thing, which is to answer his critics by turning in a, a good performance. With uh, with an excellent performance. And, and when you look at the bowling figures, Harrison, 11 overs, Giles, 26. Now, this is a pattern the, the Australians didn't want England to have. They want Harrison to bowl lots of overs, get tired, not just as the, the day and the match progress, but as the series progresses. They don't, didn't want Giles to get in and allow him to bowl lots of overs, pick up a couple of wickets. What do you go for? Less than three and over? Yeah, three and over. Um, well, exactly three and over. Exactly three and over, yes, indeed. So he's done a very good job, and the Australian game plan would be to not let him do that. They didn't let him do it at Lords, but uh, here at Edgerton, he's uh, answered all his critics, despite also doing it in the papers midweek. He's done it out on the field. Well, you, the chairs you hear at the moment are for England's openers, the two left-handers, uh, Andrew Strauss and Marcus Truscothic. The Australians and the umpires are out there. The umpires, of course, now change ends for the second innings, so Billy Bowden will make his extravagant signals from the pavilion end, and um, the rather more, uh, the rather calmer Mr. Rudy Kurtzen will be at the city end. And uh, Truscothic, as always, will take the first ball. It's going to be Brett Lee who's going to bowl it. And at the moment, we've got three slips, gully, cover, uh, mid-off, mid-on, wide mid-on, that is, square leg and a fine leg. Uh, Jason Gillespie is doing all sorts of exercises down on the ground to our right, so it looks as though it's going to be he who will bowl the second over. Uh, Truscothic has taken guard, he now walks away from the wicket, does a few stretching exercises, and obviously England won't want to lose a wicket tonight. There are... Uh, just about 33 minutes left and uh, the clouds getting a little bit darker but the light's not that bad there's blue sky in the distance and um, it's been a perfectly good day weather-wise there was a promise of, of rain it rained overnight but uh, the play started on time and we haven't had a spot all day which has been excellent a pigeon comes quickly over proceedings just having a look and uh, before disappearing away to our left by the cherry picker and Lee is getting ready to bowl to Triscothi and here comes the first ball of the innings Lee is galloping in now up to the wicket bowls to Triscothi Triscothi drives through the covers for four well that was the most splendid start to the innings from England's point of view from Triscothi's point of view and England's lead goes to 103 and that was exactly how Triscothi started things off yesterday it was a full half volley and didn't need it well and uh a contrast to the way Matthew Hayden started his innings. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I mean, these things happen, don't they? I mean, the, the luck of the draw, I don't know. Anyway, Lee comes in again, the second ball of the innings. He's up to the wicket now. He bowls to Scotty, who plays no stroke to one outside the off stump. Taken uh, by Gilchrist, who passes it sideways to Hayden there in the gully. Uh, then it goes to Clark at cover, who throws it back to Hayden. Hayden throws it back to Clark. They're having a little bit of catching practice, uh, loosening themselves up. And um, Kasparovich uh, pats Lee on the back as he walks back to his mark at the far end. And uh, the customers generally, looking around the crowd, they're staying to the end. It has been another absorbing day. It's been worth every single halfpenny of the high prices that are charged these days. As Lee is in again, he bowls now to Scothic, who comes forward but plays no stroke to one well outside the off stump. And Gilchrist goes across to his left towards Warnett's slip and takes. And nothing is done. Gillespie is now holding the pose. He was touching his toes. And... Um, I happen to be able to touch my toes for years. I wonder when Bill Frindle last touched his toes without bending his knees. Probably this morning. Well, I certainly haven't touched yours. No, 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 no. I, thank goodness. I, I've made absolutely sure you haven't. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> certainly a young man's occupation. Actually, it's amazing. Some people are tremendously fit who are able to do it for quite an advanced age. Here comes Lee in Bolts of Scotty, who just defends from the crease, pushing it back to Lee, tries to flick it up from boot to hand, fails, and Clark comes in from the covers to complete the fielding. 85.3 miles an hour that last ball was delivered at. A rather a train, or rather a chain of people coming down the steps of the Eric Holly stand there. One of them is wearing a red jersey, or maybe it's a red T-shirt and a sort of a cloak. So I've no idea whether it's one of the... Cro no, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of large scarf, I think. It's very much the stand for fancy dress over there on our right. 
And here comes Brett Lee in bowls for Scothic. Oi Yorker, he digs it out on the on the offside, goes for a single. Oh my goodness me. He went for the single. He was sent back by Strauss. He uh, Triscothic dropped his bat. He got back into the crease, and I think he was there in time. But Clark's throw didn't hit the stumps in any case. But that was not at all a good idea to take a single then. And Strauss, I think, is coming down the wicket to tell uh, Triscothic just that. But uh, no, he just got back, I think, if that had hit. He, he, he sort of didn't dive in, but he jumped in. Oh, it, it, was, it was nip and tuck, and we're seeing it again and again. But meanwhile, Lee is in, bows to Triscothic, who goes up on his toes, plays that down to Hayden in the gully, and uh, there is no run. At the end of the first over, England and their second innings are four for no wicket. A delicious cover drive by Triscothic to the first ball, a near run out a little bit later when a very silly single was attempted. But Triscothic got in, and couldn't it? Whether if there had been a direct hit, I think the third umpire would have had the most awful headache. He'd have been scratching his head so much. Well, I think he may have just uh, just snuck in, but you don't often see the batsmen stretching for the crease with their foot. You thought he might have thrown himself, aren't you? <laughs> in the circumstances. Anyway, it's going to be Jason Gillespie. Uh, with all that hair, he's going to bowl the second over from this end, the pavilion end, and he's uh, going to bowl in a, in a sleeveless sweater. Henry, Henry Lawson is slaking his thirst with a very good-looking glass of water. It's a dolly good drink, water, isn't it? Fine brew. A, a fine brew. Served up by my chief waiter, James Maxwell. James Maxwell, he's, well, he had to have some. That to be something good about him. <laughs> <laughs> he had to, I mean, he had to have some purpose in life. Gosh. Goodness me. Um, no, he's, a very, he's, he's a very good putter. He's, well, he's a very good chap. He came and had dinner with me in London the other day, and um, I'm <clears throat> very, it was a, a splendid evening. Splendid. And we had the greatest possible fun. He was in full of good spirits, and uh, lots of my friends, and I think everyone enjoyed themselves hugely. And um, it's now going to be Gillespie again. He's on his way in, he bowls, and Strauss plays that one from the crease out into the, into the offside. Langer there. Uh, in the covers field and nothing is done and uh, Strauss at Lords 2 and 37 at Edgbaston 48 and at the moment he is naught not out England in their second innings a four for no wicket they led by 99 on the first innings which is a significant lead and um, so the lead now has been stretched to 103 and Gillespie, it is the wind roughing his trousers and his shirt. He comes in now, up to the wicket, past umpire Bowden, bowls outside the off stump, Strauss plays no stroke. Gilchrist takes and Warren gives the obligatory clap and uh, then uh, folds his arms across his chest, making him look as though he almost wishes he'd brought a long sleeve sweater out. So it's quite a chilly evening for early August. Well, the wind's been blowing, been blowing all day. It's, it's been quite nice when the sun's been out, but it's, as I said, it's got a little bit cloudy here at the moment. The dark ones above our heads. Well, I know. It's looking, it's looking a bit bright. The high-rise blocks in the office blocks in the middle of the city of Birmingham are quite sharply etched against the skyline. Gillespie's in, bows to Strauss, who gets a short one and sort of helps it round the corner. Down to Lee at Backward Square, deep Backward Square. Um, long leg, really. And it went straight to him. He didn't have to move one inch to his right or his left. Waited for the ball and returned it. Strauss is off the mark. He goes down and has a chat with Triscothic. Much prodding goes on. Much prodding in the marsh. And the score is five for no wicket. <clears throat> Two slips, a gully, a backward point, a uh, cover, mid-off, mid-on, square leg and uh, long leg. Long leg seems sometimes to become rather an old-fashioned uh, name, position, doesn't it? It's fine it's, leg or deep back with yeah, square. Yes, it's not what we use in Australia all that much. Gillespie in, bows to Triscothic outside the off-stump. The natural angle of delivery, right arm over, slanting the ball across the left-hander. And Gilkes took going to his left. Now, I think f fine leg has generally taken over from long leg. But um, when I was at school, it was always long leg. Long leg yep. So a new call, fine leg would be much finer. It would be finer. So he's almost deep back with square, he isn't is, he? Yes, it's uh, it's actually an interesting position with Gillespie bowling that he's that he's not either squarer for for a full shot there or he's finer for an for an edge. It's a 
for a leg glance, it's a, it's a very square position. Well, Gillespie it is again. The sun's come out. He's up to the wicket. He bowls to Scott. who just stops it down in front of him. They go for a single. I thought for just a moment they were on a collision course. But that was a good single. That was perfectly safe. And uh, no complaints there. With the first one, Truscothic uh, tried to take in the first over, uh, would have been suicidal had they gone through with it. Six for no wicket to score. Truscothic has got five. And a pale sun has just started to um, burst out over the ground. The players have uh, longish shadows. And Gillespie walks back wearily. It's the end of the long day. Batted very well for a time, too, he did. And here he is. In now, bowls to Strauss. Strauss is forward, pushing back on the onside. Gillespie himself goes across and uh, feels the ball. It is the end of the second over of the innings, and England in their second innings, six for no wicket. Five to, to, to Scothic, one to Strauss. England lead by 105, and after another word from Henry Lawson, it will be Jim Maxwell to take you through until the close. Thanks, Henry. Well, we've had two overs with this uh, this new ball, and there's not a lot happening. No, no swing. We, we haven't seen much swing with the new ball from either side on either day. Not much happening off the seam as well, and uh, I think Ricky Pony is at this moment deep in conversation with Brett Lee. Wants a bit better result from his faster bowlers. It almost seems, though, with, without McGrath, that they can't quite get the new ball in the right spot and threaten enough batsmen. James Maxwell. Hello, Henry. Yes, it's uh, been a, another very good day of Test cricket, but uh, I think you'd have to say at the end of it, England are in the, the stronger position to, to force the issue with so much time left in the game. We've still got three days and we're into England's second innings. Here's Lee starting the third over in the sunshine. He bowls and Toscothic is driving and driving for four. Lee pitched up, the ball's not swinging, it's a nice half volley, and Truscothic's in excellent touch, it's his second boundary from the bowling of Lee, and he moves to nine and the score to ten. Without McGrath, there's not the, the edge, the control, perhaps even the potency in Australia's bowling. Well, well not perhaps the thought either, we, mm. we just saw we have Brett Lee bowling here, it's not swinging, and he hasn't made the adjustment to bowl shorter. He tries again. Truscothic goes back to his short a ball and knocks it down on the offside. They've manoeuvred the field now. Three slips gully. Point cover mid-off, mid-on and a long leg. The 7-2 offside field, which we've seen quite often today when Australia were batting. But Australia bowled out for 308. And really it was the first ball bowl to Hayden that got Australia on the back foot because he hit it straight to Strauss at short cover from the bowling of Hoggard and from there it was one of those attritional days where Australia tried to dig their way out of it and didn't quite. Lee bowls, Truscothic leaves outside the off stump. Again the ball just on a bit of angle outside the off stump. But uh, England exerted far more pressure with the ball than Australia could yesterday. Is that because Australia just couldn't catch up with the game, with the attack from the opening partnership and beyond? Well, I think that because they bowled the wrong length for much of the day. But, but that was because of the batting to an extent? Yeah, it, it's hard to debate whether England went after the Australians, therefore they bowled a bad length, or, or mm. Australia bowled a bad length, therefore the scoring became easier. Lee in again, Truscothic goes back, jabs a short ball off his hip away on the onside. Truscothic 9, Strauss 1, England and, none for 10. You, you tend to think Australia didn't quite get the bowling right. That Early on... It's OK being hit for a couple of falls early on when you're trying to pitch up and see if the ball's swinging, but it, it was fairly obvious. It was it was doing absolutely nothing, and they didn't make the adjustments. And what, Brett Lee bowled 17 overs for 111? It's OK bowling your first three overs for, you know, go for four, five, six and over even, but then you've got to make the adjustments. Now Lee in from the city end, Vols, just Gothic's on the crease with a push. That uh, erect stroke of his, just watching the ball and playing at the last moment. And uh, Lee, of course, bowling at the other end. Didn't, I don't think he bowled an over down there in the first innings. He was primarily bowling from this end. And I also thought he lost patience at yesterday at the lower order. The tactics were astray. We've seen Brett do that before, haven't we? Too short, too full. Mm. Rather than settle for some good length bowling and, and wait for mistakes to, to happen. 
So England looking good at the moment. Lee bowls to Scothic's back and he pulls the ball up in the air, miscuing totally as it lobbed behind square. Luckily for Scothic it fell safely, but he was late on that and he ended up just knocking it around the corner off a wobbly top edge into no man's land. And luckily it was no man's land. And he took a single. It's uh, 11 without loss at the end of Lee's over, from which five runs came. Two overs for nine. And Australia all out for 308. Langer top scored. Leg before to Jones for 82. Ponting made 61. Clark 40 and Gilchrist was 49 not out. And Flintoff's on a hat-trick in the second innings. Three for 52. And Giles three for 78. Well, Gillespie now on uh, into his second over. Got a lot of zip in the first one. Let's see if he's uh, got a few of the cobwebs out. He moves towards Truscothic, who leaves a ball that's going across him outside the off stump. Ever watchful there as we're going into the last 20 minutes of the day. The light's holding, despite the fact that some grey cloud is moving across the ground at the moment. And the forecast is for fine weather for the next three days. So it doesn't appear to be a problem coming up with the weather. And it could be for um, Australia to stay in this game unless they can bowl England out, you would imagine, for no more, no more than 250, 300. Gillespie moves away. He bowls to Scothic, stutters across and then takes the ball away from his pads behind square. Races through for one. Won't get two as it's hurled in from behind square by Lee coming around. The total ticks over to 12. And uh, Gillespie... Is that trudge back getting wearier? He looks at... batted for a while. How many balls did he face? 37 balls for his seven runs. He's going to go around the wicket now. It's a, it's a decision made in the second over to go around the wicket. That's... He's not going to persist trying to angle it across Strauss. So the Australians obviously thought about this and thought, well, we'll go around the wicket to Strauss early on. Cut off that, that powerful shot he has square of the wicket on the offside, perhaps. Two slips in the gully. Point cover mid off, mid on, mid wicket, long leg, and Gillespie comes past Billy Bowden around the wicket. Strauss leaves the ball alone outside the off stump. So we're not going to get uh, all the overs available at this late stage in the day. We'll finish at uh, 6 o'clock. What was it? 12 to finish, Bill? 12, yes. Yep. 12 overs and we're in the fourth. So probably another four or five overs. And that will be it on the regulations. But uh, two absorbing, contrasting days of cricket. England with a scintillating batting performance and Australia digging in today. Gillespie bowls. Forward goes Strauss and drives through the covers superbly and away to the boundary for four. He measured that off. Just stretching across outside the off stump. And uh, England's confidence has grown one from the moment that uh, I'm sure McGrath was ruled out of the team and two from the time Truscothic started clouting boundaries from Brett Lee after they were sent in. It does build your confidence when you uh, hit a few through the covers with the middle of the bat, just as Andrew Strauss did then. He's five, none for 16. Gillespie bowls again, and he's coming forward and playing a ball off his pads to Kasprovich, who has a flick at the stumps and misses. And it's backed up out there on the offside by Justin Langer. Now Langer playing that the long and gritty innings today 154 balls, 7 fours and Australia had some partnerships going but none of them proved significant none in fact uh, went beyond 100 none got to 100 the measure of England's persistence Gillespie bowls whipped away but hard by Strauss a good stroke but he found Katic out there in front of square so Gillespie's just thereabouts at the moment and there's not a very threatening look about the new ball bowling here from Australia with England 16 without loss and 115 in front. Uh, well, Gillespie choosing to go around the wicket and it was uh, a varied over. Full allowing the drive, full 
that was outside off stump. And then a couple on middle and leg that fortunately the field's been chopped off. Not a lot of consistency about that over at all. Brett Lee's last over was, was better. Huh? After he was hit for the four, he cut back to a really good length and a good line and put some pressure on just Gothic, which included a good short ball, which the left hand had just fended away. Could have gone anywhere. And fortunately, it, it looped into a gap behind square leg. But the last five balls of Lee's over were very good. The first one let him down. Now, let's see if he can just settle for six balls. Well, he's going around the wicket. I mean, Shane Ward's run up and had a chat with him straight away. Mm. So that would have been fascinating. And he's coming around the wicket. Well, let's see what the change of line does. Langer moves out to backward square. Lee bowls. Truscothic tries to cut. He miscues this time. He got it on the bottom of the bat. And they just come off a little slowly from the pitch. But uh, they talk about Edgbaston developing more variable bounce as the game goes on. And we haven't seen a lot of it today, but we saw some skillful reverse swing bowling from Jones and Flintoff. Very good. Excellent. And we're just wondering here what skill we're going to see with a, a new ball from Lee. Because uh, if the ball's not swinging, he could disappear a few times through the covers. Lee bowls. Back he goes, and he's beaten. That is a good ball. That hit the pitch and just missed the outside edge. So Shane Warne's licking his lips at uh, first slip. It just it sounds, it sounds it looked like he was the one who made the suggestion about going around the wicket. That bounced too. A bit of a heat on that. It didn't quite catch the, the radar reading, but we were sitting almost right there behind that, and for a moment I thought it was coming up here. You had that sense that the ball was, was getting rather big on you. Lee again searches in from the city end and bowls. Truscothic's back and forces the ball away out to Clark who's there at point. So 16 without loss, 11 to Truscothic, 5 to Strauss, and the old Barmy Army making plenty of noise, which uh, is probably stirring up a few of the Australians uh, if they're nearby. And the crowd is stuck to the last here. The ground looks as full at quarter to six as it did at 11 o'clock. Half past ten. Lee again around the wicket bowls. Truscothic is across his stumps and pushing the ball away gently towards Katic out there in the covers. It's probably because I mean, they expect things to keep happening. They don't expect the action to die off, and that's what they've got so far. They seem to have quality all the time. And considering what they've been drinking, what they've been dressed in, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a triumph of the will to still be here and and still being intent on the cricket. Uh, the, the Holly stand is uh, buzzing with anticipation here as Lee runs in again and just got it, pulls the short ball away for four. And the ball boy can't stop it. That was four. It went into the fence. <laughs> at, at pace. And the fence, which is about 15 yards beyond the, the rope, just got it. Moves to 15. Isn't he in wonderful form? And it's none for 20. As Lee pounded one in a bit short. And Truscothic helped himself to a boundary, lifting it over Langer's head at backward square. All right, what's Lee's response to that? Here he comes. He bowls again. Truscothic is playing into his pad off an inside edge. A little bit of danger there as it ran away on the offside to complete the over so Australia can't get through at the moment and they have maybe two perhaps three overs left on the second day to try and break through England those to survive and it looks like Michael Kasperovich is going to replace Gillespie after just two overs at the pavilion end and that's fair enough with 10 minutes to go. But Potting just made a, a point of running down to Gillespie to let him know it wasn't just a wave. You know, the captain often stands half a pitch away or further and just says, oh, that's enough, you know, have a rest. He probably doesn't even say it. He just signals it, which you don't often get after two overs. But Potting made the point of running down to him and sort of explaining why he's changing the bowling. So he doesn't take it personally, but... 
whether he did that to uh, appease the Gillespie's feelings or just say, look, I'm just changing the tactics, just trying something different, give Casper a go. Normally those things are not necessary. You don't have to explain to bowlers why they've been taken off. You just The captain makes his decisions and most of the time you understand, even if you don't agree with them, you do understand what they're about. It's a little unusual, that sideshow. Well, it's uh, Kasprovich who does hit the deck a little bit harder than Gillespie these days. He goes in and Strauss leaves a ball that's sliding three low, low and wide, very low and wide outside the line of the off stump as Strauss uh, examined it. None for 20, a lead of 119 for England and uh, Australia facing a, a, an awkward situation here, particularly going to the third day. They'll want to try and stop England building a big position. So it'll make it tricky with the field placing. As Kasparovich bowls on the pads, it's flicked off by Strauss. Easy run there to backward square and to Lee. None for 21. Strauss, six and to Scothic on 15. And uh, yesterday there were 54 fours and 10 sixes. Today there were 39 fours and no sixes in Australia's innings. Another measure of the the difference in a in approach as Katic comes into a short mid off for Kasparovic. He goes up, he bowls, and back goes to Scott. and hits it for four. It was short and wide, and he hammered it out to the boundary. To Scothic in hot form is 25. Oh, he's 19 actually in the scores. 25, but five fours so far in the innings. Yes, Strauss has hit one of them. So 20 of the 25, <laughs> they're carrying on with their left off yesterday. Precisely. Kasparovic goes in again, and it's followed by Truscothic just prodding it out on the offside. And it wasn't a good delivery. It deserved to get hit for four. It was wide, it was, it was short, it was a you know, lovely arc for left-handed to, to hit square of the wicket. But I mean, Australia have got to stop this bleeding of boundaries. I mean, it's not quality bowling at all. Warns warming up at first slip as Kasparovic moves away again. Now he doesn't get there. He lost it in the zone. Lost the ball, in fact, which uh, was picked up by Truscothic as it rolled away. It uh, fell out of his grasp as he was uh, about to deliver it. Bright sunshine across the ground here at Hedgbiston. Perfect light getting close to stumps on the second day and England building a fairly convincingly so far on their good lead. Kasparovic bowls now and it's left alone by Truscothic. That was more like it from Kasparovic's viewpoint. Hit the pitch, went away on the sort of line where he was able to get the nibble in the first innings, but uh, Struskothic showing excellent judgment. A couple of balls from Lee have uh, disturbed him. One flyer outside the off stump that just missed the outside edge, and another short one he was late on, attempting a hook. And the next time it was short, though, he swatted it for four. Kasparovic bowls to him, and he's across and behind, and away into the covers to Langer. And that's the over for Kasparovic and uh, Shane Warne. Is he going to come on and bowl before the close of play here? Yes. Yes. Mm. Two more overs to finish the second day. So we've had six overs and the run rate's up above four again. Mostly boundaries again. Disturbing pattern emerging for the Australians. Yes. And, that, and that'll be... Uh, the judgment, the more it goes, the McGrath factor. What does that mean in the context of these games? Now, for those waiting for the shipping forecast, it will follow immediately after the close of play. So if you're on tender hooks, um, don't, um, don't throw out the life boy. Not yet. 19 for Truscothic, 6 for Strauss. And it will be worn around the wicket to bowl to Strauss. He bowled him with a good leg break in the first innings, too. They did, but that one turned a long way amongst a lot of deliveries that weren't turning very far. 
probably out of a footmark, one of the early footmarks in the match, but I'm sure that uh, Strauss will have that in mind when he's defending. He should be in defensive mode now. He's just going to play his way to stump. See, see through this over. We'll probably have this and well, probably one more. Still five minutes to go. OK, it's worn around the wicket with a slip and a short leg. He bowls the ball, which Strauss is trying to turn and missing. That's turning uh, quite a way, too, as it pitched near his uh, middle stump and went outside the the leg stump to be taken by Gilchrist and immediately Ponting signals a change in the field. Well, well Gilchrist just nodded across to him. Look, it's turning. Let, let's get him in. Mm. And particularly with uh, Strauss very likely to defend, well, well, we don't need a deep mid-wicket. You need to get some people in around the bat, don't you? I mean, he wants to take you on in the last over before stumps, or Warren's last over before stumps. Well, fair enough. That'd be gutsy cricket. But, uh, otherwise, you'd get them in, put some pressure on him. And now there are four close catches. And Martin's not strictly at leg slip, he's sort of leg gully, isn't he? He's that's a, that's an interesting, interesting position. He's yeah. three or four steps deeper than you'd expect. So, Warren at Strauss. Strauss is bold! Oh, bold by a beauty! Pitched in the rough and turned a mile. And Strauss looks around and sees crash the ball going into his stumps. All oh, that was worn at his best. He's pitched in the rough and he's turned it a fair way. And he's knocked Strauss over for six. One for 25. Knocked him over, not playing a shot. Very similar to the first innings. So that's gone behind his legs and hit middle and leg. Fair bit of middle. Now, Andrew, you've, you've got to get something in front of the stumps, my man. You can't just stand and let the ball spin past you. Fair enough getting the pads in the way, but that was that was a bizarre way to play of Shane Warren. How far did it turn? I turned a fair way. I said he turned it more than that, but but Strauss had it bowling behind his legs, but hit middle behind his legs. Now that's a, that's gotta be an error of judgment, surely. But the night watchman coming out? Yes. Hoggard. Well. Uh, so it's an interesting policy but uh, I suppose at this point of the day it's, a, it's an obvious one. There was a, a time when Australia dispensed with it but uh, they've gone back to it in uh, well since Ponting took over the captaincy but this could well be the last over of the day looking at the clock uh, that was only the second ball four more balls to come so um, even if uh, Hoggard has the misfortune to get out that would, you'd imagine, would have done be the end job. of the day. Yes, he, he would have done his job. He gets that first ball, he's done his job. As long as he takes a, a fair while in marking centre. Well, I think we, we, all, we all thought that the way Warren bowled in the first innings that uh, he'd be a big threat in, in the second. But uh, that was a shock. Strauss uh, didn't really cover the line of the ball. It's turned past him and hit middle and leg. So, just maybe, with Warren about, England's chances of uh, setting Australia a substantial target are going to be severely threatened tomorrow. Well, that was, wasn't quite a gadding ball, but it was exciting. I mean, you've got to say not well played. No. no. You've only got to survive the five more balls, more or less, and you get, get through the stumps. And there's a lot it, happening out there. It's, it's taken about three or four minutes to get another ball in. Uh, what's happening down here? They're bringing out more gear. And uh, Brad Haddon gives a helmet to Clark. I think the umpires are... Uh, uh, Billy Bowden's getting a bit uh, edgy out there. Come on, get on with the game. Yeah, it won't, won't change the game, though. <laughs> They've got five balls to all be stumps. Yes, yeah, just watching the replay. I think he probably should have played it back. They pissed outside his off Starby. Get forward, get your pads in the way. If it, if it turns a bit, it hits you on the pads outside the line. What an aura this man has. And now there's an, an, another change going in the field. And uh, Billy Bowden, he's say, come on, fellas, get on with the game. For goodness sake, three or four minutes this has taken. I mean, virtually everyone's around the bat, that's no surprise. And Hoggard's got four balls 
to survive. One for 25. 25 for one. And Warren at the city end. Moves forward now. He belongs to Hoggard, who's kicking the ball away. Oh, that's dangerous. That was going down the line of the league stump. It was whirring in there. He does want to do that too often. This, this is the kind of field you see on day five with a side nine down trying to battle it out for a draw. Does the test match take another twist here? Warn to bowl. He comes up, he bowls to Hoggard. Hoggard is forward and there's an appeal for catch there. That was extraordinary. What did that do? Take him on the body and then go away to the pod pad. again close. Oh, pad and body or whatever it popped up on the offside. He's going to bowl him a straight one here in a moment. Then we'll hear appeal for LBW. Hoggard will be just getting as far forward as he can go. Six men and the keeper hugging Hoggard in. Warren bowls to him and he pushes at this and it comes from the pad and uh, shimmies away behind square. So one ball to come and Matthew Hoggard certainly done his job if he survives it. So uh, England uh, were going along serenely until Warren took the ball crashing into Strauss's stumps with his second delivery when he didn't play a stroke. Went behind his legs and smashed into the middle and leg stumps. Last ball of the day. Warns pulled this trick off before. He goes in and bowls and Hoggard is pushing forward and it goes off the pad past short leg. And uh, that is the close of play on day two. What a test match. England 407. Australia 308. And down the board, Hayden Court Strauss bowled Hoggard and Nort Ponting. Court Vaughan Bowl Giles 61, Martin Runout 20, Clark Court Jones Bowl Giles 40, Cadditch Court Jones Bowl Flintoff 4, Langer Leg the Four Jones 82, Warren Bowl Giles 8, Lee Court Flintoff Bowl Jones 6, Gillespie Leg the Four Flintoff 7, and Kasprovich the second primary of the innings Leg the Four Flintoff North 31 extras, 308 all out from 76 overs, and for England Harmison none for 48. Hoggard, one for 41. Jones, two for 69. Flintoff, who's on a hat-trick in the second innings, three for 52. Giles, three for 78. It stumps England, who had a lead of 99, now 124 ahead. Strauss, bowled by Warren for six. Toscothic is 19. And night watchman Hoggard, yet to score.